The Preface, Part 1 of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Preface. To the Right Reverend W. B. Ullathorne, D. D. O. S. B., Bishop of Birmingham. My Lord, it is with the greatest pleasure I dedicate this translation of St. Teresa's greatest work to your Lordship, and deeply grateful am I for having received your Lordship's kind permission to do so. I know well how devoted your Lordship is to St. Teresa, how much you admire her undaunted courage, fortitude, zeal, and confidence in God amidst all her immense labors and extraordinary interior trials, and above all, how anxious your lordship is that the same spirit of prayer and the same heavenly virtues with which that glorious virgin was so wonderfully endowed may be diffused more and more amongst all men, and especially amongst those holy religious who have chosen the Lord as the portion of their inheritance forever. The illustrious order of St. Benedict, has produced many admirable contemplatives and writers on mystical theology, all of whom speak in the highest terms of the works of St. Teresa. I am truly grateful for your Lordship's approbation of my humble endeavors to give a correct translation of those esteemed works, the doctrine of which the Church herself styles heavenly. I also return your Lordship many sincere thanks for your constant kindness towards me and the encouragement I have so frequently received from your Lordship to persevere in my humble labors. May length of days be given to your lordship, to rule with fruit a hundredfold over the diocese so dear to your lordship's heart. And may St. Teresa intercede for you, that your lordship may have grace to imitate her heroic virtues. Begging your lordship's blessing, I am, my lord, your very respectful servant, John Dalton. Aston Deventry, Feast of St. Aloysius, 1852. Preface. I venture to present to the public another translation from the works of the glorious St. Teresa, one of her greatest and sublimest productions, the interior castle, or mansions. It may not, indeed, meet with the approbation of many whose judgment demands respect, whose experience on the mission is very great, and whose opinions are entitled to every consideration. Some may even condemn the translation of such a work as unintelligible to the generality of readers, and uncalled for in our present state. They may blame me, too, and wish I had devoted my time to the translation of other more useful and interesting works. I am ready to bow to the decision of those who are my superiors in every respect, some of whom, I am aware, do not advocate the translation of any of the works written by St. Teresa. To state here all their objections, and to answer them at the same time, would perhaps be hardly respectful. And why? Because how far such translations may or may not be desirable is certainly a subject which requires much serious consideration, and everyone is entitled to his opinion on the matter. I acknowledge that the mere fact of a book having been written by a saint, however excellent it may be in itself, is not always a sufficient reason for translating it. Some spiritual works, if translated into English, might do much more harm than good. Still, there seems to be a great difference of opinion as to the utility or propriety of translating certain lives of the saints, or certain works written by them. Some, for instance, strongly condemn the life of St. Rose of Lima, when it was first published by the Oratians, to whom we are indebted for so many valuable and edifying lives, and yet, how many more approved of that life? The life of St. Teresa, too, has been considered by some as exceedingly mystical, unintelligible, dry, heavy, while many more, and I think the greater number of readers, have been delighted and edified by its perusal, and have spoken of it as worthy of general admiration, both on account of the supernatural wonders it relates, and for the practical lessons of perfection it inculcates. It would then be unbecoming in me to assume an air of authority and to decide in favor of this or that particular opinion. But as I have received the highest and most flattering encouragement, both from bishops and priests, to continue the translation of St. Teresa's works, 
I trust I shall not be blamed for presenting the public with the present translation. Many, I think, will admire it as a most sublime composition, and others may perhaps condemn it. For my part, I admire it exceedingly. I should indeed be sorry to condemn anything written by St. Teresa. But to praise this work, the interior castle, as it deserves, I am unable. And to understand the saint's explanation of visions and raptures is given only to those who have experienced them. But are we authorized to condemn a book simply because we cannot comprehend all that the saint says? Let us hear herself speak on this point. As the contemplation of heavenly things and that glory which the blessed enjoy does not injure us, but we rather rejoice thereat and endeavor to attain what they possess, so neither will it hurt us to see that in this exile it is possible for so great a God to communicate himself to a few miserable worms, and for so excellent a goodness and so immense a mercy to love them. I consider it certain that whoever shall receive any harm by believing it possible for God in this land of exile to bestow such favors, stands in great need of humility and the love of his neighbor. Some may say these things seem impossible, and it is good not to scandalize the weak, but the harm is less for those not to believe them than to neglect doing a benefit to those on whom God bestows those favors, and who will excite themselves the more to love him who shows them such mercy. Our Lord exceedingly loves not to have his works limited. De Anne remarks, in answer to the objection that this work is unintelligible, Set pose a jusqu'ici empoche presque tot le monde de le lire on s'imagine que ce non sont speculation s'il est la vie que l'on ne peut rien comprendre cependant je suis persuadé que quel sublime qu'elle soit on ne laissera pas de les entendre et elle trouvant mêlés de temps instructions excellent pour ce que regarde les pratiques de vertu qu'elles ne sont entre que très utile whoever carefully peruses the work will i am sure be convinced of the truth of this remark how many excellent practical exhortations the book contains and these too are recommended and enforced by a vigor majesty and purity of language which is truly astonishing it is far superior in many respects to her life. S. Antonio considers it the best of all the other admirable works of the saint. F. Columbet says that though the interior castle is one of the last monuments of the piety of this great woman, and though it was written in the midst of troubles and afflictions of all kinds, yet it will always bear the impress of her wonderful genius. One is astonished at the vigor and grandeur with which several of the chapters are written. Ribera says of it, the reader will find in this book admirable learning, and will plainly see with what great excellence and majesty of style and force of examples she conducts a soul to the very gates into which she herself enters, raising her from one degree to another to her very center, which is the seventh mansion, the palace of the celestial spouse and the king of glory, Jesus Christ. The venerable Father Avila, in a letter addressed to the Holy Mother, praises and approves in the highest terms the doctrine concerning prayer and her account of visions, interior speeches, raptures, etc., which are mentioned in this and other works of the saint. Yepes, Palafox, our own Alban Butler, and the learned writers of the last magnificent volume of the Bollandists, Father Gratian, St. Peter of Alcantara, St. John of the Cross, St. Louis Bertrand, St. Francis Borgia, F. Balazar Alvarez, Father Ripalda, F. Vicenzo Varon, and Dr. Hernandez, both consultors of the Inquisition. All these and several other learned and celebrated men have exceedingly extolled the interior castle as a production that one might almost style inspired. To enable the reader to understand the book, I would recommend a diligent perusal of Cardinal Bona's Via Comprendi Ad Deum, and also his celebrated treatise de discretione spirituum father baker also in his sancta sophia has some excellent and valuable remarks on visions and raptures no one it seems to me should attempt to say anything on mystical theology unless he understand the subject thoroughly 
but who can be a greater authority in this most difficult science than St. Teresa? She is preeminently its evangelist and doctor. God gave her a particular faculty, among her other sublime gifts, for translating her vast internal experience of the mystical life into intelligible language, and also of conveying what others might have felt or known, but had never been able to express, by means of ideas and illustrations at once apposite and familiar. The most remarkable feature in the writings of St. Teresa is that vigorous practical good sense which pervades whatever she says and whatever she advises. How practical, for instance, is the fourth chapter of the seventh mansion, and, indeed, in almost every chapter of the same work, the saint takes an opportunity of inculcating humility, a knowledge of ourselves, obedience, meekness, charity, zeal for souls, a horror for sin, and an ardent love of God. There is nothing vague or uncertain about what she says. Her language is of the most real, decided, and definitive character that there is in this great work things far beyond the depth of almost all readers, is most true. But are there not most difficult things, hard to be understood, in the Holy Scriptures also? Alas, for him who reads nothing but what he understands, how many things are there which one may understand and practice in the interior castle, and how perfect will they become who practice what they do understand, and who nourish their faith with what they do not understand? The saint commenced this book at Toledo on Trinity Sunday in the year 1577. She finished it the same year at Avila. It was composed in obedience to her confessor, the Reverend Dr. Velasquez, who was afterwards Bishop of Osma. F. Gratian also united his command with that of Dr. Velasquez. The year 1577 was the very period in which the saint was engaged with the reformation of her order. And those who know her wonderful history will remember all the labors, sufferings, and persecutions she had then to endure. In addition to these, she was oppressed with bodily pains and infirmities, of which we can now have no idea. In her preface, she mentions having had, for three months, such a noise and weakness in her head that she wrote with pain and difficulty even on urgent business. And yet, in the midst of all her troubles and infirmities, she was able to compose, with the greatest calmness and ease, the present sublime work. How well did Teresa know and understand the power of holy obedience? End of the Preface, Part 1「The Preface, Part 2, of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Preface, Part 2. For the convenience of the reader, I will endeavor to give a summary of what is contained in the mansions, but we should remember the words of the saint. Our Lord grant that I may say something well, since that is exceedingly difficult, which I wish you to understand, unless there be experience. Chapter 1. In the first mansions, the saint speaks of the beauty and dignity of a soul in grace. She considers the soul to be a castle of diamonds or most clear crystal, in which are many rooms, as in heaven there are many mansions. She dwells at some length on the means whereby we may enter this castle, remarking, however, that there is a great difference between one room and another. Some only dwell round the castle, never caring to enter, nor to know what is within that precious place, nor who lives there. Mental prayer she calls the gate of this castle. She then proceeds to show with what attention and devotion we ought to address the majesty of God. In the second chapter of the same mansion, the saint speaks of the deformity of a soul in mortal sin, and this she does in powerful and energetic words, as no doubt our Lord often revealed to her the miserable condition of a soul in this state. She insists on the necessity of knowing ourselves, and thus, in this first mansion, consisting of two chapters, those souls are described who have already some good desires, who pray mentally or vocally, though not so often nor with such great attention as they ought, because they are distracted with worldly pleasures and the cares of business, which the saint calls noisome and venomous creatures. When such souls know their condition, they seek help by prayer and by humility. 
This second chapter is written with wonderful energy, unction, and clearness. Her lessons of perfection are most practical. The second mansions contain only one chapter. In it the saint dwells on the great importance of perseverance in order to be able to arrive at the last mansion. Here souls are described who, by reflecting on their present dangerous state, have partly reformed themselves through God's assistance but they cannot yet conquer their will so far as to avoid the occasions of sin. Hence, not being perfectly dead to themselves, they endure great afflictions and terrible combats. Still, they are called by God in many ways, by pious books, sermons, discourses, sickness, and adversity. The arts and snares which the devil employs to induce the poor soul to return back are most skillfully exposed in this chapter. The third mansions contain two chapters. The saint begins by showing what little security we have in this life, even though we should have reached a high degree of perfection. Here she exemplifies in herself the words of the psalmist, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. So penetrated is the saint with this holy fear, that she assures her daughters, she trembles at the judgments of God, when she reflects on her past wickedness. Pray, she exclaims, Pray, my daughters, that his majesty may ever live in me, for otherwise what security can a life like mine have, which has been so ill spent? She then proceeds to describe those souls who have overcome the great difficulties that are found in the second mansions. They avoid the occasions of sinning, and even abstain from many venial sins. They are lovers of penance, prayer, and recollection, and sometimes they enjoy great content and tenderness, and have the gift of tears, etc. These souls, however, are often troubled with aridities, and are frequently quite discouraged by them, and consequently are very desirous of being delivered from them. She speaks on this point at some length, and takes occasion most earnestly to recommend humility to such souls. The latter part of this first chapter is exceedingly useful, because exceedingly practical. In the second chapter, the saint continues to speak of aridities in prayer. She makes use of some apposite illustrations to explain her meaning, and again recommends humility and a conformity with the will of God in all things. Perfection does not consist in wearing the religious habit, but in the practice of virtue, and in subjecting our will in everything to that of God. Chapter 2 In the fourth mansions, the saint reaches the very height of sublimity. The Holy Spirit evidently has guided her pen in this and the following mansions. In the fourth mansions, souls are advanced to the first degree of supernatural prayer. She speaks of the difference between contents and delights. Those she calls contents, which we acquire by meditation and prayer to our Lord, being satisfied, however, by God. Contents proceed from the particular virtuous action which we exercise, and which it seems we have gained by our labor. The same joy and content, however, we often feel from worldly things, as the saint remarks, though divine contents have a nobler origin. Delights come from God, and nature feels them. The saint proceeds to explain how she experienced these delights in meditation, especially when she meditated on the passion of our Lord. She enters more into details in the second chapter, to which I refer the reader, not daring to make use of any words of my own to explain a subject so sublime. In the third chapter she teaches that quiet and recollection, in which the soul remains inactive and without sediments of God, is an illusion, because in all supernatural prayer the soul is active and vigorous, and is filled with lively sentiments of God. Here the saint precondemns the fanaticism of the quietists. The saint shows that these delights should not be desired for several reasons. In the third chapter, the saint explains what is meant by the prayer of recollection. She describes its effects, and wonderful indeed they are. This chapter can easily be understood, if perused attentively and devoutly. In the fifth mansions are souls still more united to God, by having the interior faculties of the soul, and also the exterior senses, totally suspended, so that the understanding is not able to think on anything but God. The body, too, is deprived of speech, motion, and even sensible breathing, though this lasts but for a short time. The soul feels in her interior a most inexpressible delight and love for God, though she cannot express this delight. Here, the soul is admitted into the very chamber of the king. Here, she is caressed by him. Here, she is filled with the plenty of his house, and drinks of the torrent of his pleasures. 
here too secrets of the invisible world are revealed to her which mortal lips can never utter the soul is certain that god is intimately present with her for the saint says god so fixes and settles himself in the interior of the soul that when she comes to herself she can in no way doubt but she was in god and god in her this truth is so deeply rooted in her that though many years pass before god bestow the like favors upon her she never forgets it the saint concludes the first chapter in these words o oh, my daughters what great things shall we see if we look upon nothing else but our own baseness and misery and utter unworthiness to be the servants of so great a lord whose wonders are above our comprehension may he be eternally praised amen the favors bestowed in the fifth mansions are however often accompanied or followed by many afflictions corporeal pains and infirmities and an impatient longing after the enjoyment of god whose inexpressible beauty is now discovered to her she mentions the means whereby a soul may attain a supernatural union viz by conforming ourselves in all things to the will of god and by loving our neighbor as ourselves the sixth mansions contain eleven chapters here the saint seems to excel herself by the clearness and majesty with which she treats the most difficult and sublime subjects visions are seen by the soul in which heavenly truths and many wonderful secrets are more frequently revealed to her she hears certain words or discourses and is certain they are not fancies of the imagination she perceives intellectually our lord though without any visible shape some of the saints also are seen either silent or speaking to her and such visions sometimes continue many days raptures likewise are frequent and in these sometimes the body is raised without knowing whither it goes or who carries it or how etc this is not the place to enter at length into the subject of these wonders nor to answer the objections of protestants most of whom pride themselves in rejecting anything supernatural as absurd or impossible they believe the almighty does not condescend to be so familiar with poor mortals that it is impossible for him to speak to the soul except through the medium of the corporeal senses that saint teresa was evidently an enthusiast and had imposed upon her superiors etc cardinal bona has ably answered these and other objections in his learned and valuable treatise de discretione spirituum the protestant reader should also peruse the able remarks of mr a woodhead in his preface to the translation of saint teresa's works when the saint was canonized by pope gregory the fifteenth these visions and raptures were examined and sifted by the most holy and learned men of the age and pronounced to be authentic and not illusions in such matters we catholics do not measure our belief by the rules of philosophy nor do we exclaim how can this be we know that god's ways are not our ways nor his thoughts our thoughts and that all things are possible with him thank god we belong to a church that does not reject the wonders of the supernatural life in spite of the sneers and scoffs of the skeptic and infidel we ponder on the visions and raptures of saint teresa with deep and reverential amazement giving thanks to our lord that in this sinful and miserable world of ours there once dwelt a soul whom he caressed as the apple of his eye whom he raised to so marvelous a knowledge and experience of his own adorable perfections and in whose life he displayed so signally the might of his boundless power and goodness and the inexhaustible riches of his mercy in the seventh mansion the saint continues in the same sublime strain she explains the difference between spiritual union and spiritual marriage in the third chapter are described the extraordinary effects which follow these favors the soul perceives in her interior the presence of the adorable trinity but this without any rapture or suspension of the senses or other faculties the soul then arrives at perfect contemplation the fourth and last chapter is exceedingly practical in the concluding paragraph the saint says that though she has spoken only of seven mansions yet in each of these mansions there are many more above below and on the sides together with many fair gardens fountains and other delights etc she submits her works to the judgment of the holy catholic roman church wherein she says i live and do protest and promise to live and die such is the short summary i have given of this sublime work but how imperfect is it the truth is it is impossible to do justice to the subject 
one must have a deep knowledge of mystic theology to speak with any degree of correctness and certitude i acknowledge my ignorance my poor ability to say anything deserving the attention of my superiors my only desire and ambition have been to give a faithful translation of the saints words whether i have succeeded others will decide but whatever faults or defects may be noticed i trust to the kind indulgence of the reader who will i hope make every allowance when he considers what a difficult task it must have been to translate so sublime a work indeed i should never have been able to translate many parts had i not consulted the translation made with such ability by the illustrious convert mr a woodhead i have carefully endeavored to make use of the singular pronoun when any prayer or exclamation is addressed to our lord john dalton preface of saint teresa among the things which i have been commanded to do under obedience few have proved so difficult to me as writing at present something on prayer and this for two reasons because it seems to me our lord does not give me spirit nor a desire to write and also because i have had for the last three months such a noise in my head attended with extreme weakness that i write with pain even on necessary business but knowing the power of obedience which makes things easy that seem impossible my will is determined to undertake the work very cheerfully though nature seems exceedingly adverse to it because our lord has not given me such virtue that i should be able to accomplish the task considering how i have to endure continual sickness and how many different employments occupy my time without great resistance on the part of nature may he be pleased to accomplish the work who has performed other more difficult things for me in his mercy i trust i am confident i shall be able to say little more than what i have said on other matters about which i have been commanded to write i am even fearful lest what i may say should be almost the same for as birds which learn to speak know no more than just what is taught them or what they hear and this they often repeat so do i in like manner hence if our lord wishes me to say anything new his majesty will teach it to me or will be pleased to recall to my mind what i have said elsewhere even this would satisfy me because i have such a bad memory and i should be glad to touch upon some of those things which people say have been correctly handled lest perhaps they might be lost if our lord should not please to grant me this favor however much i may weary myself and increase the pain in my head by obedience i shall be a gainer even though no fruit whatever should come from what i say wherefore i commence the work this day being the feast of the most holy trinity in the year fifteen seventy seven in order to obey the command given to me and i am now living in the convent of saint joseph of mount carmel at toledo i submit in all that i shall say to the judgment of those who have commanded me to write because they are persons of great learning if perchance i shall say anything which does not exactly agree with what the holy catholic church holds it will be through ignorance and not in malice this may be taken for certain since i have always been am and shall be by the grace of god subject to her voice may our lord be eternally blessed and glorified amen i have been told by those who commanded me to write this book that as the nuns of this convent of our lady of mount carmel require some one to explain to them certain doubts regarding prayer they thought that as women understand one another's language best and the nuns love me what i should say would do them more good than the words of others for these reasons they consider it very important that i should undertake to say something on the subject hence i consider that in what i write i am speaking only to them for it seems foolish to think that my words can be of service to others our lord will do me a great favor if any one among the nuns shall hereby be moved to praise him ever so little more his majesty knows well i have no other object it is very evident that when i happen to say anything to the point people will know it is not mine since there is no reason to think so but they will discover in me a very poor capacity for such things unless our lord through his mercy shall give me understanding teresa de jesus end of the preface part two the first mansion chapter one of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The First Mansion, Chapter 1. The saint speaks of the beauty and dignity of our souls, and mentions that the gate of this castle is prayer. When I was once requesting our Lord to speak for me, because I knew not what to say, nor how to commence obeying my superior, what I shall now relate occurred to me. But in order that I may begin on some foundation, let us consider our soul as a castle, composed entirely of diamonds, or very clear crystal, in which there are many rooms, just as in heaven there are many mansions. If we consider the subject properly, sisters, we shall see that the soul of a just man is nothing else but a paradise, wherein the Lord thereof takes his recreation. What a beautiful room, then, ought that to be, think you, in which a king so powerful, so wise, so pure, so full of every perfection, delights himself. I know of nothing to which I can compare the great beauty of a soul and its wonderful capacity. Truly, however enlarged our understanding may be, it is unable to comprehend the beauty of a soul, just as it cannot comprehend who God is. For he saith himself, that he created us in his own image and likeness. If this then be the truth, as it certainly is, we need not weary ourselves in endeavoring to understand the beauty of this castle. For though between it and God there is the same difference that exists between the Creator and the creature, yet in order to understand the great dignity and beauty of the soul, it is sufficient that his majesty has said, he made it after his own image. It is a great source of misery and confusion to us, that we do not know ourselves. Would it not be gross ignorance, my daughters, for some one, on being asked who he was, not to know who was his father or mother, or what country he was born in? If this then would be great stupidity, how much greater without comparison is that which is found in us, when we do not strive to know what we are, but fix all our thoughts on these bodies of ours? and thus only generally and superficially do we know that we have souls, because we have heard so, and because our faith tells us. But seldom do we consider what great things are contained in this soul, or who lives within it, or how immense is its value. Hence it is that we take such little care to preserve its beauty. All our attention is fixed on the roughness of the case, or the walls of this castle, which are our bodies. Let us imagine, then, that this castle, as I have said, has several mansions or rooms, some above, some below, and others on the sides, and that in the center of all these is the principal room, in which subjects of the greatest secrecy are discussed between God and the soul. You should often reflect on this comparison, for perhaps our Lord may be pleased that I should help you by means thereof, to understand something regarding those favors He is pleased to bestow on souls and what difference there is in them. This I may be able to explain, as far as my understanding can reach, but it is impossible for one to understand them all, because there are many, and how much more for a person so ignorant as I am. To you, however, this will be a great consolation, whenever our Lord shall make you understand these favors, and this is possible. But for those on whom he is not pleased to bestow this gift, it may nevertheless serve as an occasion of praising his immense goodness. For as the contemplation of the joys of heaven, and those things which the blessed enjoy, does us no harm, but we rather rejoice in the contemplation, and endeavor to attain what they possess, so neither will it hurt us to consider how in this land of exile it is possible for so great a God to communicate himself to such miserable worms as we are, and for such immense goodness and boundless mercy to love us. I consider it certain that whoever shall consider he might receive harm by believing it possible for God in this exile to bestow such favors, such a person stands in great need of humility and love for his neighbor. How can we otherwise help rejoicing that God bestows these favors on a brother of ours, when we see that this does not hinder him from bestowing the same on us? His majesty sometimes bestows them only in order to manifest them. As he said concerning the blind man to whom he restored his sight, when the apostles asked whether that blindness came through his own sins or the sins of his parents. Hence it is that he bestows these favors, not because those to whom he gives them are more holy than those to whom he does not give them, 
but merely to show his greatness, such as was the case in St. Paul and Mary Magdalene, and that we may praise him in his creatures. Some may say, these things seem impossible, and that it is good not to scandalize the weak. I reply, that the loss is less for these not to believe such wonders than to forbear doing good to those on whom God bestows them, and who will thereby excite themselves the more to love him who shows them such mercy, and whose power and majesty are so great. This I may do the more, because I know I speak to those who are in no danger of taking scandal, and they know and believe also that God gives even far greater proofs of his love. I know that he will not believe this, will never find it by experience in himself, for our Lord is exceedingly desirous not to have his works limited. And thus, sisters, let this never happen to any of you whom our Lord shall not lead in this way. Returning now to our beautiful and delightful castle, we must consider how we are to enter it. I may here seem to speak incorrectly, because if this castle be the soul, it is clear there is no need to enter it, since it is the castle itself, just as it would appear ridiculous to tell a person to go into a room, when he is already in it. But you must understand that there is a great difference between one room and another, for many souls dwell near the walls of the castle, these, where the guards are, and yet never care about going further into it. Neither do they wish to know what is within that precious place, nor who lives there, nor what rooms there are. Now you have heard or read in some books of prayer that a soul is advised to enter into herself, and this is the same that I say here. A very learned man told me, not long ago, that souls, without the exercise of prayer, are like a body that has the palsy, or that is lame, and though it has feet and hands, it cannot use them. In like manner, some souls are so weak and so immersed in exterior things that they cannot by any means enter into themselves. For being always accustomed to converse with the vermin that are about the castle, they are become almost like them and though by nature they are so richly endowed, and enabled to hold communication even with God himself, yet they do not recover themselves. Now, unless these souls endeavor to understand and remedy their great misery, they must continue statues of salt, like Lot's wife, being unable to turn their head. As far as I can understand, the gate by which we are to enter this castle is prayer and consideration. I speak of mental as well as vocal. Being prayer, it should be made with attention, for she who does not consider with whom she speaks, and what she asks, and who she is that asks, and of whom she asks, knows little of prayer, however much her lips may move. And though sometimes prayer is made when there is no actual advertence, yet this attention is requisite at other times. But whoever shall accustom himself to speak with the majesty of God, as he would talk with his slave, without considering whether he speaks properly or no, but who speaks only what comes first into his head, or what he may have learned by heart by repeating it at other times. This I do not consider to be prayer. And God grant that no Christian may pray in this manner among you, my sisters. I hope in his majesty this will never happen, on account of the custom we have of being exercised in interior matters, for this is a very good means of not falling into the like stupidity. Let us not, then, speak of these maimed souls, who suffer great misery, and run great hazards, unless our Lord himself come and bid them rise up, as he did to the man that had frequented the pool for eight and thirty years. But let us address those other souls who have at length entered the castle. For though they may be deeply immersed in the world, yet they have good desires, and sometimes, though seldom, they recommend themselves to God. They consider what they are, though not so seriously and so calmly as they should. They pray sometimes in a month, with a mind full of a thousand distractions and cares. This is generally the case, for they are so wedded to earthly things, that having placed therein their treasure, their heart is there also. They sometimes try to free themselves from these cares, and this knowledge of themselves is very beneficial, since they discover they do not go the right way to enter in at the gate. At last they enter into the first rooms below, but so much vermin with them, that they are prevented from seeing the beauty of the castle, nor can they be at rest. It is well that they have entered. 
what i have been saying may seem to you unnecessary my daughters since by the goodness of our lord you are not to be numbered amongst these but you must have patience because i know not how to make you understand some interior things about prayer which i have learnt except by this means our lord grant that i may be able to say something well since that is exceedingly difficult which i wish to make you understand unless there is experience if there be you will see that less cannot be done than to touch on that which god grant in his great mercy may never happen to us end of the first mansion chapter one the first mansion chapter two of the interior castle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The First Mansion, Chapter 2. The saint shows how deformed a soul in mortal sin is, and speaks of the knowledge of ourselves, etc. Before I proceed further, I wish you to consider what a spectacle it is to behold this castle, so resplendent and beautiful, this oriental pearl, this tree of life, which is planted amidst the living waters of life, that is, God. What a spectacle is it when it falls into mortal sin? No darkness is more dark nor is anything so black and foul as such a soul. You need not wish to know more than to know that the sun itself, which gave it such luster and beauty, though still in the center of it, is, nevertheless, as if it were not there. And yet that soul is as capable of enjoying his majesty, as a crystal rejoices in the brightness of the sun. Nothing does that soul good, and hence all her good works are fruitless, as long as she remains in mortal sin neither are they of any help towards enabling her to arrive at eternal glory because such works not coming from god as from their source whence our virtue becomes virtue cannot be pleasing in his eyes when we are separated from him for the intention of him who commits a mortal sin is not to please god but the devil who being obscurity and darkness itself the poor soul likewise becomes darkness itself I know a person to whom our Lord was pleased to reveal the state of a soul in mortal sin. The person said that she thought if men only considered and understood well such a state, no one would commit a sin, even though we were to suffer the greatest torments possible, in order to avoid the occasions. The person, accordingly, became exceedingly desirous that all men should understand this truth. I also wished, my daughters, that you would excite yourselves earnestly to beseech our lord for those who are in this miserable state for they are all darkness and so are their works also as all the streams are clear that issue from a clear fountain such is a soul in a state of grace and hence it is that all her works are so pleasing in the eyes of god in men because they proceed from this fountain of life in which it is planted like a tree and it would have neither verdure nor fruit except it receive them hence this tree sustains it and makes it continually bear good fruit so on the contrary when a soul by her own fault separates herself from this fountain and is planted in another containing foul and stinking water all that flows from it is foul and fetid too but we should understand that this fountain and this resplendent sun which is in the center of the soul lose not their brightness and glory for these always remain in it and nothing can take away its beauty but if any one should throw a black cloth over a crystal which is exposed to the sun it is evident that though the sun may shine upon it it will have no effect on the crystal o oh, souls redeemed by the blood of jesus christ know and pity yourselves how is it possible that knowing this truth as you do you do not endeavor to take away the pitch from this crystal consider how when once your life is ended you will never return any more to enjoy this light o oh, jesus what a misery it is to behold a soul separated and deprived from this light what miserable objects are the poor mansions of the soul how disordered are the senses what wretched people are they who live in them with what blindness and bad government do the powers rule which are the commanders stewards and waiters but as the soil in which the tree is planted is the devil what fruit can be produced 
I once heard a spiritual man say that he wondered not so much at the evil which a person committed who was in mortal sin as at what he did not commit. May God, in his mercy, deliver us from so great an evil. For while we live in this life, sin only deserves the name of evil, since it brings upon us eternal evils. This, my daughters, is what we ought to fear, and from which we must beseech God, in our prayers, to free us. For, unless he keep the city, in vain shall we labor, since we are nothing but misery itself. The person mentioned above said, that she had received two benefits from the favor God had bestowed upon her, in showing her the miserable state of a soul in mortal sin. The first was, an exceedingly great fear of offending him, and therefore she was continually beseeching him not to let her fall, as she saw such dreadful evil would follow. The second benefit was, that she obtained thereby a looking-glass to excite humility in her. For she knew that the good which we do is not originally from ourselves, but from the fountain in which this tree of our souls is planted, and from this sun which gives heat to our actions. She said this was represented so clearly to her, that when she did any good action, or saw one done by another, she had recourse to this principle, and perceived how without this aid we could do nothing. Hence it was that she immediately broke forth into the praises of God, and in general did not remember herself in any good action which she did. The time would not be lost, sisters, which either you spent in reading or I in writing this, if we did but gain these two benefits, which learned and sensible persons know very well. But the dullness of us women stands in need of all of this. Hence our Lord is perhaps pleased that such comparisons should come to our mind. May his goodness be pleased to help us herein. These interior subjects are so difficult to understand, that whoever knows no more than I do, is compelled to say many superfluous and foolish things, in order to mention a few things which may be useful. Whoever reads this must have patience, since I have it by writing what I do not understand. I sometimes take the pen in my hand, like a foolish creature, not knowing what to say, nor how to begin. I know very well that it is very important for you, that I should explain to you some interior matters as well as I can, since we always hear it said, what a good thing prayer is, and we are bound by our rule to use it so many hours, and yet it is not explained to us. Little is mentioned to us regarding what we ourselves can do in it, and respecting those things which our Lord operates in our soul, I mean supernaturally. As this little is presented to our understandings in many and different ways, it will be a great consolation to us to take a view of this heavenly internal edifice, which is so little understood by mortals, though many walk through it. And though in other things which I have written, our Lord has enabled me to understand something, yet I have since discovered some things I did not understand so well as I do now, especially those which are more difficult. The difficulty is that many things already well known must be said in order to understand these other matters. My poor understanding knows no other way. Let us then now return to our castle of many mansions. You must not contemplate these rooms as one behind another, well arranged and in good order. Rather, cast your eyes on the center, which is the lodging or palace where the king is, and consider that as in a pineapple, before we come to the kernel which is to be eaten, there are many skins which cover and enclose it. So here about this chamber there are many mansions, and over it likewise there are many, because things relating to the soul are always to be considered with a certain fullness and greatness. Since too much cannot be said respecting the soul, which is capable of much more than we are able to imagine, the sun which is in this palace communicates itself to all the parts thereof. It is very important for a soul which makes use of prayer, whether it be little or much, that persons should not confine or straighten her, but let her walk freely through all these rooms, above, below, and on the sides, seeing God has bestowed on her so great a dignity. Let her not force herself to remain long in one room only, though it be in that of the knowledge of oneself, which is indeed very necessary. See that you understand me. Even for those whom our Lord entertains in the same chamber in which he is himself, for, however favored they may be, they must know that nothing else can perfect them but prayer. Nor will they be able to act otherwise, even should they wish to do so. 
for humility must always be at work just as a bee flies abroad and sucks the flowers so believe me may the soul by this knowledge of herself sometimes soar above also to consider the greatness and majesty of her god here she will the better discover her own baseness than in herself she will likewise be more free from those insects that come into the first rooms viz those of the knowledge of oneself wherein as i have said it is a great mercy of god to be exercised whether this be done more or less as the saying is let them believe me that by this virtue of god we shall labor much more vigorously than by being so much tied to the things of earth i know not whether i have expressed myself sufficiently clear for this knowledge of ourselves is so very important that i wish you never to admit any relaxation therein however highly elevated you may be because while we live on this earth nothing is more necessary for us than humility i say then again that it is very good nay the very best thing to enter first into the mansion where this knowledge is practiced rather than fly to the others because this is the way of them and if we can advance in a safe and smooth path why should we desire wings to fly let us therefore endeavor to advance more in this way for in my opinion we shall never be able to know ourselves except we endeavor to know god by considering his greatness we discover our own baseness by contemplating his purity we discover our own filthiness and beholding his humility we shall discover how far we are from being truly humble herein is a double gain the first is that as a white color next to a black appears much whiter and on the contrary a black near a white color so are our imperfections better discovered by being contrasted with the divine perfections the second is that our understanding and will are ennobled thereby and more disposed to every good in meditating by turns both on ourselves and on god for never to rise from the mire of our own miseries is very injurious to us as we said of those in mortal sin that those streams are very black and fetid so the same may be said here for though they be not so bad as these may god deliver us from that for i speak by a comparison yet by dwelling continually on the misery of our body the stream will never run clear on account of the mud of fears and of cowardice which will come upon us for we may be inclined to consider whether others notice us or not whether some evil may not happen to us if we go along this way whether it be pride in us to attempt such and such a work whether it be good for one so miserable as i am to think about applying myself to so high a matter as prayer whether people will think better of me for not going along the way every one else goes that extremes even in virtue are not good that being so base a sinner my fall from such a height might be greater that perhaps i should not go forward and might injure some others who were good that such a person as i am need not be singular etc oh my daughters how many souls has the devil utterly ruined by this way all this seems humility to them and many other things that i could say which arise from not understanding ourselves for the knowledge of ourselves sometimes confuses us if we never get out of ourselves i am not surprised that this and much more are so much dreaded i say then daughters that we must fix our eyes on christ our only good and there we shall learn true humility let us also consider his saints i said our understanding must be ennobled and thus the knowledge of ourselves will not make it base and cowardly for although this be the first mansion yet it is exceedingly rich and so very valuable that whoever can get free from the insects therein will not fail to advance further terrible are the wiles and stratagems of the devil for keeping souls from knowing themselves and understanding their ways from my experience i could give you many remarkable signs on this account i say that you must not consider a few of these rooms only but a million for souls enter there by many ways and all with a good intention but as the devil always has a bad intention in every one of these rooms he no doubt keeps many legions of devils to attack souls and to hinder them from passing from one to another the poor soul not knowing this snare is deluded by him in a thousand ways though he cannot so easily act thus with regard to those who are nearer the king's palace 
but here as they are yet immersed in the world and engulfed in its pleasures and deceived by its honors and ambition the guards of the soul which are the senses and faculties which god has given her have no strength of their own and hence these souls are easily conquered though these be desirous of not offending god and perform good works yet they who shall see themselves in this state stand in need of approaching nearer by degrees to the divine majesty and of taking the blessed virgin and the saints for their intercessors that so they may fight for them since their servants have little strength to defend them indeed in every state strength must come from god may his majesty grant it to us in his mercy amen how miserable is the life we live in but because i have said sufficient elsewhere daughters respecting the harm we receive through not understanding the benefit of humility and that of the knowledge of ourselves i shall say no more here on that subject though it is very important our lord grant that i may have spoken something which has been useful to you you must notice that in these first mansions there comes little of that light which diffuses itself from the palace wherein the king resides for they are not dark and black as is the case when the soul is in mortal sin yet they are in some degrees obscured so that the light cannot enlighten him who is in these rooms and this is not through any fault of the room i know not how to explain myself but because so many noxious things such as serpents lizards vipers and venomous creatures enter with him so as to hinder him from perceiving the light just as if one should come into a place where the sun shone much but his eyes were so covered with dirt that he could hardly open them the room is lightsome but he enjoys it not because these filthy vermin are an impediment they blind his eyes in such a way that he sees nothing but them thus it sometimes seems to be the case with a soul which though it be not altogether in a bad state is nevertheless so taken up with the things of this world and so immersed as i said in wealth honors and business that truly if she were desirous of beholding and delighting in her own beauty they will not allow her to do so and it seems she cannot escape so many obstacles it is very proper in order to enter into the second mansions that every one should endeavor according to his state to give up every business which is not necessary this is so very important for arriving at the principal mansion that except one begin to do this i consider it impossible to arrive and though he may be within the castle he will not on that account be able to remain in the room where he is already without apparent danger because among so many venomous creatures it is impossible not to be bitten some time or other what an evil then would it be daughters if those who are free from these stumblings as we are who have already entered further into other secret rooms of the castle should by our own fault return again to these tumults on account of our sins there are many no doubt who after having received great favors from our lord have by their own fault relapsed into this misery here we are free as regards the exterior may our lord grant we may be the same in our interior also be careful my daughters to keep ourselves free from other people's business consider that there are few mansions of this castle in which the devils do not fight it is true that in some the guards that is the faculties have strength to resist the devils but it is necessary for us not to neglect observing their wiles that so when they transform themselves into angels of light they may not deceive us there are many things which insinuating themselves by little and little may hurt us exceedingly and we may not perceive the evil till it be past i have elsewhere told you that it is like a deaf file and we must observe it in its beginnings i will mention some particulars in order to enable you to understand the subject better the devil for instance suggests to a sister certain impetuous desires of doing penance so that she never seems to rest but when she is torturing herself this beginning is good but if the superioress should have commanded that no penance should be done without leave and the devil should make her believe that for so good an object she may take some liberty she immediately and secretly enters upon such a course whereby she in the end loses her health and is therefore unable to do what the rule commands then you see what all this apparent good ends in in another he excites zeal for very great perfection this is very good but from this cause any small fault in the sisters may appear a great crime to her eyes 
and she may become very anxious to observe whether they commit faults, and not seeing her own, she will be running to the superioress to acquaint her with them, moved thereto by the great zeal she has for discipline. But the rest, not knowing her interior, and seeing her so busy, do not possibly like this conduct very well. That which the devil aims at hereby is no trifle, viz., to cool our charity and mutual love. This would indeed be a great evil. Let us remember, daughters, that true perfection consists in the love of God and our neighbor. The more perfectly we observe these two precepts, the more perfect we shall be. Our whole rule and constitution serve for nothing else, but as so many means for enabling us to do this with more perfection. Let us banish such indiscreet zeal as may injure us, and let each one look to herself. But because I have spoken at length on this matter elsewhere, I will not enter into further particulars here. This mutual love is so very important, that I wish you never to forget it. For by noticing in others certain unimportant matters, which sometimes will prove not even imperfections, but we take them perhaps in a bad sense, because we know little of the person's interior. The soul may both lose her own peace, and likewise disturb the peace of others. Consider then, if perfection will cost you dear or no. The devil can also raise this temptation against the prioress, and it may prove more dangerous. Great discretion is therefore necessary, for if faults be committed against the rules and constitutions, they must not always be passed over, but the superioress should be informed of them. If they are not corrected, the superior must be told of the matter, and this is charity. Again, if any very serious faults should be found among the sisters, to let such things pass by, through fear lest it might only be a temptation, would itself be a temptation. Great care should be taken, lest the devil might deceive us, not to mention this matter to another person, for thereby the devil may gain much, and introduce a habit of detraction. But speak of it, as I said, to such as can and should remedy the evil. In this place, glory be to God, much liberty is not allowed for it, on account of the continual silence which is observed. End of The First Mansion, Chapter 2THE SECOND MANSION CHAPTER ONE OF THE INTERIOR CASTLE This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. THE INTERIOR CASTLE, OR THE MANSIONS, BY ST. TERESA OF AVILA. TRANSLATED BY THE REVEREND JOHN DALTON. THE SECOND MANSION CHAPTER ONE the saint explains the great importance of perseverance in order to be able to arrive at the last mansions, etc. I will now mention what kind of souls those are who enter the second mansions, and what they do therein. I wish to say little, because elsewhere I have entered into many particulars on the subject, and it would be impossible for me to repeat here over again many of the same things, since I do not now remember what I said then. But could I present those same things before you in a different way, I know well they would not tire or displease you, for we are never tired of the books which treat on that subject, though they are numerous. I say, then, that this second mansion is for those who have already begun to make use of prayer, and who understand how important it is for them not to remain in the first mansions. But they are not determined to refrain from being often in them, because they do not avoid the occasions, and this fault is very dangerous. It is, however, a great mercy, that sometimes they endeavor to fly from these serpents and poisonous creatures, and that they know it is good to avoid them. These have, in one way, more trouble than those in the first mansions, though they are not in such danger, because it seems they are already aware of the danger, and they have great hopes of entering further in. I say they have more trouble because the persons in the first mansions are like dumb men who hear nothing and so they bear the better the misfortune of their not being able to speak, which those could not do who hear but cannot speak. Yet the being deaf is not therefore the more desirable, for it is a great benefit to understand what is spoken to us. Thus these hear the calls our Lord gives them, because, as they approach nearer to his majesty, he is a very good neighbor, and so great are his mercy and his goodness, that although we continue to be addicted to our pastimes, employments, and pleasures, and are exposed to conflicts with the devil, 
now falling and then rising, for these vermin are so poisonous and such dangerous company, and so restless in their motion, that it would be a wonder not to stumble on them and fall. Still, notwithstanding all this, our Lord prizes our loving him so much, and seeking his company, that he hesitates not, some time or other, to call us to approach nearer to him. And so sweet is the voice, that the poor soul is dejected, because she does not immediately perform what he commands her, and this, as I have said, is a greater trouble than not to hear his call. I do not say that these words and calls are like some others which I shall speak of afterwards. They come by discourses heard from good people, or from sermons, or by reading pious books, or many other ways by which we have often heard God call us, such as by sickness and adversity, and also by a certain truth which he teaches us at times of prayer. And however remiss these may be observed, yet they are greatly esteemed by God. Do not, my sisters, make light of this first grace, nor be disconsolate, though you may not immediately correspond with our Lord, for his majesty knows how to wait many days and years, especially when he sees in us perseverance and good desires. This is that which is most necessary here, because by perseverance we never fail to gain a great deal. But terrible is the attack which the devil makes here in a thousand different ways, and with more grief to the soul than in the former mansion. There she is dumb and deaf, or at least she heard but little and resisted less, as if in some manner she gave up all hope of victory. But here the understanding is more vigilant, and the powers are more wise, and the discharge of the artillery makes such a noise that the soul cannot help hearing it. Here the devils represent to us these serpents, that is, the things of this world. They wish to persuade us that the pleasures thereof are almost eternal. They place before us the esteem which men have had for us, our friends and relations, our health which will be ruined by the austerities of penance. For a soul which desires to enter this mansion always begins to desire mortification, and a thousand other such impediments are represented to her. O oh, Jesus, what disorders do the devils raise here? How great are the afflictions of the poor soul, not knowing whether she should advance or return to the first room. On one side, reason represents to her what a cheat and a folly it is to imagine all this to be in any way valuable, in comparison with that to which she aspires. Faith teaches her what is sufficient for her. Memory discovers to her what all these things will end in, and represents to her the death of those who once enjoyed abundance of these transitory things, and how she has seen some persons die very suddenly, and how soon they were forgotten by every one, and how she has seen some, whom she knew when they were in great prosperity, now trodden underground, and when she has passed by their graves, often she has beheld many filthy worms breeding on their bodies, and so with regard to many other things which memory can represent to her. The will inclines her to love him, in whom she has seen so many proofs of love, some of which she would be glad to repay. It is especially represented to her as this true lover never departs from her, as he always attends her, and gives her life and being. The understanding then comes in, and makes her know that though she should live many years, she could not find a better friend than God, that all the world is full of deceit, and that those pleasures which the devil proposes to her are also full of troubles, cares, and contradictions. It tells her to be confident, that out of this castle she will find neither safety nor peace, that she should not go to other houses, since her own is so well provided with good things, if she will only enjoy them. And who enjoys all he requires? So much as she does in her own mansion, especially as she possesses there a guest, who will make her mistress of all blessings, if she do not wander from home, like the prodigal son, who was obliged to feed on the swine's flesh. But, O oh my Lord and my God, how does our being accustomed to vanity and to the things of the world scatter all these blessings? Faith is so dead that we love much more what we see than what it tells us. We behold indeed nothing but great misery in those who seek after these visible things and this misery is brought on by those poisonous objects with which we come in contact. For as a person who is bitten by a viper is poisoned, and swells all over his body, so it will be the case here, unless we be very careful. It is clear that great care will be required for our recovery, and God bestowed a high favor upon us if we do not die from the effects. Truly does the soul suffer great afflictions herein, 
especially if the devil should perceive that she is disposed to go further on. All the powers of hell will then combine together to force her back. O oh, my Lord, how necessary is thy aid herein, without which nothing can be done. In thy mercy permit not this soul to be deceived, by leaving off what she has commenced. Give her light to see that herein all her happiness consists to avoid bad company. It is very important to converse with those who speak on such subjects, and to associate not only with those who are in the same rooms where she is, but with those also who she knows have entered further into the rooms nearer the king, for this will be exceedingly useful to her, and she may converse with them in such a way that they might take her in with them. Let her always be on her guard, lest in this attack she be conquered by yielding, because should the devil find her firmly resolved rather to lose her life, her rest, and all he can offer her, than return back to the first rooms, he will soon leave off attacking her. Let her be courageous, and not like those who, when they went out with Gideon to battle, bent themselves down on the ground to drink. Let her remember that she goes out to fight with all the devils, and that there are no better arms than those of the cross. Though I have mentioned this in other places, yet I repeat it here again, viz. that the soul must not think she will find in what she now commences ease and pleasure. This would be too mean a kind of beginning, for the erection of so noble and so costly a building. If we should begin to build it upon such sand, it will all fall to the ground, and we shall always be having disgusts and temptations, for these are not the mansions in which manna is rained down, they are further on, where the soul relishes everything as she desires, because she desires nothing but what is pleasing to God. It is very strange indeed, that though we are full of a thousand impediments and contradictions, and have such weak virtues as can scarcely move, being but just born, and God grant that they have begun to be born, still we are not ashamed to desire delights in prayer, and to complain of irridities. Never allow this to happen to you, my sisters. Embrace the cross, which your spouse carried on his shoulders, and remember that this should be your motto, viz., that she who can suffer most for the love of him will be the happiest. Let everything else be secondary to this. If our Lord shall grant you this favor, give him many thanks for it. You may imagine that as regards exterior trials, you are quite resolved to endure them, provided God may caress you in the interior. But His Majesty knows best what is sufficient for us. He needs no advice as to what He should give us, since He may justly say to us, You know not what you ask. The principal object of one who begins to make use of prayer, do not forget this, for it is important, should be to endeavor and resolve, and dispose oneself, with all possible diligence, to conform his will to that of God. Be assured, as I shall afterwards mention, that herein consists all that high perfection which we should attain in our spiritual progress. The more perfectly we practice this, the more shall we receive from our Lord, and the further shall we advance in this way. Think not that there are herein strange languages and unintelligible things, unheard of before, for in doing God's will consists all our good. But if we err in the beginning, and desire that God would immediately do our will, and lead us according to our fancies, what firmness can this edifice have? Let us endeavor to do all we can, and beware of those poisonous animals, for often does our Lord allow evil thoughts to afflict us, and they do indeed afflict us, without our being able to drive them away. He leaves us in aridities, and sometimes he permits these beasts to bite us, that so we may afterwards learn how to avoid them, and he thus wishes to try whether we are sorry for having offended him. Be not therefore discouraged, if sometimes you fall. Do not neglect to go forward, for from such falls God will draw good, just as he who sells treacle drinks poison first, to prove whether the treacle be good. When we do not perceive our misery in any other thing, but are sensible of the great harm we receive from being distracted and dissipated with regard to exterior things, the mere fact of our enduring this conflict might suffice to make us return to our recollection. Can there be a greater evil than not to live in our own house? What hope can we have to find rest in the houses of other people, if we do not enjoy it in our own? But it seems that those most intimate and sincere friends and kindred, I mean the powers of the soul, with whom we must always live, 
whether we will or no, make war upon us, as if sensible of the rebellion which our vices have raised against them. Peace, peace be with you, my sisters, as our Lord said, to which he frequently exhorted his apostles. But believe me, that if we neither have it, nor endeavor to find it in our own house, we shall not find it in another person's house. By the blood which Christ shed for us, let this war now cease. This I request of those who have not begun to enter into themselves, and also for those who have begun, viz., that they must not allow this war to force them to go back. Let them consider that a relapse is worse than a fall. They already see their ruin. Let them confide in God's mercy, and not in themselves, and they shall see how God will lead them on from one mansion to another, and place them in a country where these beasts cannot touch them nor attack them, but where they can subdue them all and laugh at them, and enjoy, even in this life, far greater blessings than we could wish. But as I said at the beginning, I have shown you elsewhere how you should act in these troubles which the devil raises here, and how the commencement of recollection is not to consist in strength of arms, but in sweetness. In order that you may persevere more faithfully, I will say no more here, except to declare my conviction that it is very beneficial to confer with persons of experience. You may, perhaps, think that it is a great loss to omit some things which are not necessary to be done. But if you do not entirely leave off prayer, our Lord will direct everything to our profit, though we may find no one to instruct us. There is, however, no remedy for this evil. But to resume it again, otherwise the soul will lose everything by little and little, and God grant she may understand it. Some of you may think that if it be so dangerous to go backwards, it were better never to have entered, but always to remain outside the castle. I have already told you in the beginning, and our Lord himself has said so. He that loves the danger shall perish in it. The gate for entering this castle is prayer, as I have said. To think then we shall enter heaven without praying, and entering into ourselves by the knowledge of ourselves, and the consideration of our own misery, and what we owe to God, and by often imploring his mercy, is foolishness. Our Lord himself has said, No one can come to the Father but by me. And somewhere else he says, He that seeth me seeth the Father also. Now if we never look at him, nor consider how much we owe him, nor the death he suffered for us, I do not understand how we can know him, or perform works in his service. For what value can faith have without these, and what worth can these have, if not united with the merits of Christ? Neither do I know who can excite us to love this Lord. May his majesty be pleased to make us know how dearly we have cost him, and that the servant is not greater than the master, and that we must work in order to enjoy his glory. And for this reason we must pray likewise, that so we may not fall into temptation. End of the Second Mansion, Chapter 1The Third Mansion, Chapter 1, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Rev. John Dalton. The Third Mansion, Chapter 1. The saint shows what little security we can have while we live in this exile, though we may have reached a high degree of perfection, etc. To those who, through the goodness of God, have conquered in these combats, and by perseverance have reached the third mansions, what shall we say but these words, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. His majesty has conferred no small favor upon me, by making me now understand, for otherwise I have little ability for such things, the meaning of these words in my own tongue. With reason do we truly call him blessed, since, as far as we can understand, unless he turn back, he is secure in his salvation. Here you see, sisters, how important it is to have conquered in the former battles, for I consider it certain that our Lord never fails to place him, who has arrived so far, in security of conscience, and this is no small happiness. I said, in security of conscience, but I spoke incorrectly, for there is none in this life, and, therefore, always understand my meaning to be, 
except he forsake the way he has begun there is no security it is indeed a very great misery to live in this life where we must always be like those who have their enemies at the gate who can neither eat nor sleep but are obliged always to have their arms continually in their hands always to be in anxiety and fear lest the enemy make a breach on some side or other and become masters of the castle o oh, my lord and my god how canst thou wish that a life so miserable should be loved it is impossible for us to avoid wishing and requesting to be taken out of it were it not for the hope of losing it for thy sake or spending it entirely in thy service and above all because we know it is thy pleasure we should live in it if this be so my god let us die with thee as st thomas said since to live without thee and in the fear of being possible to lose thee for ever is nothing else than to die many times i tell you therefore my daughters that the blessedness we must ask for is to be at last in security with the blessed for amidst these fears what pleasure can he have who finds no pleasure except in pleasing god consider that some of the saints have had a much greater fear than this and yet they have fallen into grievous sin nor are we sure that if we fall god will stretch out his hand i mean his especial assistance to draw us out of them and that we shall do penance as those saints did i assure you my daughters while i am writing these words i am so seized with fear that i neither know how i write nor how i live when i reflect on this subject and this i very often do pray my daughters that his majesty may ever live in me for otherwise what security can such a life as mine have which has been so wicked be not afflicted on hearing it has been so as i have sometimes seen you when i have thus spoken to you this comes from your desiring that i should be very holy and you have reason for so do i desire but what can i do if i lose this holiness through my own fault i cannot complain of god that he has not given me sufficient help for the accomplishment of your desires i cannot speak thus without tears nor without extreme confusion when i see myself writing for those who can even teach me this is a hard obedience may our lord grant that as it has been performed for his sake it may in some way prove beneficial to you and if for nothing else may it help you to beg pardon of our lord for this miserable sinner who is so presumptuous but his majesty knows i can only presume on his mercy and since i cannot help having been what i was i have no other remedy but to have recourse to his mercy and to trust in the merits of his son and of the blessed virgin his mother whose habit you and i wear though most unworthy of it thank him that you are truly the daughters of this lady and therefore having so good a mother you must not be ashamed of my being so bad imitate her and imagine what the greatness of this lady must be and what a great honor it is to have her for our patroness for my sins and being such a wretched creature as i am have not been able to tarnish this holy order in the least but i wish to warn you against one thing viz not to be too secure because the order is such or because you have such a mother for david was a great saint yet you know what solomon proved neither should you make much account of the enclosure and penance in which you live nor let your always conversing with god or your continual exercise of prayer make you secure nor your being so much separated from the world nor your abhorring worldly things all this is very good but not sufficient as i have said to free us from fear often then remember and meditate on this verse blessed is the man who feareth the lord having digressed much i know not what i was saying and when i reflect on myself i am unable to mention anything good and therefore i will not say any more now on that subject returning then to what i began to say respecting souls who have come into the third mansions i consider this to be no small favor which our lord has bestowed upon them but rather a very extraordinary one viz that they have overcome the first difficulties i believe there are many such souls in the world who through the goodness of our lord are extremely desirous of not offending his majesty who keep themselves from venial sin are lovers of penance and of their hours of recollection and prayer who spend their time well and are exercised in works of charity towards their neighbor who are very regular in their actions and the government of their house 
such at least as have families. This is indeed a very desirable state, and there seems to be no reason why these should be denied entrance into the very last mansion, nor will our Lord deny it to them, if they be willing, for this is an excellent disposition to induce him to show them all kind of favors. O oh, Jesus, who will not exclaim that he is desirous of so great a happiness, especially as he has already conquered the greatest difficulties? Every one must desire it. We all say we desire it. But as something more is required in order that our Lord may take entire possession of the soul, it is not enough to say these words, just as it was not sufficient for that young man whom our Lord asked if he would be perfect. Ever since I began to speak of these mansions, methinks I see him, for our case resembles his. Hence, in a great measure, proceed these great aridities in prayer, though there may be other causes also. I do not speak now of certain internal afflictions, very intolerable, which some good souls endure without any fault of theirs, out of which our Lord always delivered them with great gain to them. Neither do I speak of those who are troubled with melancholy and other infirmities. We must not pry into the judgments of God. My opinion is that what I have mentioned is generally the cause of them. For as these souls see that they would not on any account commit a mortal sin, and many would not willfully commit even a venial sin, and that they spend their lives well, and make a good use of their property, they cannot with patience endure that the gate should be shut against them, by which they might come into the chamber where the king is, whose servants they consider themselves, and they are really so. But though earthly kings have many subjects, yet they cannot all enter his chamber. Enter, enter, my daughters, into your interior, and pass beyond those miserable works of yours, which, on account of your being Christians, you are bound to perform, and much more also. Let it be sufficient that you are God's subjects. Be not desirous of much more. Consider the saints who have entered into the chamber of this king, and you will see by their lives what a difference there is between them and us. Do not demand that which you have not merited, for whatever service we do, we must not think we can merit it. We who have offended God. Oh, humility, humility, I know not what temptation has come upon me herein, for I cannot help believing but that he who heeds these aridities is in some way wanting in this virtue. I do not wish, as I said, to speak of those great internal afflictions whereof I have already said, that they show a far greater want of humility. Let us try ourselves, sisters, or let our Lord try us. He can best do it, though we often do not desire to understand it. Coming to those souls who are so well disposed, let us see what they do for God, and we shall soon find we have no reason to complain of His Majesty. For if we turn our back on Him, and go away sad, like the young man in the Gospel, when he tells us what we are to do in order to arrive at perfection, what do we wish his majesty to do, who will give a reward in proportion to the love we bear him? This love, my daughters, must not be built on our own fancy, but proved by works. Yet do not think he stands in need of our works. He only wants a resolute will. We must not imagine, because we wear the habit of religion, which we have voluntarily taken, and have abandoned all earthly things for God's sake, though they may be only like the poor nets of St. Peter. He gives much, however, who gives all he hath, that therefore we have done everything. This is indeed a good disposition, if we persevere in it, and return no more among the insects of the first rooms, though merely in desire. But no doubt she will obtain her object if she persevere in this nakedness and abandonment of all things. But it must be on this condition, and remember, I reminded you of it before, that she consider herself to be an unprofitable servant, as Christ has said, and think not that our Lord is thereby obliged to bestow such favors upon her, but rather that she having received more, is the more indebted to him. What can we do for so powerful a God, who died for us, who created us, and continually gives us being, that we should not esteem ourselves happy in discharging some part of what we owe him, who has given us so much and served us. These words I used unwillingly, I mean served us, yet it is true, since he did nothing else all the time he lived in the world, without our asking him for fresh favors and pleasures. 
Consider well, my daughters, some points which I have here marked out for you, though somewhat obscurely, not knowing how to express them better. Our Lord will make you understand them, that you may draw humility from aridities, and not restlessness, for this the devil aims at. Believe me, that wherever this virtue is really found, though our Lord may give no delights at all, yet he will bestow a certain peace and conformity, which will satisfy you more than pleasures and favors do, since, as you have heard and read, his majesty often bestows such favors on the weakest, though I think they would not change these pleasures for the greater strength of those who encounter aridities. We are greater lovers of pleasure than of the cross. Do thou, O Lord, who understandeth the truth of things, try us, that so we may know ourselves. End of The Third Mansion, Chapter 1The Third Mansion, Chapter 2, of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Third Mansion, Chapter 2. The saint continues the same discourse and speaks of aridities in prayer, etc. I have known some souls, and may with great truth say many, who have arrived at this state, and lived many years in this uprightness and composure of soul and body, as far as can be done, and yet, after this, when they now seemed almost lords of the world, at least greatly undeceived respecting it, when his majesty began to try them in some small matter, they acted with so much restlessness, disquiet, and narrow-heartedness, that they made me astonished, and also exceedingly fearful for them. It is no use to give them advice, because having so long addicted themselves to virtue, and practiced it, they fancy they can instruct others, and that they have abundant reason to feel such things. In a word, I have met with no remedy, nor do I find any to console such persons, unless it be to show great compassion for their affliction, and it is, indeed, a pity to see them subject to such misery, and not to contradict their fancies, for they agree in their imagination that it is for God's sake they endure these things, and thus they never consider it to be an imperfection in them, which is another delusion that happens to persons so far advanced. That they should feel such things is no wonder, though, in my opinion, this feeling should quickly pass away. For our Lord, in order to make his elect sensible of their misery, often withdraws his favors for a time. We need nothing else in order to know ourselves immediately. This way in which our Lord tries these souls is soon discovered, for they very clearly understand their defects. Sometimes, when they see themselves inclined to earthly things, and these no very great matters, without their being able to help themselves, this afflicts them more than the other. But this I consider a great mercy of God, for though it be a fault, still it is very useful towards acquiring humility. This, however, is not the case with the persons I speak of, for they, as I said, admire these things in their thoughts, and wish others to admire them likewise. I will mention a few particulars, in order that we may prove and understand ourselves better before our Lord prove us. It is better to be prepared and to know ourselves beforehand. A rich person having no children, nor any one to whom he can leave his estate, happens to lose some of it, yet not so much but that the remainder is sufficient for himself and household, and he has even something to spare. Now if such a person should be so much disturbed and uneasy, as if he had not bread to eat, what use would it be for our Lord to require such a person to forsake all things for the love of him? It may be said that the person is troubled at his loss, because he could have left his money to the poor. But I am confident God prefers that he should conform himself to what his majesty does, and endeavor to keep his soul quiet, rather than to exercise this charity. But as he does not do this, because our Lord has not advanced him so far, let it pass. Let him understand, however, that he is wanting in his liberty of spirit, but by means of it he might dispose himself in such a way, that our Lord would be induced to give him this liberty, because he begs it of him. Another has abundance to live on and something to spare. An opportunity presents itself for obtaining more wealth. 
if it be offered in the way of a gift let him take it but seek after it and when this is obtained to strive for more and more let the intention be ever so good and it must be for as i said these persons are given to prayer and are really virtuous yet let these individuals be assured that they will never enter the mansions next to the kings it is just the same with these persons if they chance to be despised or their honor to be lessened however slightly for though god gives them the grace to bear this trial well very often since he is very desirous of favoring virtue in public so that the particular virtue which they fancy they have may not suffer or it may be because these persons have done him some service for our lord is exceedingly good yet there remains in their mind a certain uneasiness which they cannot easily overcome or get rid of o oh my god are not these the persons who for so long a time have meditated on the sufferings of thy son and have considered how great a favor it is to suffer and who even desire sufferings they wish every one to be as regular in their manner of life as they themselves are and god grant they may not imagine the anxiety they suffer to be only for the faults of others for in their thoughts they imagine this to be meritous also you may think sisters that i wander from the subject and that what i say does not relate to you because here in this house there are no such things since we neither have nor desire nor seek after wealth nor does any one do us the least injury these comparisons then you may say have nothing at all to do with us still many other things which may happen may be learnt from them which to mention here is neither necessary nor convenient by these comparisons you will discover whether you are wholly disengaged from all affection to that which you have abandoned for certain little matters present themselves though not of this kind by which you may make a sufficient trial of yourselves and know whether you have the command of your passions and believe me the matter consists not in wearing or not wearing a religious habit but in endeavoring to practice virtue and in subjecting our own will in everything to that of god it also consists in regulating our lives conformably to whatever his majesty shall order and appoint and in desiring not our own will but his but as we have not yet arrived at this point let us as i said acquire humility sisters for this is the ointment of our souls and if we possess this virtue the physician who is god will come and heal us though he may delay a little the penances which such persons perform are as regulated as their life these they carefully observe in order thereby to serve our lord for all this is not bad in the performance of these penances they use great discretion in order that they may not injure their health never fear their killing themselves for their good sense will take care of that such a love is not desired as deprives us of reason but i wish we had such reason as not to be content with serving god in this manner always in the same way so that we never arrive at the end of our journey and as in our opinion we are always going on and thus we tire ourselves for believe me this is a very tiresome way it will be very good if we do not lose ourselves but my daughters if we had to go from one country to another where we might conveniently arrive in eight days how would you like it if on account of the inns the winds the snows the rains and bad roads we were a year on our journey would it not be better to finish the journey at once for we shall meet with all these inconveniences and there is danger from the serpents also oh how many clear proofs could i give of this god grant i may have escaped these for i often think i have not while we proceed with so much caution everything offends us because we are afraid of everything and so we have no courage to venture forward as if we could arrive at these mansions and leave others to endure the difficulties of the way but as this is impossible let us sisters for the love of god urge ourselves on and leave our reasons and our fears in his hands let us forget this natural weakness which may occupy us exceedingly let our superiors whom it concerns take care of this and let us think of nothing but hastening on to see this lord for though you have but few delicacies yet too much care for your health may deceive us how much more when our health will be no better on this account this i know and i know likewise 
that the matter does not consist in that which relates to the body, this being the least considerable. The journey I speak of is our advancing with great humility, and herein, if you understand me, I consider lies the loss of all losses to those who do not go forward. We should, therefore, imagine that we ourselves have traveled but a little way, and so we should really believe, but that our sisters have made haste, and have advanced far, and we ought not only to desire but endeavor to be the most base and wicked of all creatures. If we do this, we shall prove that we are in a most excellent state. Otherwise, we shall continue all our lives where we are, with a thousand afflictions and miseries. For, not having left ourselves, our journey becomes very difficult and painful, because we travel way down with this clay of our misery. But this does not happen to those who go forward, and ascend to the remaining mansions. In these mansions, of which I am now speaking, our Lord does not fail to reward us, but as a just and merciful God, for he gives us much more than we deserve, and bestows upon us pleasures far greater than those delights which we receive in this present life. But I do not think that he gives many internal delights, unless he may sometimes do so, in order to invite us to behold what passes in the other mansions, that so we may prepare ourselves to enter them. You may, perhaps, imagine that joys and pleasures are one and the same thing, and you may ask, why I make a difference in their names. To me the difference seems to be very great, though I may be mistaken. But I will explain my meaning in the fourth mansions, which come next, and as I shall then have something to say respecting the pleasures our Lord gives, it will be there the proper place to speak on the subject, and though this may seem unprofitable, yet it may in some way prove useful, in order that understanding what each is, you may strive for what is the best. This is a great comfort for souls whom God leads thus far, but a subject of extreme confusion for such as already imagine they have obtained everything. If they be humble, they will be excited to give God thanks, but if they want this virtue, they will feel an interior dejection, though without any cause, for perfection does not consist in having sweetnesses, but in this, in loving most, and so the reward will be in proportion, and in striving who will labor the best in justice and in truth. You will perhaps ask me, if this be true, as it most certainly is, of what use is it to speak of those inward favors, and to discover how they are to be known? I know not. Ask him who commands me to write on the subject, for I should not dispute with my superiors, since this would not be fit, but simply obey them. What I can with truth assert is, that when as yet I neither had, nor by experience knew, nor once thought of ever having any such thing in all my life, this I thought with reason, since it would have been too great a joy for me to have discovered, or even conjectured, that in anything I pleased God. Yet when I read in books respecting the favors and consolations which our Lord bestows on souls that serve Him, I was extremely taken with them, and thereby my soul was excited to give great praises to God. If my soul then being so bad did this, how much more will good and humble souls praise him? And though only one should praise him, and that but once, in my opinion, it would be proper to mention such praise, in order that we might know what joys and delights we lose by our own fault, and rather so much the more, because if they come from God, they are attended with love and courage, helps which enable us to travel without pain, and to go on increasing in good works and virtue. Do not imagine it is of little importance whether we work or no, for provided that we do everything which lies in our power, our Lord, who is just will, give us in some other way what he deprives of us in this, for reasons best known to himself, since his secrets are very hidden, at least that which is the best for us will no doubt be given to us. That which, in my opinion, would be exceedingly useful to those who, through the mercy of God, have arrived at this state, to whom, as I have said, no small favor is shown, that they are so near ascending higher, is being very careful to comply promptly with obedience, and it would be very useful for persons, even though they might not be religious, to choose, as many do, someone whom they might consult, in order to avoid doing their own will in anything, for this is what generally deceives and hurts us. And here we should not seek a person of the same disposition and ideas as ourselves, 
who might flatter us, instead of striving to detach us from the things of this world. But we should procure one who knows well the deceits of the world, because, by conversing with one who already knows them, we shall then be better enabled to discover these deceits ourselves, and also because some things, which at first appear impossible, yet when we see that others easily perform them and sanctify them, encourage us exceedingly. By their flying, we venture to fly, just as young birds do, which though they cannot at first take a high flight, yet do it by little in imitation of the old ones. This helps us very much, I know it. However much these persons may be resolved not to offend God, yet it is the best not to expose themselves to the occasions of offending Him, because, as they are still near the first mansions, they might easily return to them again, for their courage does not rest on a solid foundation, like theirs who are exercised in afflictions, for these understand the tempests of the world, and know how little they are to be feared, and that its pleasures are not to be desired and perhaps some violent persecution would force them back, for the devil knows how to raise such storms in order to do us harm. But these persons, intending through a laudable zeal to prevent the sins of others, prove unable to resist that which may happen to themselves upon such occasions. Let us mind our own faults, and not trouble ourselves about those of other people. It is very common for persons who are so regular themselves to wonder at everything, and yet we might perhaps learn, in something of great importance, from the very person at whom we wonder. And if we should pass them in our exterior comportment and manner of conversation, this is of no great consequence, though it may be good. But we should not, therefore, immediately desire that all persons should walk in the same way, just as one should not teach the workings of the Spirit, who perhaps does not know what they are. For in this desire, my sisters, which God gives us of doing good to our souls, we may commit many errors. Hence, the best course is to follow the directions of our rule, that is, always to endeavor to live in silence and in hope, since our Lord will take care of the souls He loves. And if we do not neglect to pray to His Majesty, we shall by His assistance advance greatly. May He be blessed for ever. End of the Third Mansion, Chapter 2「The Fourth Mansion, Chapter One of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Fourth Mansion, Chapter One. The saint speaks of the difference which exists between sweetness and tenderness in prayer. She also mentions the consolation she found on discovering that the imagination and the understanding were distinct powers. As I am now about to speak of the fourth mansions, it is necessary, as I said, that I should recommend myself to the Holy Spirit, beseeching him to speak for me henceforth, that so I may say something of those mansions yet remaining, so as you should understand me. Here begin supernatural subjects, and it is very difficult to make them understood, unless His Majesty assist us. As I have said elsewhere, when writing about fourteen years ago, what I had then learnt and experienced, though it seems to me I now have a little clearer knowledge of those favors, which our Lord bestows on some souls. But merely feeling them is quite different from knowing how to express them. May His Majesty teach me how to express myself, if any profit is to be derived therefrom. If none, then I do not wish it. As these mansions are nearer the chamber where the king is, great is their beauty, and there are things there so glorious to be seen and understood, that the understanding is incapable of finding any means whereby to explain these subjects properly, without being very obscure to those who have no experience therein. But he who has this experience, especially if it be great, will understand what is said. In order to arrive at these mansions, it may seem necessary to have lived a long time in the former ones. But though, generally speaking, one must have dwelt in the last we were speaking about, yet there is no certain rule, as you have often heard. For our Lord bestows his favors when, and how, and to whom he pleases, being his goods, without any injury to anyone. 
venomous reptiles seldom enter these mansions and if they should they do no harm but rather we gain thereby i consider it the best for us when they do enter and make war against us in this state of prayer because the devil may mingle his delusions with those delights which god gives us if there were no temptations and so he might do much more harm than when there are temptations and the soul might not gain so much when those things were removed which acquire her merit and she is left in her ordinary inebriation when the soul always remains in one state i do not consider it safe nor does it seem to me possible that the spirit of god should during this exile continue always in the same state now to come to what i was discoursing of viz the difference between the pleasures and delights which we receive in prayer methinks that those may properly be called pleasures which we ourselves acquire in our meditations and petitions to our lord and these come from our good works though assisted of course by god for this must always be presupposed since without him we can do nothing they proceed as i said more from the particular good actions we perform and which it seems we have gained by our labor and justly does it please us to be employed in such things but if we consider the matter well we shall find the same pleasures in many other things which may happen to us in the world thus for example from a great estate coming unexpectedly to us from seeing one whom we did not expect to see and whom we love tenderly from having brought to a successful end a business of importance from having succeeded well in a matter of which all speak well from beholding arrive safe home either a husband a son or a brother whom we heard was dead i have seen tears attended with great delight and sometimes this has happened to myself methinks that as these are natural joys so are those which divine things excite in us except that the latter are of a more noble origin though even those others are not bad in a word they begin from our nature and end in god delights begin from god and nature feels them and delights as much nay more in them as in the examples i have mentioned o oh, jesus how i long to be able to explain myself herein because i think i find a clear difference and yet i am unable to make myself understood may our lord assist me i now remember some words we use at prime in the last psalm which runs thus at the end of the verse cum dilataste cormeum whoever has much experience will hereby see the difference between the one and the other but he who has not this experience will require more explanation the pleasures of which i have spoken do not enlarge the heart rather do they straighten it though they may be pleasures which arise from considering that we do something for god and certain tears of sorrow follow which seem caused in some degree by passion i know little of these passions of the soul and of that which comes from sensuality and from our nature if i did i might perhaps be able to express myself better but i am so dull that though i have had experience therein i do not understand it or know how i could explain my meaning as i could wish knowledge and learning are very necessary for everything what i have known by experience concerning this state i mean the tenderness and delights received in meditation is this that if i began to weep over the passion of our lord i could not finish without having a violent headache it was the same when i wept for my sins our lord thus bestowed a great favor upon me i am not now desirous of examining which is best this or that but i wish i could explain the difference between one and the other tears sometimes flow from these things and desires arise aided by our nature and constitution but as i have said they at last end in god and even so we ought to esteem it a high favor if there be humility and remember that they who receive these favors are not therefore the better because we cannot tell whether they are all the effects of love but when they are it is the gift of god the souls of the preceding mansions have for the most part these devotions for they are almost always occupied by the operation of the understanding in discourse and meditation and they do well because more is not given to them still it would be good sometimes to employ themselves in making acts of love and praise to god to rejoice in his goodness and other perfections and to desire his honor and glory and doing all this in the best manner we can for these acts powerfully excite the will let them take care however when our lord bestows such affections upon them not to forsake them in order to finish their usual meditation but having spoken at some length in another part on this subject 
I shall say no more here. This point, however, I wish you to notice, viz., in order to make great advance in this way, and to be able to ascend to the mansions we desire, we must remember that the business does not consist in thinking, but in loving much. Do, therefore, whatever may excite you most to love. Perhaps we do not know what love is, and I do not wonder at it, for it consists not in having greater delights, but greater resolutions and desires of pleasing God in everything, and in endeavoring, as much as possible, not to offend Him and in beseeching him that he would promote the honor and glory of his son and extend the bounds of the catholic church these are signs of love do not imagine that it consists in not thinking on anything else and that all is lost if you have a few distractions with this confusion of thought i myself have sometimes been greatly afflicted it is not much more than four years ago since I came to know, by experience, that the thought or imagination, that you may understand me better, is not the understanding. I asked a learned man, and he told me this was true, and this answer gave me no small satisfaction. As the understanding is one of the faculties of the soul, I was troubled because it was sometimes so restless, and generally the imagination flies so rapidly that only God can tie it up and when he ties it we then seem to be in a manner disengaged from the body i have seen i think the powers of the soul employed on god and recollected in him and yet on the other hand the imagination so unquiet that i was astonished o oh, my lord except as some small satisfaction the great trouble which we endure in this journey through want of knowledge the misery is that as we suppose we have no more to learn but to think upon thee we neither care to ask those who are learned, nor do we imagine there is anything to be asked. Hereby we suffer terrible afflictions, because we do not understand ourselves, and we consider that to be a great crime which is not bad, but good. Hence arise the afflictions of many who are given to prayer, and their complaints of inward troubles, at least this happens to persons who are not learned. Hence also arise melancholies and loss of health, and a total neglect of prayer through not considering that there is an interior world. And as we cannot prevent the heavenly bodies from going on their rapid course, so neither can we stop the wanderings of the imagination. But we immediately send all the faculties of the soul after it, and consider ourselves quite lost, and that we have misspent the time during which we were in God's presence, and perhaps in the meantime the soul is wholly united with him in the inmost mansions, while the imagination is roaming round the suburbs of the castle, and is engaged with a thousand wild and poisonous beasts, and thus acquiring merit by this painful conflict. We should not therefore trouble ourselves, nor give up our prayer, for it is the devil's object to induce us to do so. The greater part of all our troubles and miseries arise from our not understanding ourselves. While I am writing these words, and considering the great noise which, as I said in the beginning, runs in my head, so that I consider it almost impossible to finish what I am commanded to write, methinks there are within it many vast rivers, and on the other side of these waters, that several little birds hang chirping. This noise is not in my ears, but in the top of my head, where they say the superior part of the soul resides. I have been in this state for some time, and it seems to be a wonderful movement of the spirit, mounting upwards with speed. God grant I may remember in the following mansions to explain the reason of this, it is not proper to do it here. It is very probable that our Lord was pleased to send me this pain in the head and infirmity, that so I might understand it better. For notwithstanding all the noise I endure, it does not hinder my prayer, nor my attention to what I am saying. For my soul remains very tranquil in her quiet, and love, and desires, and clearness of knowledge. Now if the superior part of the soul reside in the top of the head, how is it that it is not troubled by the noise? This I know not, but I do know that what I say is true. When the prayer is without suspension, then indeed the noise troubles her. But while this continues, no harm is perceived. It would, however, be a considerable evil if through this obstacle I were wholly to omit prayer. It is not therefore good to trouble ourselves on account of distracting imaginations, nor indeed to heed them at all. For if they are caused by the devil, by our acting thus he will desist. But if they come, as they do, from the misery entailed on us by Adam's side, together with many other evils which come from the same source, let us, however, bear them patiently for the love of God. 
we are likewise without our being able to help it subject to eating and sleeping which is a great affliction let us acknowledge our misery and desire to be there where no one can despise us for i remember having sometimes heard what the spouse in the canticles has said to this effect indeed i find nothing in this life concerning which words can be said with more truth since all the contempts and crosses which happen to us in this world seem not in my opinion to be in any way compared with these inward conflicts any exterior trouble or war may be endured provided we can find peace where we live as i have said before but that we should find rest from a thousand troubles which are in the world and that our lord should be pleased to prepare such a rest for us and afterwards that we should find these difficulties is indeed a very painful and almost insupportable cross bring us therefore o lord to that place where these miseries cannot delude or attack the soul as they sometimes seem to do though even in this life our lord delivers her from these when she has arrived at the last mansion as i shall explain if god wills me to do but perhaps these miseries will not afflict and torment all persons as they have done me during many years i was so wicked that it seemed i desired to be thus revenged on myself and because this proves so painful to me i think that it may perhaps prove so to you likewise therefore it is that i mention it on every occasion in order to try whether i could once make you understand it as it is so necessary in order that it may not always trouble and afflict you but let these thoughts which may be compared to a milk clock pass by and let us grind our corn not omitting to work with our will and understanding this trouble is more or less according to our health and the times the poor soul may suffer though without any fault herein since we do other things for which it is but proper we should practice patience and because that which we read and are advised to do is not sufficient viz to induce us to pay no attention to these thoughts us especially who know but little i think that is not all lost time which is spent in some further explanation of it and in comforting you in this particular but little good can be done till our lord is pleased to give us light it is necessary however and it is his majesty's pleasure also that we should use the means which may help us let us endeavor to understand ourselves and not blame the soul for that which is only caused by a weak imagination by nature and the devil end of the fourth mansion chapter one the fourth mansion chapter two of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anne boulet the interior castle or the mansions by saint teresa of avila translated by the rev john dalton the fourth mansion chapter two the same discourse is continued and by a comparison she explains what is meant by tenderness in prayer o oh, my lord how much i have digressed i have already forgotten the subject i was speaking about for business and sickness have compelled me to put off my writing till i had more leisure and then having a bad memory also i do everything without any order because i cannot review what i have written and who knows that perhaps whatever i say is without method and confused at least it seems so to me i think i have said concerning spiritual consolations that they are sometimes mixed with our passions and they carry with them certain fits of sobbing i have even heard tell of some persons whose heads have been affected thereby and certain external motions have likewise followed which they could not stop and this with such violence as to make the blood gush out of their nostrils with other painful things of these i can say nothing because i have no experience therein but they afford us comfort because as i have said all ends at last in a desire of pleasing god and of enjoying him but those which i call divine delights and which i have named elsewhere the prayer of quiet are of another nature as those amongst you who through the mercy of god have experienced them will understand in order to understand the subject better let us imagine we see two springs together with two cisterns that are filled with water for i find no comparison more adapted for explaining spiritual subjects than this of water and this i account for because i have little knowledge and my ability is but of little service and because i am a great lover of this element 
which I have considered more deeply than other matters. For many and deep secrets must necessarily be found in all those things which have been created by so great and wise a God, and hence we may gain much benefit from considering them, just as they do who understand them, though I believe that the very smallest creature which God has made, even the smallest ant, contains in it much more than we generally imagine. Now these two cisterns are supplied with water in different ways, the one from a distance by several pipes, and with great skill, and the other is filled by the very rising of the water, without any noise at all. If the source be abundant, as that is of which we are speaking, it sends forth a great stream, after it has filled the cistern. Here pipes laid by art are needless, since the water never fails, but runs continually. You see here the difference, for the water which comes through pipes resembles, in my opinion, the tenderness and pleasure spoken of before, which we draw through our meditation. For these we draw from our thoughts, by the help of creatures in the meditation, and by tiring the understanding. In a word, as they are obtained by our diligence, they make a noise when we are filled with the benefits which, as I said, they cause in the soul. To the other cistern the water comes from its proper source, which is God, and thus, when His Majesty wills, and is pleased to bestow some supernatural favor, He produces it with excessive and most abundant peace, quiet, and delight in our interior, without our discovering whence or how it comes. Neither are this joy and delight felt in the heart, as the joys of the world are. I mean, they are not felt at first, but afterwards every part is filled, and the water goes through all the mansions and powers, till it reaches even to the body. And therefore I said that it begins in God and ends in ourselves, because the whole exterior man, as those will find who have experienced this, enjoys this pleasure and sweetness. While I am now writing these words, I am thinking of the above-mentioned verse, Thou hast dilated my heart, dilataste cor meum. He says, He has dilated the heart, it does not seem to me, as I said, that it is a thing which takes its rise from the heart, but from some other more interior part, as a profound deep. I think it must be the center of the soul, as I afterwards understood, and as I shall explain more in detail, for I discover, indeed, such wonderful secrets within us, as often to astonish me. But how many more are? O oh, my Lord and my God, how wonderful is thy greatness! Yet here we live, like so many silly swains, imagining we have attained some knowledge of thee, and yet it is indeed as nothing, for even in ourselves there are great secrets which we do not understand. I say, as nothing, when compared with the treasures found in thee, though even from thy works we discover very sublime greatnesses respecting thee. Returning then to this verse, I think that which will suit my purpose best is this dilation. When this heavenly water begins to rise, from the source I spoke of, in the inmost recess of the soul, our whole interior seems to be enlarging and dilating, and producing certain delights which cannot be expressed. Neither can the soul understand what this is which is here given to her. A certain fragrance is diffused, as if, I may say so, some odiferous perfumes were cast into a brazier, without any light being seen, or the place whence the odor comes. But the heat and delicious scent pass through the soul, and very frequently, as I have said, the body shares in this delight. See that you properly understand me, for neither is any heat felt nor smell perceived, since it is something more subtle than these. I speak thus to make you understand me. Let those persons who have not experienced these things know that this is the truth, that it is understood, and that the soul understands it more clearly than I now mention it. This is not a thing that can be imagined, since with all our diligence we cannot acquire it. Hence it is manifest that it is not of our own coin, but of the purest gold of divine wisdom. Here the powers, in my opinion, are not united, but absorbed and astonished, as it were with the wonders they behold. It is possible that in treating of these interior subjects, I may in some way contradict what I have said elsewhere, and no wonder, for it is about fifteen years since I wrote the book, and perhaps our Lord has now given me clearer insight into these things than he did then. Both now and then I have made mistakes in everything, but I cannot tell an untruth, for by the divine grace I would rather suffer a thousand deaths. I speak on what I understand. 
the will clearly seems to me to be united in some way with that of god but these truths of prayer are best known afterwards by their effects for there is no better crucible to try them by our lord bestows a very great favor if he who receives these gifts should understand them it is an extraordinary favor if he should not return back you my daughters wish immediately to be possessed of this prayer and with reason since the soul without as i have said is never able to understand the favors which our lord bestows upon her here and with what affection he attracts her nearer and nearer to himself it is certain that she desires to know how this favor is obtained i will tell you what i have learned regarding it let us submit when our lord is pleased to bestow it since his majesty wills it so and not otherwise our lord knows why let us not trouble ourselves concerning this after we have done what those in the preceding mansions do let us practice humility humility is the virtue by which our lord suffers himself to be overcome and to grant us whatever we desire of him the first mark by which you may discover whether you possess this virtue is to think yourselves unworthy of these favors and delights from our lord nay that you do not deserve to have them at all during your life you may ask me how are these things to be obtained if we are not to seek after them i answer there is no better means than that which i have mentioned and we should not seek them for the following reasons first because the chief thing which is necessary for this object is to love god without interest secondly because it shows a little want of humility that we should imagine we can obtain such a great favor by our miserable services thirdly because the true and most proper preparation for this object is a desire for suffering and imitating our lord and not for having delights since we have offended him so much fourthly because his majesty is not bound to give them to us as he is to give us eternal glory if we observe his commandments for we may be saved without these delights and he knows better than we do what is the fittest for us and for those who truly love him what i say is indeed true i know some who proceed as they ought by the way of love in order solely to serve jesus christ crucified who not only do not ask him for delights nor desire them but they beg of him not to bestow them in this life this is the truth fifthly because we should only labor in vain for as this water does not pass through pipes like the former unless the spring supplies it all our labor will be of little use i may say that with all our meditation and all our struggles and tears this water will not come for it is bestowed only on him to whom god shall please to give it and often when the soul thinks the least about it we are his sisters let him do with us as he pleases and lead us whatever way he wills i firmly believe that whoever will truly humble and annihilate themselves i say truly because we must not act according to our fancy which often deceives us but i mean we should be wholly disengaged from everything our lord will not fail to bestow this and many other favors upon them which we know not how to desire may he be praised and blessed for ever amen end of the fourth mansion chapter two the fourth mansion chapter three of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Fourth Mansion, Chapter 3. The Saint explains what is meant by the Prayer of Recollection, and she describes its effects. The effects of this prayer are many, some of which I will now mention. And first, there is another kind of prayer, which commences almost always before this, whereof I will say but little, having spoken of it elsewhere. It is the prayer of recollection, which also seems to me to be supernatural, for it does not require being in the dark, nor to shut the eyes, nor does it consist in any exterior thing it often happens that without our wishing it our eyes close and we desire solitude and without any contrivance a building seems to be erected for the prayer mentioned above for the senses and external things seem to lose their hold so that the soul may recover hers which was lost they say the soul enters within herself and sometimes that she ascends above herself 
By these expressions I shall not be able to explain anything, for I have this unhappiness in thinking you will understand me best according to the way I can express myself. Perhaps no one except myself will understand. Let us imagine that the senses and faculties, which I call the guards of the castle, and this is the comparison I made use of, whereby to explain my meaning, have gone out and associated with strangers, who wish evil to this castle for some days and years. Afterwards, perceiving themselves lost and sensible of their ruin, they endeavor to return and approach the castle, though not resolved to enter it, for habit is a hard master. Yet they are no longer traitors, for they remain around the environs. The great king who is within the castle, perceiving their good inclination, in his mercy is willing to pardon them, and like a good shepherd acts towards his sheep, he makes them know his voice by so sweet a whistle, that they themselves can scarcely hear it. This he does that they may not wander and be lost, but return to their mansion. This whistle of the shepherd has such power, that they immediately abandon all those external things which deceive them, and hasten into the castle. Methinks I never explain myself in the way I have now, for in order to seek God in our interior, where he is found with more profit than in creatures, St. Augustine tells us he found him there, after having sought him in several places. It is a great help if God should bestow this favor upon us. Think not that this is acquired by means of the understanding, laboring to consider God within itself. It is good, and an excellent method of meditation, for it is founded on this truth, viz., that God is within us. But this is not what I mean, because every one may do this by the assistance of our Lord. What I speak of is of a different nature. For sometimes these persons, before they begin to think of God, have already got into the castle. By what way I know not, nor how they heard the whistle of their shepherd. It was not by means of their ears, since nothing is heard, but a sweet recollection in the interior is clearly perceived, as those who go along this way will find. I know not how to express my meaning better. I think I have heard this compared to a tortoise retiring within itself. Whoever made use of this comparison no doubt understood it well. But these creatures enter into themselves whenever they please. Here, however, it is not the case. For the recollection of which I am speaking is only in our power when God is pleased to bestow this favor upon us. I think that whenever His Majesty bestows it, he gives it to such only as are already disengaged from the things of this world. I do not say that they are actually so, but perhaps their state will not allow it, but they are so in their affections and desires, since he so especially invites them to attend to interior things. Hence I believe that we are to give ourselves up entirely to his majesty. He would bestow not only this, but many other gifts on those whom he begins to call to higher things. Let him praise God greatly, whoever shall experience this in himself, for it is very proper he should understand the favor and give thanks for it, that so he may dispose himself for others which are greater. The disposition which will prepare us for this is to listen attentively to whatever our Lord shall speak to us interiorly, as some books advise and direct us, not to seek after discourse, but to attend to whatever God shall work in the soul, though unless his majesty begin to give us raptures i cannot understand how the thought can be restrained but that this is likely to do us more harm than good though this is a question frequently discussed among some spiritual persons for my part i confess my want of humility for they have never given me sufficient reason to incline me to their opinion one person mentioned to me a certain book of the holy friar peter of alcantara and he is one to whom I am sure I should submit, for I know he understood this. On reading the book, we found he said the same as I did, though not in the same words. But we may collect from what he said, that our love is still to be kept awake. It is possible I may still deceive myself, but I rely upon these reasons. Firstly, that in this work of the Spirit, he who thinks and desires to do less, does more. All we have to do is to ask like some poor persons before some great and rich emperor, and immediately let us cast down our eyes and wait with humility. And when by his secret ways it seems that he hears us, then it is good to be silent, since he permits us to stand near him. And it will not be amiss to forbear working with the understanding, I say, if we can. But if we perceive this king has not heard us, nor that he pays any regard to us, 
we must stand like dolts, for the soul only remains so when she herself procures this. Then she remains much colder, and perhaps the imagination becomes more restless, by the violence which is offered to it in our thinking on nothing. Our Lord wishes we should ask Him, and that we should remember we are in His presence, who knows well what is best for us. I cannot persuade myself that human industry is of any avail in such things as His Majesty has placed bounds to, and has wished to reserve to Himself. This He has not done in many other things that are in our power, provided He assist us, such as in penance, prayer, and other good works, as far as our misery is able to go. The second reason is, because these internal works are all sweet and peaceable, whereas to do things painful, I mean by painful, any violence done to ourselves, such as holding our breath, rather hurts than helps us. But the soul must leave herself entirely in the hands of God, to do with her whatever he pleases, without her taking any care about her own interest, at least as little as possible, and totally resigning herself to the will of God. Thirdly, because the same care which is employed for thinking on nothing will, perhaps, excite the imagination to think much. Fourthly, because the most pleasing and substantial service we can do for God is to have only His honor and glory in view, and to forget ourselves, our own benefit, delight, and pleasure. But how does He forget Himself, who uses so much care that He does not dare to stir nor breathe? nor lets his understanding and desires move him to wish God's greater glory, nor does he rejoice at what he already possesses. When his majesty wishes the understanding to leave off discoursing, he employs it in another way, and gives it a light and knowledge so far above what we can arrive at, that he makes it to remain absorbed, and then, without our knowing how, it is much better instructed than it would be with all our diligence, which may rather do it more harm, and mislead it. For as God has given us faculties that we may work with, and everything has its reward, we need not charm them, but let them do their office, till God shall advance them to something better. That which I think the most proper for the soul to do, which God has been pleased to raise to this mansion, is what I have already said. We should likewise endeavor, without violence or noise, to keep the understanding from discoursing, but not suspend it, nor the imagination either. Yet it is good to remember that it is in presence of God, and who this God is. If what it feels is the cause of suspending it, well and good. But let it not try to understand what this is, for as it is bestowed on the will, let her enjoy it without using any industry. Let her do nothing except only to utter certain amorous expressions. For though we strive here not to be without thinking on nothing, yet often we are so, though it may be only for a very short time. But, as I have mentioned elsewhere, the reason why, in this kind of prayer, the understanding ceases to discourse, is this I speak of, that wherewith I began this mansion, to which I have likewise added that of recollection, of which I was to speak first, and which is much inferior to that which I have called the prayer of divine delight, but it is the commencement towards arriving at it. For in that of the recollection, neither meditation nor the operation of the understanding should be omitted. The reason is, because in this kind of prayer, the delights rise immediately from the source, without being conveyed in pipes, or the understanding spends itself in considering that it does not understand what it desires. Hence, it goes up and down like one mad, and rests upon nothing. The will is so fixed upon her God, that the restlessness of the understanding greatly afflicts her. Therefore she must not heed it, for it makes her lose much of that which she enjoys. Let it alone, and let her throw herself into the arms of love, for His Majesty will teach her what she is to do on that occasion. This consists almost entirely in considering herself unworthy of so great a favor, and employing herself in giving thanks. Through speaking of the prayer of recollection, I have been prevented from mentioning the effects on signs found in souls, to whom our Lord gives this prayer. This is clearly perceived an enlargement or dilation in the soul, just the same as if water that flows from a spring into a cistern should have no passage out of it, but the cistern was made in such a way that the more the water comes in, the greater and wider does the vessel become to contain the water. And so it seems to be in this prayer, whereby God works many other wonders in the soul, 
and thus disposes her further still for containing all. This sweetness and interior enlargement are manifested by what remains in her afterwards, for she is not so restrained, as formerly she was, in matters relating to the service of God, but she enjoys much more liberty. Neither is she distressed through the fear of hell, for though she feels greater fear now for having offended God, yet she is free from servile fear, and has a great confidence that she shall enjoy him. The fear she used to have of losing her health by doing penance has now ceased, and she thinks she can do all in God, as she has greater desires of using austerities than ever. The fear of afflictions, likewise, which she used to have, is now more moderate, because she has a more lively faith, for she knows that if she bears them for God's sake, His Majesty will give her grace to bear them with patience. Nay, sometimes she desires them, since she has a great desire to do something for God. And as she now understands his greatness better, she accordingly esteems herself more vile. Having likewise tried the delights of God, she finds those of the world but dung in comparison. She separates herself from them by little and little, and for doing this she has more command over herself. In a word, she has improved in all virtues and will not fail to go on increasing, unless she should relapse and offend God again, for then all is lost however highly raised a soul may have been in virtue and contemplation. We must not suppose that when God bestows this favor once or twice, the above-mentioned effects will always remain in her, unless she continue to receive the like favors, for herein all our good consists. There is one point to which I earnestly wish to draw the attention of him who finds himself in this state. It is this, to be extremely careful not to expose himself to the occasions of offending God, for the soul in this state has not strength enough, but it is like an infant beginning to suck. For should it leave the mother's breast, what can be expected but death? I have great fears lest the like should happen to him on whom God shall bestow this favor, if he should leave off prayer, unless it be on some very particular occasion, or provided he return to it quickly, for otherwise he will go on from bad to worse. I know there is great reason to fear in this case, and I know some whom I pity much, for I have seen this happen to them of which I am speaking, when they forsook him who so ardently desired to become their friend, and to prove himself such by his actions. I thus warn them beforehand to avoid the occasions, because the devil labors much more against one such soul than against many others on whom our Lord does not bestow such favors, because they may do him much more harm by drawing others after them who may do great service to the church of God. And were there nothing else but to see how his majesty shows a particular affection for them, this would be enough to induce him to do his utmost for their destruction, and thus they are furiously attacked by him, and if once conquered, they are more deeply ruined than others. You, my sisters, are free as far as can be seen from these dangers. May God preserve you from pride and vainglory, and permit not the devil to counterfeit these favors, which may be known by not having these effects but all are quite the contrary. I wish to warn you of one danger, though I have alluded to it in another place. It is one into which I have observed persons fall who are given to prayer, and women especially, who, being weaker, have more need of the caution I wish to give here. It is this, that some persons being weakened with severe penances, prayers, or watchings, or having naturally a weak constitution, swoon away on receiving some of these consolations, and their nature fails them, and when they perceive some internal delight, with a certain external decay and languishing, or when a spiritual sleep, as it is called, happens, which is somewhat more than the above mentioned, they mistake the one for the other, and allow themselves to be absorbed, and, in the meantime, the more they yield, the more are they absorbed because their nature becomes weaker, and in their idea it seems to be a rapture, but I call it a stupidity, for it is nothing else but losing our time and destroying our health. A certain person continued eight hours together in this way without sense, or without any perception of divine things. But by being made to sleep and eat, and indiscreet penances being forbidden her, she was cured of this distemper, for there was one who knew the person well, though she had deceived her confessor, and several others, and herself too, yet without any intention of deceiving. I believe that the devil used some diligence to draw some profit thence, 
and he began to gain a great deal thereby. We must notice that when this truly comes from God, though there may be an interior and exterior languishing, yet it is not in the soul, which feels strong emotions on seeing herself so near to God. Besides, this continues only for a very short time. It returns, however, again, and is absorbed, and if, as I said, there be not weakness in this prayer, the suspension is not so great as to enfeeble the body, or to cause any external alteration in it. Be sure, then, when you find yourselves thus affected, to acquaint the superioress, and take as much recreation as possible, and let her not give you so many hours of prayer, but very few. She should also make you sleep and eat enough, till your usual strength shall return, in case you should have lost it thereby. But if any one's constitution be so weak that this is not sufficient for her, believe me that God wishes her to be only in the act of life, for there must be monasteries for all kinds of persons. Let them employ her in business, and be always careful that she never be left alone, for if she be, she will completely ruin her health. This will be a great mortification to her. Here our Lord will try her love for him, by observing how she bears his absence. After some time, he may perhaps be pleased to restore her strength, but if not, she will gain by vocal prayer, and by obedience what she would have obtained this way, and perhaps she may gain more. Some may likewise be found of such a weak mind and imagination, I have known some such, that they think they see all they fancy. This is very dangerous. But as I may hereafter say something more on this subject, I will say no more here, as I have dwelt so much on this mansion, into which I think more souls enter, and where the devil may do more harm, because the natural and supernatural are often found united. For in the following mansions, our Lord does not give him such power. May he be praised for ever. End of the Fourth Mansion, Chapter 3THE FIFTH MANSION, CHAPTER ONE, OF THE INTERIOR CASTLE. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. THE INTERIOR CASTLE, OR THE MANSIONS, BY ST. TERESA OF AVILA. TRANSLATED BY THE REVEREND JOHN DALTON. THE FIFTH MANSION, CHAPTER ONE. The saint begins to explain how the soul unites herself with God in prayer, etc. Oh, my sisters, how shall I be able to explain to you the riches, treasures, and delights which are contained in these fifth mansions? I think it better to say nothing respecting those delights which I have not yet mentioned, since it is impossible to be able to express them. Neither can the understanding comprehend them, nor are comparisons of any use in explaining them, since earthly things are too mean for this purpose. O oh, my Lord, send light from heaven, that I may be able to enlighten these thy servants, since thou art pleased that some of them should enjoy these delights. Enlighten some of them, that they may not be deceived by the devil, who transforms himself into an angel of light, for their desire is to please thee. Though I said some of them, yet many of them enter these mansions, of which I am now about to speak, some more and some less and therefore I say that the greater part enter them, but I believe that few attain some of these delights, which I shall mention here, and which are to be found in this mansion. But if they should reach only the gate, that is a great favor which our Lord shows them, for although many are called, yet few are chosen. And so I say now, that although we all wear this sacred habit of Carmel, and are all called to prayer and contemplation, because this was our rule in the beginning, which those holy fathers of Mount Carmel drew up, who purchased this treasure and this precious jewel which we now speak of, by such great solitude and contempt of this world. Yet few of us dispose ourselves that so our Lord may discover this jewel to us. For though as regards our exterior we go on well at present, yet in order to obtain what is necessary in the way of virtue, we must not be negligent in anything, for we stand in need of great virtue. Let us then, my sisters, earnestly beseech our Lord, that since we may in some degree enjoy heaven upon earth, he would grant us his grace, and show us the way, lest through our own fault we miss it, and that he would give strength to our soul, to enable us to dig till we find this hidden treasure, which is certainly within us. 
this i should wish to explain if our lord be pleased to enable me i said strength to the soul in order that you may know that as regards bodily strength there is no obstacle to one on whom our lord does not bestow it no one is prevented from purchasing his wealth if one give what he has god is content blessed be so great a being but consider daughters that in order to obtain this object of which we are speaking he does not wish you to keep anything back less or more he will have all for himself and in proportion to what you know you have given he bestows greater or less favors upon you there is no better proof than this for discovering whether we have arrived at the prayer of union or not think not that here is a dream like the former i say a dream because there the soul seems to be as it were asleep though she seems neither fast asleep nor yet quite awake here however she is thoroughly awake to god though fast asleep as to worldly things and to ourselves for in truth during the short time that this lasts she is almost senseless and unable to think on anything even if she wished no art is necessary to suspend the imagination indeed if she loves she does not understand how she loves nor what it is she loves nor what she wishes to have in a word she is like one entirely dead to the world in order to live the more in god and this is a pleasant death a death because it is a loosening of the soul from all the operations which it can exercise while in the body it is a pleasant death because though she be truly in the body yet she seems to be separated from it in order to abide the better in god this is in such a manner that i know not whether she have even life enough to breathe i was thinking on it and it seems to me there was not enough at least if she do breathe she does not perceive it all her understanding would wish to be employed in knowing something of what she feels but as strength is not sufficient for this she remains so astonished that if she be not quite absorbed she neither stirs hand or foot as we say of one who swoons away in such a manner that we think he is dead o oh, wonderful secrets of god i should never be satisfied with endeavoring to make them understood if i thought i should succeed and thus i will say a thousand foolish things provided i may happen but once to speak to the point so that we may praise our lord exceedingly i said it was not a dream for in the preceding mansions until her experience is great she remains doubtful of that which happens to her whether she had desires whether she was asleep whether it came from god or whether the devil transformed himself into an angel of light in a word she has a thousand suspicions and it is well she has them since as i have said our nature itself may deceive us here sometimes for though venomous animals have not such easy access yet little lizards may get in and being small they insinuate themselves everywhere and although they do no harm especially if as i said they be despised these are little fancies which come from the imagination and for what has been mentioned above yet they are often very troublesome but these lizards however small cannot enter because here there is no imagination nor memory nor understanding that can hinder this good i dare venture to assert that if the union truly come from god the devil cannot enter or do any harm because our lord is joined and united with the essence of the soul so that he the devil dare not approach nor can he understand this secret for it is clear he does not know our thoughts much less can he understand so profound a secret this applies to the acts of the understanding and the will for the devil clearly sees the thoughts of the imagination unless our lord blind him at that moment o oh, blessed state in which this cursed one cannot hurt us thus the soul becomes a very great gainer because god works in her without any one even herself being able to hinder him and what then will he not give who is so willing and desirous of giving and who can do whatever he wills methinks i have thrown you into some confusion by saying if the union be from god as if there were other unions and so there are though they be about vain things such as when we love them much and then the devil transports such lovers out of themselves but not in the way that god does nor with the same delight satisfaction peace and joy of the soul it is a joy surpassing all the joys of the world all its delights all its pleasures 
and yet further we need only observe whence these joys come and whence those of the world for they produce very different feelings as you will find by experience i have said somewhere that the one resembles the touching of the skin or surface of the body but the other pierces the very marrow i spoke rightly and i know not how to express myself better it seems to me you are not yet satisfied because you imagine you may be deceived as it is a difficult matter to examine the interior although therefore what has been said may be sufficient for one who has experienced the like the difference being so great yet i wish to give you a clear proof by which you may be certain whether it comes from god for his majesty has this day brought the proof to my mind and it seems a sure one in difficult matters though i think i understand them and speak the truth i always use these words it seems to me for if i should be mistaken i may be the more willing and ready to believe what learned men tell me and though they themselves have not experienced these matters yet they have great weight because they are great scholars as god considers them so many lights in his church he discovers the truth of things to them in order that they may admit them and if they be not immoral persons but servants of god they are never astonished at his greatness because they know that his power is able to do still greater wonders in a word though some things be not declared they will certainly find others written whereby they may see that these also can be done in this respect i have great experience and likewise i have known certain half-learned timorous and jealous persons who have cost me very dear at least i think that whoever believes not that god can do much more and that he has been pleased and is still pleased sometimes to reveal himself to his creatures such a person keeps the gate closely shut against receiving any favors himself never let this happen to you my sisters but believe that god can do much more and do not trouble yourselves whether they on whom he bestows these favors be good or bad for this as i have said his majesty knows we must not meddle with this but with humility and simplicity of heart let us serve his majesty and praise him for his works and wonders to return now to the proof which i said was certain you see that god makes this soul quite stupid in order to imprint the deeper in her true wisdom hence she neither sees nor heeds nor understands nor perceives all the time she is in this state and this time is short and indeed it seems to her shorter than it is god so fixes himself in the interior of this soul that when she comes to herself she cannot but believe she was in god and that god was in her this truth is so deeply rooted in her that though many years may pass away before god bestows the like favor upon her she never forgets it not to dwell on the effects left in her of which i shall speak afterwards because it is a point of great importance but you will ask me how the soul saw it or understood it i answer she did not see it then but afterwards she sees it clearly and this is not so much a vision as a certitude which remains in the soul and which god only can infuse into her i was acquainted with a certain person who did not know that god was in all things by his presence power and essence but by a favor of this kind received from god she came to believe it so firmly that though one of those half-learned men of whom i have spoken and whom she asked how god was in us and he knew as little of this truth as she did before god made her understand it answered that he was there only by his grace yet the truth was so imprinted in her that she did not believe him she afterwards asked others and they telling her the truth comforted her exceedingly but you must not be led into a mistake by imagining that this certainty remains in a corporeal form just like the certainty whereby we believe the body of our lord jesus christ to be in the most holy sacrament though we do not see it he is not in this way here but only by his divinity but how can that have a certainty which we see not i do not know it is his work but i know that what i say is true and whoever has not this certainty i should say it was not a union of the soul with god but of some faculty or some other of the many kinds of favor which god bestows upon the soul in all these things we must not seek to know the reasons for seeing how they are done since our understanding cannot comprehend them why then should we desire to labor in vain and to trouble ourselves about it it is enough to know that he who is all-powerful has done it 
With regard to what I was saying, that here we can do nothing, I remember what I have heard the spouse say in the canticles, he brought me into the cellar of wine. She says not, she went there. She says, likewise, that she went seeking her beloved here and there. This union I consider as the cellar, where our Lord places us, when and how he pleases, but we can never enter by our own diligence. His majesty must bring us in, and enter himself into the center of our soul, without passing in through any gate, just as he came among his disciples, when he said to them, peace be with you and when he rose from the sepulchre without lifting the stone in order to show his wonders the more he does not wish us to contribute anything but to subject our will entirely to his neither does he expect that the gate of the powers and senses which are all asleep should be open for him you will see afterwards how his majesty is pleased to allow the soul to enjoy him more in her very center than she does here in this last mansion O oh, my daughters, what great things shall we see, if we wish to look upon nothing else but our own baseness and misery, and if we consider how unworthy we are to be servants of so great a Lord, whose wonders exceed all comprehension. May he be eternally praised. Amen. End of the Fifth Mansion, Chapter 1《The Fifth Mansion》Chapter 2 of The Interior Castle This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay The Interior Castle, or The Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Rev. John Dalton. « The Fifth Mansion » Chapter 2 she continues the same discourse, and illustrates the prayer of union by a comparison. You may imagine that I have already mentioned what is to be seen in this mansion, and yet much more remains to be said. For, as I have mentioned, there is more or less yet remaining. As regards union, I think I can add nothing more. But when a soul on whom God bestows these favors disposes herself, there are many things to be said about that which God works in her some of these i will mention and also say something respecting the state the soul is in to make the subject better understood i shall make use of a comparison proper for the purpose in order that we may see how though in this work which our lord himself does we can do nothing yet by our disposing ourselves we may contribute much to induce his majesty to bestow this favor upon us you have already heard of his wonders in the making of silk for only he could be the author of such an invention. And how from a seed no bigger than little peppercorns, this seed, when the mulberry trees first send out leaves, begins to quicken with the heat, while it was, as it were, dead, till this nourishment whereupon it lives appeared. Thus certain little worms feed on mulberry leaves, till afterwards they become bigger, and then on the boughs they go spinning silk with their little mouths, and making little cells very close, in which they are enclosed. From this cell or bag, which contains a large but ugly worm that dies, there afterwards rises a white and very beautiful butterfly. Who could believe this if we had not seen it, and it was related to us as being the case in other times or countries? Or by what reason can we comprehend that a creature so void of reason as a silkworm or a bee should be so diligent and so industrious in toiling for our benefit? The poor little worm loses its life in this work. This may serve you, sisters, as a meditation for some time, without my saying any more to you, for by means of it you may have some idea of the wonders and wisdom of our God. What then should we do? Did we understand the properties of all things? It is a great advantage to us to be occupied in meditating on these wonders, and a rejoicing that we are the spouses of so wise and powerful a king. But let us return to what I was saying, and apply the comparison I have mentioned to ourselves. This worm then begins to have life, when by warmth from the Holy Spirit it begins to make use of that general assistance which our Lord gives to every one, and to take advantage of the remedies which God has left in His church, both by frequenting the sacraments and reading good books, and hearing sermons. For these are powerful remedies for a soul, that is dead by its negligence and sins, and is plunged into the occasions of sin. 
then this worm begins to live and hereby it supports itself with good meditations until it has grown up this will serve my purpose for the rest is of little consequence now when this worm has grown up as i said at first it begins to make silk and to build its house in which it is to die this house i wish you to understand here is christ as saint paul says our life is hid with christ in god and that christ is our life you see here then daughters what we can do by god's assistance since his majesty himself becomes our habitation as he is in this prayer of union and we ourselves erect the habitation i seem to say we are able to take from or to add to god because i say he is a habitation and that we may erect it for our own abode but the truth is we can neither subtract from nor add to god but we can take from and add to ourselves as these little worms do for no sooner have we done all we can herein than god will unite our insignificant labors which are nothing with his greatness and he will give them so high a value that our lord himself will be the rewarder of our works and as he himself has been put to the greatest expense so he will unite our trifling sufferings with those immense ones which his majesty endured and he will make them all one. Oh, then my daughters let us quickly perform this work and weave this cell casting aside all self-love and our own will and let us not adhere to any earthly thing let us perform works of penance prayer mortification obedience and all the rest as you value god grant we may act according to our knowledge and the instructions we have received concerning our duty let this worm die let it die as it does when it has performed that for which it was created and you will then perceive how we see god and we behold ourselves immersed in his greatness just as the worm is in its cell notice how i say we shall see god as i have mentioned above that is as he discovers himself to us in this kind of union. Now let us consider what becomes of this worm, since for this purpose I have said all this. As soon as in this prayer it becomes sufficiently dead to the world, it comes forth a white butterfly. O oh, wonderful greatness of God! How changed does the soul come forth, by having been only for a short time, never, in my opinion, a full half hour, immersed in the greatness of God, and united closely to Him. I tell you the truth, she now does not know herself, for you must remember that there is the same difference here as there is between an ugly worm and a beautiful butterfly. The soul knows not how she could merit so great a favor, or whence it could come she is so desirous of praising god that she would be willing to annihilate herself and endure a thousand deaths for his sake she immediately begins to wish to endure great afflictions and she cannot do otherwise her desires of penance solitude and of all men knowing god are excessive and on this account she feels great pain in seeing him offended but in the next mansion i shall mention these things more in particular for the matter in this and the following mansion are almost the same though the power of the effects is very different because as i have said if a soul after god has advanced her to this state should force herself to go forward she will see great things oh how strange it is to behold afterwards the restlessness of this butterfly though in all its life it was never more at ease nor more calm this is an occasion of praising our lord that it knows not where to rest nor to settle and having before enjoyed such repose it is disgusted with all that it sees on earth especially when god often allows it to drink of this wine it gains more and more almost every time now it no more esteems the works which it used to do when a worm viz forming its cell by little and little its wings have now grown how then as it is able to fly can it take the pleasure in creeping along all it can do for god seems little in proportion to its desires it does not wonder much at what the saints did and suffered because it now understands by experience how our lord assists and transforms a soul in such a way that she does not seem the same nor to be the same shape because the weakness which she seemed to have before in doing penance she perceives is now no more but has become strong 
the ties which bind her to her friends relations or estate which when she was desirous of leaving neither acts nor resolutions were sufficient to remove are now entirely broken in such a manner that she is displeased to be obliged to do what is barely necessary in this respect lest she might seem to be resisting the will of god everything tires her because she has found that creatures cannot give her true repose i seem to say much but yet i could say more whoever has received this favor from god will clearly perceive that i say little no wonder then that this butterfly seeks out some new repose because it finds itself a new creature as regards the things of this world where then will the poor little creature go now return whence it came it cannot for it is not in our power until god be pleased again to bestow this favor upon us o oh lord what fresh troubles begin for this soul and who could imagine this after such sublime favors have been received in a word either one way or the other must we bear the cross as long as we live should any one say that having arrived there he always enjoys rest and delight i would answer he never reached so far but that if ever he entered the former mansion it was perhaps some delight caused by natural weakness and perhaps by the devil who sometimes gives us a certain peace in order to raise afterwards a more terrible war i do not say that they who arrive at this mansion have no peace for their very afflictions are of such value and so deeply rooted that from them come peace and content from this same disgust which earthly things cause such a painful desire arises of leaving this world that if anything can allay it it is the consideration that it is god's wish they should live in this land of exile but this is not sufficient for notwithstanding all these favors and benefits the soul is not so resigned to the will of god as it is afterwards still it does not fail to be resigned though it is with great pain for she is unable to act otherwise as no more is given to her and every time she prays her grief is accompanied with many tears this pain seems perhaps to arise in some degree from being exceedingly troubled on beholding god offended and so little esteemed in this world and at the destruction of so many souls heretics as well as infidels but christians excite her compassion the most and though she sees the mercy of god is great and that however wickedly they live they may repent and be saved yet she is afraid that many are lost o oh, greatness of god how a few years since and perhaps only a few days this soul remembered no one but herself and who has now placed her in such tormenting cares which so many years of meditation cannot make her so sensible of as she is now sensible of them but o oh, my lord if i should endeavor during many days and years to exercise myself in thinking on the great evil there is in god being offended how those who are lost are his children and my brethren on the dangers in the midst of which we live and how well it would be for us if we were out of this miserable life would not all these considerations cause this pain within me no daughters no this is not the pain which is felt here for by the assistance of our lord we may by often thinking on these things conceive a deep sorrow but it does not penetrate nor reach the inmost part of the soul like this i have been speaking about here which seems to grind a soul to powder without her procuring such a state or even sometimes without her wishing it what is this whence it comes i will tell you do you not remember what i said regarding the spouse though on another subject that god took her into the wine cellar and set in order charity in her the same happens here for this soul having entirely resigned herself into his hands the greatness of his love has so captivated her that she neither knows nor desires anything except that god would dispose of her as he pleases as far as i understand god will never confer this favor on any soul except upon such as he chooses for his own he is pleased without her knowing how that she should depart hence signed with his seal for here the soul does indeed no more than the wax when a seal is imprinted on it for the wax cannot seal itself but is only disposed that is it is soft nor does it soften itself for this object it lies still and allows the impression to be made o oh, goodness of god all is at thy cost 
thou requirest only our will and that there should be no resistance in the wax you see then sisters what our god does here for us that this soul may already know she is his he gives her what she has viz the very same that his son had in this life which is indeed an exceedingly great favor whoever desired more to leave this life than he did so spoke he at the supper with desire i have desired but my lord did not that sorrowful death which thou wert to suffer so painfully present itself before thine eyes no for the immense love and desire i had to some souls exceeded without comparison those torments and the many which i have already endured and which i still endure are sufficient to make me consider these as nothing often i have thought of this and knowing what great torments a certain soul known to me has endured and still endures by seeing how god is offended and that soul would rather die than endure it i considered that if a soul having such little love which when compared with that of christ might be said to be almost none felt such intolerable pain what then must christ our lord have suffered and what a life must he have led having all his sufferings present before him and always beholding the dreadful crimes which would be committed against his father i firmly believe these were far greater than those which he endured in his most sacred passion for then he saw the end of those sorrows and the joy of seeing our redemption purchased by his death and of testifying the love he had for his father in suffering so much for him no doubt lessened his pains just as it happens to men in this world who through the force of love perform great penances which they scarcely feel nay they would prefer to do still more for all seems but little to them what then did his majesty feel when he saw so good an opportunity offered by manifesting to his father his perfect obedience to him and love for his neighbor oh what a great delight is it to suffer in doing the will of god but to behold so many offenses continually committed against his majesty and so many souls condemned to hell is in my opinion so dreadful that i believe had he not been more than man one day of such torment would have been enough to have put an end to many lives how much more then to one end of the fifth mansion chapter two the fifth mansion chapter three of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Fifth Mansion, Chapter 3. The Saint continues the same discourse, and speaks likewise of another kind of union. Let us now return to our little dove, and consider some things which god bestows in this state we should always remember that she must endeavor to advance in the service of our lord and in the knowledge of herself for if she receive no more than this grace and become careless in her life as if already secure and turn out of the road which leads to heaven viz the commandments she will become like the worm which comes from a seed in order that other worms may be produced but it remains dead itself for ever i have said it comes from a seed because i am confident that god will not allow so great a favor to be bestowed in vain since the receiver should not be a gainer thereby it may at least profit others as he still possesses these virtues and desires mentioned before as long as he perseveres in them he will always do good to other souls by warming them with his heat and if he should lose it still he continues in the desire that other souls may be benefited and he delights to make known the graces and favors which god bestows on those who love and serve him i know a person who was exactly in this disposition though she was almost lost yet she delighted in being the means of others receiving profit by the favors god had bestowed upon her she also taught the method of prayer to those who were not acquainted with it and she did great good our lord in his mercy afterwards gave her light for in truth she had not as yet experienced the effects mentioned above but how many are there whom god calls to the apostleship as he called judas and to whom he communicates himself 
how many does he call to a crown like he called saul and who nevertheless afterwards perished through their own fault hence sisters let us draw the conclusion that in order to gain more merit and not to be lost like they were we can have no other security than obedience and a resolution not to transgress the law of god i speak to those on whom he bestows such favors and likewise to all persons it seems to me that after all i have said this mansion yet appears somewhat obscure but since so much is to be gained by entering into it it is good for those on whom god does not bestow supernatural favors not to consider themselves without hope since by our lord's assistance a true union may easily be obtained if we endeavor to procure it by having our will united only with god's will oh how many of us can say this that we desire nothing else and would die for this truth as i think i have already said i now tell you that when this is the case we have obtained this favor of our lord be not anxious about that other sweet union which i spoke about before since whatever is most valuable in that comes from this of which i am now speaking oh what a desirable union is this happy the soul which has obtained it she will live with comfort in this life and none of the evils of this life will trouble her unless it be from some fear of losing god or of seeing him offended neither sickness nor poverty nor the death of any one can disturb her except it be the death of one which god's church might miss such a soul sees clearly that our lord knows better what to do than she knows what she desires you must remember that there are pains directly produced by nature and by charity which move us to compassionate our neighbors just as our lord felt when he raised lazarus our being united with god's will does not remove these sorrows though they do not disturb the soul with a restless distressing passion they quickly pass away for as i mentioned when speaking of the delights in prayer they do not reach the interior part of the soul but only the senses and faculties they are felt in the former mansions but not in these latter of which i am now speaking in order then to attain this kind of union what has been said about suspending the faculties is not necessary here for our lord is able to enrich souls in many ways and conduct them to these mansions and not by the short road of which i have already spoken but carefully notice daughters that it is necessary the worm should die and this is the more to your cost for in the union mentioned above the seeing of ourselves in a life so new conduces much in helping you to die but here while living in this world it is necessary we should kill the worm ourselves i acknowledge this will cost us much more labor but it has its reward hence if you gain the victory your recompense will be the greater there is no doubt respecting its being possible if there be a real union with the will of god this is the union which i have desired all my life this it is which i continually beg of our lord for it is the most clear and secure but alas how few of us arrive at it though he who is careful not to offend god and has entered into religion imagines he has done everything oh how many worms remain undiscovered until like that which consumed the plant of jonas they have devoured our virtues by self-love self-esteem rashly judging our neighbors though in small things by want of charity towards others for although we satisfy the obligation being forced thereto of not committing sin yet we are far from doing what is required of us in order to be wholly united with the will of god what do you think daughters is his will that we endeavor to be entirely perfect so as to become one with him and the father as his majesty prayed observe what is wanting to us in order to arrive at perfection i tell you i am now writing with great grief because i see i am so much behind and all through my own fault for this object it is not necessary our lord should caress us with new consolations because it is sufficient that he has given us his son to teach us the way think not that if my father or brother should die the matter consists in conforming myself to god's will in such a way as not to feel their death or if sickness and troubles come then i must bear them cheerfully 
this disposition is good and sometimes it arises from a certain discretion because as we cannot remedy the matter we make a virtue of necessity how many such like things did the philosophers of old by means of their great wisdom here there are only two duties which our lord requires of us viz the love of god and the love of our neighbor these are the objects we must labor for by observing these laws perfectly we do his will and consequently we shall be united with him but as i have said how far are we from observing these two duties as we ought to do towards so great a god may his majesty grant us grace in order that we may deserve to arrive at this state and this is in our power if we wish in my opinion the surest sign for discovering whether we observe these two duties is the love of our neighbor since we cannot know whether we love god though we may have strong proofs of it but they can be more easily discovered respecting the love of our neighbor and be assured that the further you advance in that love the more will you advance in the love of god likewise for the affection which his majesty has for us is so great that as a return for the love we show our neighbor he will make that love go on increasing which we have for himself of this i have no doubt it is very important for us diligently to observe how we proceed in this matter for if we endeavor perfectly to acquire this love of our neighbor we shall have done everything because as our nature is corrupt and evil unless it come from the root which is the love of god we shall never perfectly possess the love of our neighbor since then sisters this love is so necessary for us let us endeavor to know ourselves in small things and not take much notice of some very great distractions which come crowding upon us in the time of prayer such as what we should wish to do for our neighbors and even for the salvation of one's soul and if actions do not follow conformable to these desires we have no reason to think we shall perform them i say the same respecting humility and all other virtues great are the wiles of the devil for he will turn hell upside down a thousand times in order to make us imagine we possess a virtue which in reality we do not and with reason does the devil act in this way for thus he effects much mischief because these counterfeit virtues are always attended with some vainglory coming from such a source but on the other hand those virtues which god gives are free both from pride and vainglory i am pleased to see certain souls who when in prayer seem willing to be despised and publicly insulted for god's sake yet afterwards they would hide a small defect if they could or if they have not offended but yet are accused of something god deliver us from the clamor they raise but whoever cannot endure this let him be careful not to pay any regard to what he has in his own opinion determined to do for it was not in reality any real act of the will because when it is so it is quite another thing but it must have been some imagination whereby the devil makes his attacks and lays his snares especially for women and unlearned persons because we cannot understand the difference between the faculties and the imagination and a thousand other interior things oh sisters how clearly can it be discovered which amongst you has really this love of your neighbor and which of you has it not in such perfection if you understood the importance of this virtue you would not trouble yourself about anything else when i see souls so very careful about being attentive at their prayers and about understanding them also so that it seems they dare not so much as stir or divert their thoughts lest they should lose the little pleasure and devotion they feel in their prayer i then clearly discover how little they understand the way by which they may arrive at union because they suppose all the business consists in this no sisters no our lord desires works if then you see a sister sick whom you can in any way relieve never fear you will lose your devotion if you sympathize with her if she be in pain grieve with her and if necessary fast that so she may have something to eat not so much for her sake as because our lord wishes it this is true union with his will if you should hear some person praised much rejoice more at this than if you were praised yourselves and this indeed is easy because where there is humility praise is a torment but to rejoice when the virtues of the sisters are known is a great matter 
and likewise when you discover any defect in them, to feel it as if your own, and to discover it. But on this point I have spoken at length elsewhere, because I see that if we fail herein, we are undone. Our Lord grant this may never happen to you, for if you be not wanting in this, I assure you you will certainly obtain from His Majesty the union mentioned above. But when you find yourselves wanting herein, though you may have devotion and delights, and may fancy you have already attained some little suspension in the prayer of quiet, for some will immediately imagine everything is done. Believe me, you have not arrived at union, and beseech your Lord to give you this perfect love of your neighbor. Let his majesty alone, for he can bestow upon you much more than you can desire, if you force your will to comply with that of the sisters in everything, even though you should lose some of your rights, and if also you should forget your own interest and pleasure, in order to accommodate and please them, however much nature may be opposed to it, and when an opportunity presents itself, if you relieve your neighbor of some trouble, and take it on yourself, think not this will not cost you anything. Consider how dearly the love our spouse had for us cost him. For in order to free us from death, he himself suffered the most painful death of the cross. End of the Fifth Mansion, Chapter 3THE FIFTH MANSION, CHAPTER FOUR, OF THE INTERIOR CASTLE. THIS IS A LIBRIVOX RECORDING. ALL LIBRIVOX RECORDINGS ARE IN THE PUBLIC DOMAIN. FOR MORE INFORMATION OR TO VOLUNTEER, PLEASE VISIT LIBRIVOX.ORG. RECORDING BY ANNE BOULET. THE INTERIOR CASTLE, OR THE MANSIONS, BY ST. TERESA OF AVILA. TRANSLATED BY THE REVEREND JOHN DALTON. THE FIFTH MANSION, CHAPTER FOUR. THE SAME CONTINUES THE SAME SUBJECT and enters into some further explanations of prayer, etc. You seem to me to be desirous of knowing what has become of this little dove, and where she rests, since I told you that she does not rest in spiritual delights, nor in worldly pleasures, but flies higher. But I cannot satisfy your desires till I come to the last mansion. God grant I may remember what I have to say, and have leisure to write it, for it is now five months since I began this book, and as the pains in my head will not allow me to review what I have written, things will probably be repeated twice over. But this is of little consequence, as what I say is intended for my sisters. I am particularly anxious to declare my opinion respecting this prayer of union, and, according to my poor understanding, I will make use of a comparison, and shall afterwards speak more at length of this butterfly, which never lies still, although it continually fructifies and benefits both itself and other souls, because it finds no true rest in itself. Now you have often heard how God is spiritually espoused to souls. Blessed be his mercy, who vouchsafes to humble himself so low. Though this may seem a gross comparison, yet I can find none more proper to express my meaning than the sacrament of matrimony, though the subject must be treated in a different manner. For being altogether spiritual, it differs much from the other, which is only corporeal. Because here everything is love united with love, and its operations are exceedingly pure, and so sweet and so delicate that they cannot be described. But our Lord knows how to make us feel them. It seems that this union has not yet arrived at a spiritual espousals. But, as in this world, when two persons are thinking of marrying, the first consideration is whether they are suitable, and whether they like each other, and see one another. So here also, if consent has already been given, and the soul be fully informed what advantage she will gain thereby, and if she be resolved to do the will of her spouse in everything, then his majesty is willing to take her, well knowing if the soul be so resolved. He also shows her this favor, of allowing her to be better acquainted with him, and that they may, as the saying is, come to have an interview with each other, and thus he unites her with himself. We may say that just so is it here, for all is over in a very short time. Here there is no giving or taking. It is only necessary that the soul be made to see, in a secret manner, who is this spouse whom she is to take, for she cannot by any method understand in a thousand years, by means of her senses and faculties, what she is able to learn here in a very short time. 
but as he is so loving a spouse he leaves her by giving her this one sight of him more worthy of being afterwards united with him because the soul becomes so enamoured with him that she does everything on her part not to break off this divine espousals but if this soul should grow negligent and set her affection on something else besides him then she will lose everything and her loss will be as great as are the favors which our lord continues to bestow upon her and greater far than words can express hence then christian souls i speak to those whom our lord has conducted so far i beseech you for his sake do not become careless but avoid all occasions of sin for when the soul is in this state she is not so strong as to be able to expose herself to them so much as she will be afterwards when the marriage is concluded this is the next mansion there was no further intercourse than seeing each other and then the devil becomes extremely busy in attacking her and trying to prevent these nuptials for afterwards when he sees that she has already wholly given herself up to her spouse he dares not become so bold because he is afraid having learnt by experience that if he should attack her at any time he frequently suffers great loss and she gains a great deal i tell you daughters i have known persons very far advanced and who have arrived at this state but these the devil afterwards recovered by his wonderful subtlety and stratagems for this purpose hell combines together because as i have said the devil loses not one but many souls he has now acquired great experience in this particular for if we consider the multitude of souls which by means of only one individual god attracts to himself we shall find matter of praise and thank him exceedingly how many thousands did the martyrs convert how many has one virgin as saint ursula conducted to heaven again how many souls has the devil lost by means of saint dominic saint francis and other founders of religious orders all these as we read in their lives received the like favors from god and what was this but that they endeavored not to lose by their own fault so divine an espousals o oh, my daughters our lord is as ready now as he was then to bestow favors upon us and even more if i may say so as if he required our being willing to accept them because he finds so few in these days who have such regard for his honor as they had then we are too great lovers of ourselves and we make use of too much human prudence to part with a little of our rights oh how dreadful a delusion is this may our lord grant us light not to fall into such darkness through his great mercy you may ask here or call in question two things first if the soul be so intimately united with the will of god as i have already mentioned how can she be deceived since she never desires to do her own will in anything secondly by what ways can the devil enter your soul with such danger as to ruin it since you have separated yourselves from the world frequent the sacraments and if i may be allowed the expression keep company with angels through the goodness of our lord all of you have no other object but that of serving him in everything it is no great wonder for those who are immersed in worldly things to be exposed to dangers i acknowledge you have great reason for what you say for god has been very merciful to us but when i consider how judas was among the apostles living continually with god himself and listening to his words i see there is no security whatever to the first question i answer that if this soul were always united to the will of god it is clear she could never perish but the devil comes with deep artifices and under the appearance of good unhinges her by making her notice some small things relating to herself and turning her attention to certain other matters which he makes her believe are not bad and thus by little and little he begins to darken the understanding and cool the will and breeds self-love in her till by one thing or another he withdraws her from god's will and unites her to his own from this truth an answer may be given to the second question for no enclosure is so strict into which the devil cannot enter no desert is so remote whither he cannot travel another thing i will mention and perhaps our lord permits it in order to see how this soul will conduct herself which he intends making use of to enlighten others 
the diligence which seems to me to be the most secure after having continually begged our lord in prayer to help us with his hand and having frequently considered that if he should leave us we shall soon fall into an abyss which is the truth and never putting any trust in ourselves which would be madness the diligence i repeat which seems to be the most secure is being very cautious and careful to observe how we advance in virtues whether we grow better or worse especially in loving one another and desiring to be esteemed the lowest even in ordinary things for if we consider well and beg light from our lord we shall immediately discover our gain or our loss you must not imagine that a soul which god has thus brought so far will be so soon forsaken by him and that the devil will not find work enough to do no his majesty so deeply feels lest she should be lost that in many ways he gives her a thousand internal warnings in order that the evil may not be hidden from her to conclude this discourse let us always endeavor to go forward and to fear exceedingly if we do not for without doubt the devil wishes to entrap us since it is not possible for a soul which has arrived so far should cease to go on increasing because love is never idle and therefore not to advance is a very bad sign because a soul which has resolved to become the spouse of god himself and has already conversed familiarly with his majesty and has arrived at the point mentioned before must not allow herself to sleep in order that you may see what our lord does for those souls whom he has already chosen for his spouses let us commence speaking on the sixth mansion and you will see how little all that is which we can suffer or do towards disposing ourselves for such great favors it may be our lord has appointed that i should be commanded to write this work in order that casting our eyes on the reward and considering how infinite his mercy is since he is desirous of communicating himself to such worms as we are we may forget the insignificant pleasures of this life and fixing our eyes upon his immensity we may run after him all on fire with love may he enable me to explain something relating to such difficult subjects for unless his majesty guide my pen i know very well it will be impossible if what i shall say should not tend to your benefit i beseech our lord not to allow me to say anything since his majesty knows that as far as i know myself i have no other object than that his name may be praised let us strive to serve a lord who rewards us so abundantly in this life and hence we may form some idea of what he will give us in heaven where the tedious labors and dangers which trouble us in this life shall not disturb us although were there not here some danger of losing and offending him it would rather be a pleasure for these troubles to last till the end of the world because we should be suffering for so good a god who is our lord and spouse may his majesty grant that we may deserve to do him some service without so many imperfections into which we are always falling even in our good works amen end of the fifth mansion chapter four the sixth mansion chapter one of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by anne boulet the interior castle or the mansions by saint teresa of avila translated by the reverend john dalton the sixth mansion chapter one the saint shows how when our lord begins to bestow greater favors there come greater troubles also some of these she mentions etc let us now speak by the assistance of the holy spirit concerning the six mansions wherein the soul remains wounded with the love of her spouse and aspires more after solitude removing as far as her state allows whatever may disturb this solitude this internal vision is so imprinted in the soul that all her desire is to enjoy it again i have already mentioned that nothing is seen in this prayer which can properly be called seeing neither is anything seen by the imagination i call it a sight on account of the comparison i made use of the soul is now resolved to choose no other spouse but the spouse pays no regard to her vehement desires of accomplishing the nuptials because he wishes her to long after them more earnestly and that such a favor which exceeds all goods 
should cost her something, and though all be little for so great a gain, yet I tell you, daughters, that the proof and security she has of possessing this gain is no more than necessary to enable her to bear this delay. Oh, how many troubles, both internal and external, must be endured before we can enter the six mansions! Truly, when sometimes I reflect upon it, I fear that were these troubles known beforehand, it would be exceedingly difficult for human infirmity to be able to bear them, and to resolve to endure them, however great might be the advantages which present themselves to her, unless the soul should have arrived at the seventh mansions, where she fears nothing, but rather embraces sufferings, and is resolved to endure them for the love of God. The reason is, because she is then almost always so united with His Majesty, that thence she derives all her courage. I consider it good and proper to mention to you some of these troubles, which I know for certain are endured. Perhaps all souls may not be led this way, though I much doubt whether those souls, which sometimes so truly enjoy heavenly things, can live free from earthly trials of one kind or another. Although I do not intend to speak about them, yet I considered afterwards, that where I do speak on them, it might give consolation to some soul in the like state, to understand what takes place in those on whom God bestows such favors, for then it really seems as if everything were lost. I shall not proceed according to the order in which these troubles succeed, but only as they present themselves to my memory. I wish to begin with the least, and this comes from the clamor which certain persons make with whom she lives, and for some, with whom she never spoke, though during the course of her life they may have heard something of her, for they exclaim, that she pretends to be very holy, that she goes to extremes, and does extravagant things, in order to deceive the world and make others appear worse, who are better Christians without these extravagancies. But they do not remember that nothing is required, except endeavoring to observe diligently the duties which one's state requires those whom she considered her friends withdraw themselves from her and are the very persons who afflict her the most and who seem to grieve that this soul is in their opinion ruined and manifestly deluded they are confident that these things come from the devil that she will meet with the same end which such and such a one met with who was ruined that through her fault virtue will decay and that she deceives her confessors they accordingly go to them and advise them to be on their guard placing before them the examples of some who by this very means have been ruined a thousand other such scoffs and expressions of this kind they make use of i know one who was in great fear lest she should find no one to hear her confession because so many spoke against her and as they said a great many things i need not detain you by relating them here but what is worse these trials do not end soon but last one's whole life for one warns another to take care and have nothing to do with such kind of persons. You may say, Surely there are some who will speak well of her. Oh, my daughters, how few are there who believe her actions to be good, in comparison with the many who abominate them. Besides, this praise is a much greater trouble to her than the troubles I have just mentioned, because the soul clearly sees that if there be any good in her, it is God's gift, and not her own in any way, for she has a little before discovered how exceeding poor she is and how buried in sins. Hence, such praise gives her intolerable pain, at least in the beginning, though it afterwards abates for these reasons. First, because experience clearly discovers to her that men speak well of a person as hastily as they speak ill, and therefore she regards the one no more than the other. Secondly, because our Lord has given her greater light in discovering that nothing good belongs to her, but is the gift of His Majesty, and thus, forgetting that she has any share therein, and beholding the good as it were in a third person, she excites herself to praise God. Thirdly, because if she has observed that some souls have been benefited by beholding the favors God bestows on her, she thinks His Majesty makes use of this means of having her esteemed virtuous, who is not so in reality, that souls may receive benefit thereby. Fourthly, having before her God's honor and glory more than her own, the temptation which comes in the beginning is removed, viz. that such praise will ruin her, as has happened to some, and hence she pays little regard to her being esteemed, provided that by her means God may be praised once at least, 
no matter what may come afterwards. These and other reasons lessen the great trouble which these praises cause, though some is nearly always experienced, except when the trouble is very slight and it is not much observed. But it is a greater trouble without comparison, to see oneself publicly esteemed good without reason, than to suffer the troubles I have mentioned. For when the soul has arrived so far, as not to be much affected by these things, she is much less influenced by those troubles. Nay, she rejoices at them, and they are to her as most delightful music. This is indeed the very truth, and the soul is hereby rather encouraged than dejected, since experience has now taught her the great benefit which she gains by this way. She thinks her persecutors do not offend God, but that His Majesty permits these trials for her great gain, and as she sees this clearly, she conceives for them a very particular and tender affection, considering them as her best friends, and as affording her much more gain than those who speak well of her. Our Lord is also accustomed to send her grievous sicknesses. This is a much more severe trial, especially when the pains are acute, for if they be violent, they seem to me to be the most severe afflictions that can be endured on earth. I speak of exterior trials, however numerous they may be. If they are such as I am speaking of, they disorder both the interior and exterior in such a manner, that the soul knows not what to do with herself in her anguish. She would more willingly endure any martyrdom, provided it were short, than suffer these pains. Still, they do not last long in such intensity, for God at last does not give more than may be endured. His Majesty first bestows patience. But with regard to other great pains and infirmities of various sorts, I knew one who from the time that our Lord began to bestow the favor above mentioned, now forty years ago, cannot be said to have had one day without pain and other kinds of suffering, I mean, want of health besides other great troubles. It is true that she has been so very wicked. She esteemed them all but little, in comparison with hell, which she deserved. Others, who have not offended God so much, may be conducted by another way. But I would always choose the road of suffering, because I wish to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ, even if there were no other advantage. But there are always many advantages. But if I could speak of the interior afflictions and make them understood, Oh, how trifling would these others appear! But it is impossible to describe the way they are felt. Let us begin with the affliction which arises from meeting with a confessor who is so cautious, and has such little experience, that he thinks nothing is secure, who fears everything, suspects everything, as if he saw something extraordinary. This is especially the case, if he should discover any imperfection in the soul which has these favors, for he thinks they ought to be angels on whom God bestows these favors, which is impossible while they live in the body. Then he immediately ascribes everything either to the devil or to melancholy. The world is indeed so full of this last, that I do not wonder the devil does so much harm by this way. And confessors have great reason to fear and be very cautious. But the poor soul which is possessed with the same fear, and goes to her confessor as to her judge, who, notwithstanding, condemns her, cannot help feeling great trouble and uneasiness. Only he who has experienced it can tell what a grievous affliction it is. Another trouble which such souls have to endure, especially if they have been wicked, is the thought that God allows them thus to be deceived on account of their sins. And though when His Majesty bestows upon them those favors, they feel secure, and cannot but believe it is no other spirit but that of God. Yet these favors soon pass away, but the remembrance of their sins still continues, and beholding defects in themselves, for some are never wanting, this torment immediately returns again. When a confessor comforts a soul, she becomes a little calm, though she falls again into trouble, but when he increases her fear, her trouble becomes almost insupportable, especially when some aridities follow. Then it seems she never remembered God, nor will she remember Him. And when she hears His Majesty spoken of, He seems to be one whom she had heard spoken of a long time ago. But all this is nothing, for in addition she may further imagine that she is not able to inform her confessors, and that she deceives them. And though she may observe things carefully, and be certain there is not even a first motion undiscovered, and though she may be often told not to trouble herself, 
still all is of no avail, because the understanding is so obscured that it is not capable of discovering the truth, but only of believing what the imagination represents to her, and this is then the mistress, and giving way to the impertinences which the devil is pleased to represent to her. And to him our Lord often gives leave to try her, and to make her imagine that she is abandoned by God, for there are many things by which she is attacked. There is also an inward anguish, so painful and intolerable, that I know not to what it can be compared, except to the torments of hell, because in this tempest no comfort finds admittance. If she seek for it from her confessor, the devils seem to have combined with him, in order to make him torment her the more. A confessor was once speaking with a person who had been in this torment, and finding it was a dangerous conflict, because so many things were united together, she told her to inform him when she was in the same conflict again. But she was always so much worse, and he afterwards understood that she could not help it, nor had she any power over herself. If she wished to read a book in her own language, she could no more understand it than if she were unable to read a letter, for her understanding was then incapable. In a word, there is no other remedy in this tempest but to hope in God's mercy, which by one word of his, or by some circumstance which seems casual, dispels everything so suddenly, that such a soul appears as if she had never been overcast, for she is now filled with light, and with much greater consolation. Like one who has escaped from a dangerous contest with victory, she continues to praise and give thanks to our Lord, for it was He who fought and conquered for her. She knows very clearly that she is able to do nothing, and it seems that all the arms with which she might defend herself are in the hands of her enemy. She likewise sees plainly her own misery, and how little we can do if our Lord should forsake us. She seems to have no need of consideration in order to understand this truth, because the experience she already has therein, having seen herself wholly unfit, now makes her know her own nothingness, because though she be in a state of grace, since notwithstanding the storm she does not, nor would not, for any earthly thing offend God. Yet it is so hidden that she thinks she neither has, nor ever had, the least spark of the love of God, because if she should have done any good, or His Majesty have bestowed any favor upon her, all seems to her to have been a dream or imagination. O oh, Jesus, what a sight it is to behold a soul forsaken in this manner, and how little, as I have said, does any earthly consolation avail her. Do not think, then, sisters, if sometimes you find yourselves in this state, that the rich, and those who enjoy their liberty more, have a surer remedy against these times. No, no, it seems to me to be like placing all the delights of the world before persons condemned to die, which would afford them no pleasure, but rather increase their torment. And so it is the same here. Consolation must come from above, for here earthly comforts are of no avail. This great God desires we should know our own misery, and acknowledge Him for our King. This is very necessary for what I shall mention afterwards. But what shall this poor soul do, if she continue thus for many days? If she pray vocally, it is as if she did not pray. I mean as to her receiving any consolation, for her interior does not admit of any. She does not even understand what she prays for, nor does she understand herself, though she may pray vocally. As for mental prayer, this is no time for it, because the powers are not prepared for it. Even solitude does her great harm, and this proves another torment to her, for she cannot endure to be in the company with any one, nor that any one should speak to her. However much she may strive against this, she still has a certain nausea in her exterior, which can be observed. It is impossible for him who endures this to be able to express it, because they are spiritual trials and pangs, for which no name can be found. The best remedy, that is, not for removing, for I know none such, but for enabling one to bear it, is attending to works of charity, and exterior employments, and hoping in God's mercy, which is never wanting to those who trust in Him. May He be blessed for ever. Amen. End of the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 1The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 2, of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 2. She speaks of certain ways by which our Lord awakens the soul, in which there seems to be no grounds for fear, etc. With regard to other exterior troubles which the devils raise, they are certainly neither so usual, and therefore they need not be mentioned here. Neither are they so painful, because whatever may be their effect, they never, in my opinion, incapacitate the powers, nor disturb the soul in this manner. For reason remains free to consider that the devils can do no more than our Lord shall permit them, and when this is not lost, all is little in comparison with what I have mentioned above. I shall now proceed to mention other interior afflictions which are endured in these mansions, and I shall speak of different kinds of prayer and favors of our Lord. Some of these, as is evident by the effects they leave in the body, are harder to be endured than the others. But they do not deserve the name of troubles, nor have we any reason to call them so, as they are such great favors of our Lord, and the soul, when in the midst of them, knows they are such and that they are not merited by her. This great affliction comes, together with many others, when the soul is ready to enter the seventh mansion. Some of them I will mention, for to mention all is impossible, nor can they be described as they are in reality, because their origin is more noble than those mentioned before. And as I was unable to explain better than I did those of a meaner kind, much less can I explain these. May our Lord give me assistance in all his favors, through the merits of his Son. Amen. It seems as if we have left our dove long since, and yet we have not, for these are troubles which make her soar the higher. I will now begin to mention in what manner the spouse acts towards her. Before he becomes wholly hers, he makes himself greatly desired by certain ways, so subtle that the soul herself does not discover them, nor can, I think, make them intelligible except to persons who have some experience therein. Some impulses are so delicate and subtle, as they proceed from the very interior of the soul, that I know no comparison suitable for the explanation of them. They are very different from all that we can procure ourselves, and likewise from the delights already mentioned. For very often, without imagining such a thing, or remembering God, His Majesty awakens one by lightning or thunder, as it were and though no noise is heard, yet the soul clearly perceives she was called by God, and this is so evident, that sometimes it makes her tremble all over, especially at first, and makes her utter complaints, though she may feel no pain. She feels herself to be most delightfully wounded, and she neither knows how, nor by whom. She knows well it is a favor which is to be prized, and she wishes never to be healed. She complains in words of love, and these are external, she cannot do otherwise, to her spouse, knowing him to be present, but not willing to manifest himself. This is a great but pleasant affliction, and if she desires not to have it, she cannot, nor does she ever wish it to leave her. For it gives her more delight than the suspension of the prayer of quiet, which has no such affliction attached to it. I am very anxious, sisters, to make you understand this operation of love, but I know not how. For it seems a contradiction that the beloved, though not seen, should let the soul clearly perceive he is in her, and he seems to call her by a sign so certain that it cannot be doubted, and with a whistle so penetrating that she cannot help hearing it. For it seems that when the spouse thus speaks to her, she is in the seventh mansion, and all the people who are in the other mansions, viz., the senses, the imagination, and the faculties, dare not stir. O oh, my powerful God, how great are thy secrets, and how different are spiritual things, from all that is seen or known here on earth! In no way is one able to express this small operation, in comparison with the very great ones which thou dost work in souls. This whistle operates so powerfully in the soul, that she even consumes herself with longing, and yet knows not what to ask, because she is strongly persuaded that her God is with her. You will ask, if she knows so much, what does she desire? What is it that troubles her? What greater good does she desire? I know not, but this I know well, that she suffers, and that this pain pierces even into her very bowels, and that when he who wounds her draws forth the dart, 
he seems therewith to tear them away so powerful are her sentiments of love i was thinking just now that if a small spark should fly out from a pan of live coals for such is my god and fall upon a soul in such a way as to make her feel the fire enkindled and yet not be sufficient to consume her she continues in that pain which is so delightful and when the sparks touch her they cause this operation this seems to be the best comparison i can find for this pleasant pain is not properly a pain nor does it continue in the same degree though sometimes it lasts a long while and at other times it ceases immediately as our lord is pleased to communicate it for it is not to be attained by human means but though it sometimes lasts a long while yet it goes and comes in a word it never stands still and therefore it does not cease to inflame the soul except when as she is ready to be enkindled the spark dies and leaves her with a desire of suffering again that amorous pain which the spark causes there is no reason to think that it comes from nature or is caused by melancholy much less that it is a delusion of the devil or the effect of fancy because it is a matter which shows us clearly that this motion comes from the place where our lord is who is immutable and its operations are not like those of other devotions in which the high transport of the delight may make us doubt here all the senses and powers without any suspension wonder what this is without being able to prevent it or increase or take away in my opinion this delightful pain let the person on whom our lord bestows this favor and if he have already received it he will easily understand it when he reads these words give him many thanks for the person need not fear about its being a delusion but lest he be ungrateful for so great a favor let him also strive his utmost to serve him and in everything amend his life and then he will see what will be the effect and how he will receive still more and more though a certain person on whom this was bestowed spent some years with it being highly pleased with this favor yet even though she should have served our lord for several years in great affliction yet she was abundantly recompensed thereby may he be blessed for ever amen you may ask how can there be greater security in this than in other things in my opinion this is greater for these reasons first because the devil can never produce so pleasant a pain as this he can indeed give a certain delight which seems spiritual but to unite a pain so very great with the quiet and joy of the soul he is unable for all his strength is outward and his trials when he sends them are never in my opinion sweet or peaceful but restless and turbulent secondly because this delightful tempest arises from another quarter far different from that over which he has any power thirdly on account of the great benefits which remain in the soul which are generally resolutions to suffer for god a desire of having many afflictions and being more determined to abandon all delights and earthly conversations and other such like things that all this is no fancy is most evident because though the devil may sometimes endeavor he cannot counterfeit it because it is a matter so well known that in no way can it be feigned i mean it cannot seem to be what it is not nor can it be doubted whether it be such if there should be any such be assured they are not true impulses because these are as clearly perceived as a great sound is by the ears there is no probability of its being melancholy because that forms all its conceits in the imagination but this other proceeds from the interior of the soul it is possible i may be mistaken but till i hear stronger reasons from one who understands the subject i shall adhere to my opinion i know one who is very fearful respecting these delusions so that you need not fear about this kind of prayer our lord also employs other ways of awakening the soul for example when she is praying vocally and not thinking at all on any interior subject a certain delightful ardor seems suddenly to seize her as if so strong a scent should arise immediately as to communicate itself to all the senses i do not say it is a scent but i only make use of this as a comparison but this is only to show that there the spouse is exciting in the soul a delicious desire of enjoying him whereby she is prepared to do heroic acts and to give praise to our lord the origin of this favor is that already mentioned but here there is no pain nor are the desires of enjoying god painful 
and this is what the soul generally feels for there seems to me little grounds to fear for reasons already mentioned but we must only endeavor to receive this favor with thanks end of the sixth mansion chapter two the sixth mansion chapter three of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Rev. John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 3. The same subject is continued. She shows the way by which God speaks to the soul, etc. Our Lord has another way of awakening the soul, which, though in some sense it may seem a greater favor than the one already mentioned, yet may prove more dangerous, and therefore I will enter into a few particulars about it. It is affected by certain discourses, which in various ways he makes to the soul. Some of these seem to come from without, others from the interior of the soul, others from the superior part, while others are so much in the exterior as to be heard with the ears, so that there seems to be a formed voice. Sometimes, and often, it may be only fancy, especially if the persons have a weak imagination, or are subject to great melancholy. No attention is, in my opinion, to be paid to these two kinds of persons, though they tell us that they see, hear, and understand. Nor are they to be troubled by being told it is the devil, but they should be heard as sick persons, and the prioress or confessor to whom they discover this should tell them, not to pay any regard to it, for this is not a matter to serve God by, and the devil has deceived many by this way, but perhaps it will not happen thus to them. We may speak in this way in order not to afflict them, but if the prioress and confessor tell them plainly that it is melancholy, they will never believe it. They will swear they see and hear it because it seems so to them. It is true, necessary care should be taken to prevent them from attending too much to prayer, and they should be persuaded, as much as possible, not to heed such things, because the devil is accustomed to make use of such weak souls as these, if not to their own destruction, at least to the injury of others. Such things are always to be feared until the spirit be understood. I consider it best to resist these discourses at first, because if they come from God they are a great help to advance us onward. They also increase when they are thus tried. This is the case, but the soul should not be troubled too much, for truly she cannot do otherwise. Let us now return to what I was saying about the discourses with the soul. The different kinds which I have mentioned may come either from God, or from the devil, or from one's own imagination. I shall mention, if I can, by the divine assistance, the marks belonging to these different kinds, and also when these discourses become dangerous. For there are many souls among persons of prayer who perceive them, and I do not wish you, sisters, to imagine you do ill either in believing them or not believing them. When they are only for your own pleasure, or to reveal to you your defects, let them come whence they may, or whether they be true or false, it matters little. One thing I warn you against, not to think the better of yourselves on their account, even though they should come from God, for our Lord spoke frequently with the Pharisees. All our good consists in the way we take advantage of these words. Pay no more attention to any discourse which is not exactly conformable to Scripture than if you heard the devil himself, because though they come from your weak imagination, yet you must consider them as temptations about points of faith. Therefore always resist them, that they may leave you, and they will vanish, for of themselves they have little strength. Let us return then to the first point. It matters little for believing that they come from God, whether these words proceed from the interior or superior part, or from the exterior. The most certain signs they can have are, in my opinion, the following. The first and truest are the authority and dominion which such discourses give with them, viz., by speaking and working at the same time. I will explain my meaning a little clearer. A soul, for example, is quite overpowered by affliction, and that internal restlessness mentioned before, together with aridity, and a darkness upon the understanding. 
but by one such word bidding her not to be troubled she is freed from aridity calmed wonderfully enlightened and all that sadness dispelled which she had before hence if the whole world and all the learned men therein had united together in giving her reasons for not being grieved they could not for all their endeavours remove that affliction she is troubled because her confessor and others tell her she is possessed by an evil spirit but by one word only saying it is i be not afraid she is freed from all fears and becomes very cheerful and imagines no one is able to make her believe the contrary she is exceedingly anxious about certain affairs of consequence the success of which she cannot foresee but she hears one tell her be quiet for everything will go on well then she is certain and without care and so with regard to many other things of this kind the second sign is a great quiet remaining in the soul with a devout and peaceful recollection and a disposition to praise god o oh my lord if one word conveyed by one of thy attendants has such force at least in this mansion a word not spoken by our lord himself but by an angel what wilt thou leave in a soul which by love is united to thee and thou to her the third sign is that these words are not forgotten for a long time and some are never forgotten and as to those words which sometimes we hear spoken in this world i mean by men however grave and learned these persons may be yet their words are not so deeply impressed on our memories and much less do we give any credit to them if they relate to things future as these other words do which leave such a great certainty after them that sometimes in things which seem utterly impossible there arises some doubt in the undertaking whether they will prove true or false and it wavers a little accordingly yet there is in the soul herself such a deep security that she cannot be persuaded otherwise though everything seems to go against what she has heard and though some years pass away while she remains in this confidence that god will employ other means unknown to men and that in the end the things will come to pass as indeed they do still as i said she cannot help suffering when she sees so many obstacles against her for the operations which she had at the time she heard the words and the certainty which they left in her that they came from god having now passed away these doubts begin to arise whether the words came from the devil or the imagination but when she hears the words she has no doubts or fears whatever she would even die for this truth but as i said what is the devil able to effect by these imaginations which he certainly suggests in order to afflict and intimidate the soul especially if it be a matter wherein if that which is heard should succeed some great good to souls is likely to follow and that works would be done conducing much to the service of god and that there be some great difficulty connected with them what i repeat is the devil able to do he at least weakens faith for it is a terrible evil not to believe that god is able to perform works which our understandings cannot comprehend but notwithstanding all these combats though there are some who tell the same person that these discourses are extravagancies i mean confessors who are consulted in such cases and notwithstanding the bad success which happens and which makes the confessors imagine the things cannot be accomplished yet i know not how but there remains in the soul so bright a spark of security that the things will happen though all other hopes be dead that this spark of security cannot but remain alive in fine the word of our lord as i said is accomplished and the soul is so joyful and glad that she wishes always to be praising his majesty and this so much the more for seeing that accomplished which was told her and on account of the work itself though it concerns her much i know not how it happens that the soul esteems the accomplishment of these words so highly that i believe she would not feel so much were she herself found to have uttered some untruth as if she could do otherwise where she says nothing but what is told her a certain person very frequently called to mind the prophet jonas when he feared whether nineveh would be destroyed in a word since it is the spirit of god it is proper we should show this fidelity to him by desiring he may not be considered a deceiver since he is truth itself hence the joy of such a soul is excessive when after many windings and in most difficult matters she sees the fulfillments of what she heard and though the same person might have endured great afflictions she would rather suffer them than not see that accomplished 
which she was certainly convinced our lord spoke all persons have not perhaps this infirmity if it be an infirmity for i cannot condemn it as an evil if these words come from the imagination there will be none of these signs nor certainty nor peace nor internal delight it may however happen and i know some to whom it so happened that being deeply absorbed in the prayer of quiet and in a spiritual slumber for some have such a weak constitution or imagination though i know not the cause that in this high recollection they are indeed so out of themselves that exteriorly they seem without sense and all their senses are so asleep that they resemble a person who is asleep and perhaps they are really asleep they imagine as in a dream that some one speaks to them and that they also see things and they think they come from god but in the end they leave effects resembling those left by a dream it may likewise be that when they ask something of our lord with earnestness and love they think they are told what they desire and this sometimes happens but one who has much experience in the discourses of god cannot in my opinion be deceived herein there is much to be feared with regard to the devil and the imagination but if there be the above-mentioned marks the person may rest assured such words come from god though not in the same way as if what were spoken related to some important matter and it was to be performed by the same person or the discourse related to the affairs of a third person then he who would even attempt or think of executing it without the advice of a learned confessor who was also discreet and a servant of god would do very wrong however clearly he might think or understand that it came from god the reason is because his majesty wishes it and this is not neglecting to do what his majesty commands since he has told us to consider our confessor as in his place where there is no doubt of their being his words and these help to animate us if the matter be difficult and our lord when he pleases will also suggest the truth to the confessor and make him believe that it is his spirit but when he does not please they are no longer bound to act differently from what we have been told and to be guided herein by our own opinion i consider to be a very dangerous practice i warn you then sisters in the name of our lord to beware lest this ever happen to you there is another kind of language with which god speaks to a soul i consider it quite certain that it comes from him by a certain intellectual vision of which i shall speak hereafter this takes place in the interior of the soul and she seems most clearly to hear with her ears those words spoken by our lord himself and so secretly that the very manner of hearing them together with the operations caused by the vision itself gives her a certainty that the devil can have no share therein it leaves after it wonderful effects which tend to make us believe the vision to be true at least there is a certainty that it does not proceed from the imagination and whoever observes it may always be certain for the following reasons first because there is a difference in the clearness of the discourse for it is so plain that the soul remembers even every syllable of what she has heard she likewise knows what in particular style the words are spoken though all may but have one meaning whereas that which arises in the fancy or imagination is not spoken so clearly nor so distinctly but is like something uttered by a person half asleep secondly because what is heard was often not thought of before i mean it comes unexpectedly and sometimes when the person is engaged in conversation an answer is given to that which suddenly passes through our thoughts or to that which passed through them before and often it is in things of which we never had any remembrance that they had been or would be and hence the imagination could not have framed them in order that the soul might be deceived in fancying to herself what she had not desired nor wished nor taken notice of thirdly because then we are like one who hears only but when it arises from the imagination it is as if one is composing by little and little what he himself wishes to be said to him fourthly because the words are very different and one of them includes a great deal which our understanding cannot compose so easily fifthly because together with the words much more is often understood by a way which i am unable to explain than the words import but of this mode of understanding i shall speak more at length elsewhere for it is a very high subject and contributes much to the praise of our lord
Respecting these several ways, and the difference between them, there have been, and now are, some persons very doubtful. I particularly know one who has tried them by experience. Still, there may be others who could not fully understand them. But the person that I speak of has, I know, considered them with great attention. Our Lord very often bestows this favor upon her. The greatest doubt which she had was, whether she was deceived by her own fancy or no in the beginning. For when it is, the devil may soon be discovered, though he has so many subtleties that he can easily put on the appearance of a spirit of light. And in my opinion, this he will do by speaking so very clearly, that there is no question whether the words are heard, just as in the case when they come from the spirit of truth. But he cannot counterfeit the effects mentioned above, nor leave in the soul such peace and light. He will rather leave restlessness and confusion, though he can do little or no harm if the soul be humble, and do what I have mentioned, though she must not stir to do anything of herself, whatever she may hear. If the favors and caresses come from our Lord, let her carefully observe whether she consider herself to be better for them, and if, from hearing more loving expressions, she do not become more humble and confounded, then let her be assured that it is not the Spirit of God. It is most certain that, if it be the good Spirit, how much greater the favor is, so much the less does the soul esteem herself. And she remembers her sins the more, and forgets more her own interest, and employs more frequently her will and memory in seeking only God's honor and glory, without attending to her own profit. She proceeds, too, with more caution, lest in anything she might neglect doing God's will. She likewise understands more certainly that she never merited these favors, but rather she deserved hell. Since then all these things, and the favors she receives in prayer, produce these effects. Let not the soul be troubled, but trust in the mercy of our Lord, who is faithful, and will not suffer the devil to delude her, though it is always best for her to live in fear. Possibly someone whom our Lord does not conduct by this way will imagine that such souls may refuse to listen to these words, and if they be interior, may so occupy themselves as to not admit them, and by this means may be free from such dangers. I answer, it is impossible. I do not speak of those words which the fancy forms, which by not too eagerly desiring some things, and by not doing anything suggested by the imagination, find some remedy. But here these words have no remedy, for the same Spirit of God which speaks, fixes all other thoughts, which attend in such a way to what is spoken that it seems to me to be something more likely, and so I believe it is, for a person who is very quick at hearing, not to hear another who spoke both near and loudly to him. For this person might not notice the other who speaks, or his thoughts and understanding might be engaged in some other way. But this cannot be the case here, for there are no ears to stop, nor power to think, except on what is spoken to her. For he who could stop the sun at the request of Joshua, can also stop the powers and the whole interior. Hence the soul plainly perceives that another Lord governs this castle, who is greater than she is, and this thought produces great devotion and humility in her. Thus she has no remedy for avoiding this. May His Divine Majesty grant we may ever strive to please Him, and, as I said, entirely forget ourselves. Amen. May our Lord grant that I may have correctly explained what I intended, and that it may serve as some direction for those who receive such favors. End of The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 3《The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 4 of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 4. The saint explains when God suspends the soul by trance, ecstasy, or rapture, and shows that great courage is necessary for receiving such a favor. What rest can the poor butterfly take with the labors and other afflictions already mentioned? All serve to inflame her desires of enjoying her spouse, and as His Majesty knows our weakness, He continues to prepare her, by these and many other things, to take courage and choose Him for her spouse. 
You will perhaps laugh at my saying this, and consider it foolishness, because every one of you will think there is no need of courage, and that no woman is so base that would be willing to be espoused to a king. I believe so too, as regards an earthly king, but I tell you, to be espoused to the king of heaven requires more courage than you imagine, for our nature is too mean and timorous for so sublime a thing. I consider it certain also, that this would be impossible if God did not bestow the dowry. Here you will see what his majesty does, in order to conclude these espousals, which I believe are ratified when he takes away the senses by raptures. For if in the enjoyment of them our nature should see itself so near this great majesty, it would perhaps be impossible to continue to live. I speak of true raptures, and not of certain infirmities of women which we often see, for everything to us seems to be rapts or ecstasies, and I think I have mentioned before, some constitutions are so weak that they seem to be dying if they have only of one prayer of quiet. I will describe some kinds of raptures, which I have learnt about from those who have had a great deal to do with some spiritual persons, though I do not know whether I shall be able to explain them, as elsewhere I have done, when writing on this subject. I wish also to mention some other things which happen here, which for some reasons it seems proper to repeat again, if for nothing else but that the mansions might go on together in order. One kind of rapture is, when the soul, though not in prayer, being moved by a word which she remembers or hears from God, His Majesty seems to increase the spark before mentioned from the interior of the soul, being moved with compassion to see her so long afflicted with the desire of Him, for being quite inflamed, she becomes, like the phoenix, entirely renewed, and as one may piously believe, her faults are then forgiven, supposing, however, she has the disposition, and makes use of the means which the church prescribes. Being thus pure, he unites her to himself, without anyone knowing it, except only themselves. Even the soul herself does not know it in such a way as to be able afterwards to relate it though she then has her interior senses. For she is not like one in a swoon or fit, where nothing is seen interiorly or exteriorly. What I understand is the case is, that the soul was never so alive to the things of God, nor had so clear a light and knowledge of His Majesty as she had then. This may seem impossible, because if the faculties be so absorbed that we may say they are dead, and likewise the senses, how can it be known that the soul understands? This mystery I cannot comprehend, and perhaps no other creature but only the Creator Himself. Many other things also I cannot understand which happen in this state, I mean in these last two mansions, which may well be united together, for there is an entrance open to both. But because in this last mansion some things are not manifested to those who have not entered into it, I thought it best to divide them. When the soul is in this suspension, and our Lord considers it good to reveal certain secrets to her, such as those which relate to heaven, and visions seen by the imagination, these she can afterwards relate, because they are so imprinted on her memory that she can never forget them. But when they are intellectual visions, she is not able to relate many of them, because then some of them are so sublime that it is fit for those who live on earth to know them, though when such souls return to their senses they can relate many of them. Some of you do not, perhaps, understand what a vision is, especially intellectual ones. This I will explain at the proper time, since he has commanded me to do so who has the power, and though it may seem a foolish undertaking, still it may perhaps be useful to some souls. But you will ask me, if afterwards there is no remembrance of these high favors which our Lord here bestows on the soul, what use are they to her? O oh, daughters, so exceedingly useful are they, that their utility cannot be expressed, for she may not be able to mention them, yet they are deeply imprinted in the interior of the soul, and can never be forgotten. But if they have no representation, nor are understood by the faculties, how can they be remembered? This I do not understand, but I know well that there remain fixed in the soul certain truths of the greatness of God, that even without faith, which tells her who He is, and that she is bound to believe Him to be God, she would adore Him as such from that instant, just as Jacob did when he saw the ladder on which angels were ascending and descending. 
then no doubt he told other secrets which he was unable to relate and had he not had a more internal light he would not have discovered such high mysteries i know not whether i am explaining exactly what i am saying because though i have heard it i am not sure that i remember it properly neither was moses able to relate all that he saw in the bush but only what god wished him to mention but had not god discovered to his soul other secrets in a most certain manner in order that he might see and believe it was god he would never have been able to endure so many and such great labors moses must have learnt amongst the thorns of that bush such great things as encouraged him to do what he did for the people of israel and so we sisters in the hidden things of god must not seek out reasons in order that we may understand them but as we believe he is powerful so it is evident we ought to believe that a worm having such limited power as we have is unable to comprehend his greatness let us praise him exceedingly that he is pleased to let us know some of them i have been wishing to hit upon some comparison by which i might explain something of this subject on which i am now speaking and i believe there is none which exactly suits however i will mention the following suppose you enter a room or closet as i think it is called of a king or some great lord where is a great variety of certain kinds of crystal glasses porcelain and many other vessels placed in such order that on entering they are almost all seen i was once conducted into such a room in the house of the duchess of alva where being on my journey for founding a convent obedience required me to remain two days at the earnest request of this lady when i entered the room i was amazed thinking what could be the use of such a variety of things and i perceived our lord might be praised on our beholding so many different things this comparison comes in very seasonably since it will serve my purpose here now though i remained there only for a short time such abundance was to be seen that i immediately forgot everything and i no more remembered all the vases than if i had never seen them nor could i tell what shape they were but only in general i remembered having seen them and so it is here since the soul has been united with god and admitted into this chamber of the empyreal heaven which we ought to have in the interior of our souls for it is evident that since god resides in them he possesses some of these mansions and though when the soul is thus in an ecstasy our lord is not always pleased she should see these secrets for being so absorbed in the enjoyment of him she is content with so great a good yet sometimes he is pleased that this suspension should leave her and then immediately she sees what is in that room thus when she returns to herself afterwards she retains the representation of the greatnesses which she beheld but she can mention none of them nor does her natural ability attain to more than he was pleased to allow her supernaturally to see i already acknowledge that it appears something was seen and that it is a vision seen by the imagination i do not wish to say it is such nor to speak of it here but only of the intellectual vision being unlearned my ignorance is not able to explain anything properly hence if what i have hitherto said be correct i know clearly it is not i who spoke it for my part i consider that if sometimes when the soul is in these raptures she does not understand these secrets which god communicates to her they are no raptures but some natural weakness for it may happen to persons of a weak constitution as we women are that by using force the spirit may overpower nature and make these persons remain thus absorbed as i think i have shown when speaking on the prayer of quiet these have not the character of raptures for in true raptures i believe that god wholly ravishes the soul with himself and he continues discovering to her as if to his own spouse some small part of the kingdom which she has gained since whatever is in this great god is immense it is everything he does not wish to have any disturbance from anything either from the faculties or from the senses but he immediately commands all the gates of these mansions to be shut that gate only where he resides is left open for us to enter at blessed be such great mercy and justly will they be accursed who will not make use of it but lose so great a lord o oh, my sisters what we abandon for him is nothing and what we do is nothing or what we can do for such a god who is thus willing to communicate himself to a worm 
and if we hope to enjoy even in this life so great a good, what are we doing? Why do we delay? What recompense can be made us for being hindered only one moment in our search after this Lord, as the spouse did through the streets and roads? Oh, what a mockery is everything in the world, if it do not advance us, and help us to reach this Lord, even though all its delights, riches, and pleasures were to last for ever, and were as great as can be imagined. All is filth and nastiness, when compared with these treasures which are to be enjoyed without end, and even these are nothing to be compared with possessing the Lord of all these treasures, the Lord of heaven and earth. Oh, the blindness of men! When, when will this clay be taken from our eyes? Though amongst us who are religious, it does not seem so great as to blind us, yet I see some small motes, some little specks, which, if we allow them to grow, are able to do us great mischief. But for the love of God, sisters, let us turn these defects to our advantage, in order to discover our misery, and let them clear our sight the more, as the clay cured the blind man, whom our spouse healed. Seeing ourselves, then, to be so imperfect, let us be more fervent in beseeching him to draw good out of our miseries, that so we may please his majesty in everything. I have wandered much from my subject, but pardon me, sisters, and be assured that having arrived at these wonders of God's greatness, I mean, having spoken about them, I cannot help feeling great grief when I see what we lose by our own fault. For though it be true they are favors which God bestows on whom he pleases, yet did we love his majesty as he loves us, he would give them to every one. He desires nothing else but to see some one on whom to bestow them, since thereby his riches are not lessened. But to return to what I was saying, the spouse now commands the doors of the mansions and those of the castle and the places around it also to be shut for as he wishes to ravish this soul he takes away her breath in such a manner though the other senses sometimes continue a little longer yet the speech is quite taken away at other times she is deprived of all the senses at once the hands and body grow so cold that there seems to be no life and sometimes no breath is perceived this lasts for a short time i mean in this state for when this wonderful suspension leaves her for a time the body seems in some degree to return to itself and take breath that it may afterwards die again and so give greater life to the soul still this ecstasy does not continue long but though it is taken away the will remains absorbed and the understanding is so alienated and this lasts for a day or several days that it seems incapable of attending to anything except to what tends to excite the will to love to this it is quite alive but asleep as to placing its affections on any creature when the soul returns to herself again what is her confusion and what most earnest desires has she not of giving herself wholly to god in whatever ways he may wish to employ her if the former prayers produce such effects as those mentioned before what will such a sublime favor as this produce she wishes she had a thousand lives in order to give them all to god and that all things on earth were tongues in order that they might praise him in her stead her desires of doing penance are very great nor does she suffer much in performing it for the power of love makes her scarcely feel whatever she does and she sees clearly the martyrs did not do much in suffering their torments because with this assistance from our lord suffering becomes easy and hence such souls complain to his majesty when an opportunity of suffering is not given to them when this favor is bestowed upon them in private they value it very highly because when it happens to them before other people the shame and confusion it leaves is so great that it deprives the soul in some manner of the suspension she enjoys by the trouble and anxiety she feels from thinking what those will say who saw it she knows the malice of the world and that men will not perhaps view it as it ought to be for that which they should consider as an opportunity for praising our lord they will probably make use of for throwing out censures and rash judgments this trouble seems to me to be in some manner a want of humility though she cannot help it because if such a person desire to be despised what does she care for their censures one who was in this affliction heard these words from our lord be not troubled for they either will praise me or find fault with thee in either of these two ways thou wilt be a gainer 
I knew afterwards that this person was exceedingly animated by these words, which I here relate to you in order to help any who may be in the like affliction. It seems our Lord wishes all to understand that this soul is already His, and that no one must touch it. Men may meddle with the body, with honor, and estates, for from all of them His Majesty will derive glory, but they must not touch the soul. And if she do not, by a very culpable boldness, leave her spouse, he will protect her against all the world, and all the powers of hell. I know not whether I have been able to make you understand something of what a rapture is, for to explain it fully is, as I said, impossible. And I think nothing has been lost by what I have said, thereby endeavoring to understand what it really is. In counterfeit raptures, the effects are very different. I say counterfeit, not that the person who has them intends to deceive, but she is deceived. And as the marks and effects do not correspond with so great a favor, such a person falls into such disgrace that justly is another not believed afterwards on whom our Lord really bestows the favor. May he be praised and blessed for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. End of the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 4THE SIXTH MANSION CHAPTER FIVE OF THE INTERIOR CASTLE This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay THE INTERIOR CASTLE OR THE MANSIONS BY ST. TERESA OF AVILA TRANSLATED BY THE REVEREND JOHN DALTON THE SIXTH MANSION CHAPTER FIVE THE SAME DISCOURSE IS CONTINUED there is another kind of rapture which I call the flight of the spirit, though it is the same in substance as the ordinary rapture, yet it is felt to be very different in the interior. For sometimes there is perceived on a sudden a movement of the soul so swift that the spirit seems to be hurried away with a violent speed. This at first causes great fear, and therefore I told you that the person on whom God intends to bestow these favors stands in need of great courage, and likewise of faith and confidence, and perfect resignation into the hands of our Lord, to do with the soul whatever he pleaseth. Do you think it is a small trouble for one to enjoy his senses perfectly, and see his soul carried away? We read that some have even their bodies raised also, without knowing whither it goes, or who carries it, or how it is carried? In the commencement of this sudden movement, there is not so much certainty that it comes from God, but is there any means of resisting it? None whatever. Rather, it is all the worse for the soul, for I know this is the case with a certain person. Hence, it seems God wishes to signify to the soul that, as she has so often and so truly resigned herself into his hands, and with so sincere a will wholly offered herself to him, she must understand that now she has no more right to herself, and hence she is evidently raised up with a more impetuous motion. The person of whom I spoke resolved to act no more than the straw does when it is attracted by amber, if you ever noticed it, and to surrender herself into his hands, who is so powerful, for she sees it is the safest plan for her to make a virtue of necessity. And because I mentioned straw, it is certain that, as easily as a strong man can lift it up, so can our strong and mighty giant lift up the soul. Thus it seems that whereas before the cistern of water we spoke of, I suppose in the fourth mansion, for I do not remember well, was filled with great sweetness and stillness, I mean without noise. So now this great God, who keeps in the springs of water, and allows not the sea to overflow its bounds, here lets loose the streams and currents from which the water came, and this running with great violence makes such a flood that it raises on high this little vessel of our soul. On this account, as neither a ship nor a pilot, nor those who command it, are able to make the raging and furious billows let it rest where the captain wishes, so much less can the interior of the soul remain where it would desire. Nor can it cause the senses and faculties to do more than what they are commanded, for here no notice is to be taken of the exterior. I am certainly astonished, sisters, by merely writing these remarks, concerning how the immense power of this great king and emperor is here manifested to us, what will he feel, then, who experiences this same power? For my own part, 
I believe that if His Majesty discovered Himself to the most abandoned men of the world, in the same manner as He does to these souls, they would avoid offending Him, if not through love, at least through fear. Oh, how much are those obliged who have been instructed by so sublime a way, to endeavor with all their strength never to displease this Lord! By Him I beseech you, sisters, I speak to those on whom our Lord has bestowed such favors, that you be not negligent and content with only receiving. Consider that whoever owes much should also pay much. For this, great courage is necessary, for it terrifies one exceedingly. And if our Lord did not bestow this on the soul, she would always be in great affliction. And if He did not animate her, she would, no doubt, be disheartened. Considering how His Majesty acts with her, and reflecting also upon herself, that serves Him so little, in comparison to what she is obliged to do. And this very little which she does is full of failings, imperfections, and tepidity. In order, therefore, that she may not remember how imperfectly she performs any work, if she does any, she thinks it best to endeavor to forget it, and to place her sins continually before her eyes, relying on God's mercy, and beseeching Him that, since she has nothing to pay Him with, the pity and mercy which he has always shown towards sinners may supply her defect. He may, perhaps, give her the answer which he gave to a certain person who was in great distress before a crucifix, from considering that she never had anything to give to God, or to abandon for his sake, to whom the crucified said, comforting her by these words, that he gave her all the labors and pains which he suffered in his passion, and that she was to consider them as her own, and offer them to his father. The soul immediately became so rich and so consoled, as I heard from the person herself, that she cannot yet forget it. But every time that she sees herself so miserable, the remembrance of these words animates and consoles her. Many such things I could mention here, which I know well, by having spoken with so many persons of devotion and prayer. But lest you might think I was alluding to myself, I will not speak of them. This seems to me very useful for showing you how much our Lord is pleased with our knowing ourselves, and with our continually endeavoring to consider again and again our poverty and misery, and how we have nothing except what we have received. Hence, my sisters, courage is necessary for this and for many other things which happen to a soul which our Lord has already conducted to this state, and, in my opinion, if there be humility, more courage is necessary for this latter favor than for any other. I mean, for considering our poverty and misery. May our Lord, in His mercy, grant it to us. Let us return now to this sudden rapture of the Spirit. The rapture takes place in such a manner that the soul really seems to go out of the body, and yet, on the other hand, it is evident that the person is not dead. At least, she cannot say whether for a few moments the soul be in the body or not. It seems to her that she has been altogether in another region quite different from this world in which we live, and there another light is shown to her very different from this here below. And though she should employ all her life long in trying to form an idea of this and other wonders, yet it would be impossible to understand them. She is in an instant taught so many things together, that should she spend many years in arranging them in her thoughts and imagination, she could not remember the one thousandth part of them. This is not an intellectual but an imaginary vision, and it is seen with the eyes of the soul much better than we see things here with the eyes of the body, and without words certain things are discovered to her. If she should see any of the saints, she knows them as well as if she had conversed with them for a length of time. At other times, together with what she beholds with the eyes of the soul, other wonders are there represented to her by the intellectual vision, particularly a multitude of angels with their Lord, and without seeing anything with her corporeal eyes, by a wonderful knowledge which I cannot express. This of which I am speaking and many other things are represented to her which are not to be mentioned. Whoever shall experience these things himself, and shall have better abilities than I possess, may perhaps be able to explain them, however difficult they may appear to be. Whether all these things take place in the body or no, I cannot say. At least, I would not swear it is in the body, nor that the body is without the soul. I have often thought how, when the sun is in the heavens, his rays have such force that without the sun changing his place they immediately reach this earth, 
and so it is here for the soul and the spirit which are one and the same just as the sun and the rays are though remaining in her place that is in the body may by virtue of the heat communicated to her from the true sun of justice soar above herself in the superior part in a word i know not what i say the truth is that with the same swiftness with which a bullet passes out of a gun when the fire is applied so does a flight take place in the interior of the soul i know no other name for it which though it makes no noise still causes a movement so manifest that in no manner can it be taken as the effect of fancy and as the soul is as it were out of herself as far as i can understand great secrets are revealed to her and when she returns again to her senses it is with such immense gain and with such contempt for all earthly things that everything seems mean to her in comparison with what she has seen ever after she lives in the world with great regret and she cares not at all for any of those things which once used to seem beautiful to her it seems our lord was pleased to show her something of that land towards which she is going as those of the people of israel who were sent beforehand to the land of promise brought back things which show the nature of the country in order that she may endure the difficulties of this journey and may know where she must hasten to find true repose and though that which passes away so quickly may seem to you not to be very profitable yet so great are the benefits it leaves in the soul that he only who has experienced them can tell their worth hence we may clearly see that such things do not come from the devil and that they should come from our own imagination is impossible since the devil can represent nothing which leaves in the soul such great effects such peace such quiet and profit and especially three things are left in a high degree the first is a knowledge of the greatness of god for the more we see of it the more we are able to understand it the second is the knowledge of ourselves and humility in considering how base we are in comparison with the creator of so many wonderful things and how we have dared to offend him how we dare not to look upon him the third is a contempt for all earthly things unless there be some which she can apply to the service of so great a god these are the jewels which the spouse begins to give his bride and they are so valuable that she will be most careful of them for these visions are so ingrained in her memory that i believe it is impossible for her to forget them till she gets possession of them for ever unless it be through her own fault but the spouse who gives them to her is able to bestow his grace upon her so that she may never lose them but to return to the courage of which she stands in need do you think it is so trifling a matter the soul really seems separated from the body because she sees the senses lost and does not understand for what purpose it is necessary then that he who gives all the other gifts should give this also you will reply this fear is well rewarded i say the same may he be blessed for ever who can give so liberally and may his majesty be pleased to grant that we may be worthy to serve him amen end of the sixth mansion chapter five The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 6 of The Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 6 she mentions some of the effects of the prayer of which she spoke in the preceding chapters etc from these sublime favors the soul so ardently desires wholly to enjoy him who bestows them on her that she lives in a great though delightful torment and she has also a certain longing to die and hence with continual tears does she beg of god that he would take her out of this exile everything that she sees in it wearies her in solitude she finds some ease and then this sorrow comes upon her immediately but without it she is not content in a word this poor butterfly meets with no repose that lasts for any time still as the soul is so full of tender love any opportunity which presents itself to her of enkindling this fire more and more makes her take wing 
hence in this mansion raptures are very common without her having any means to avoid them even when they take place in public persecutions and slanders immediately follow for though she desires to be without fears they will not leave her because there are many who cause them especially confessors and though on the one hand she seems to have great security in the interior of the soul especially when she is all alone with god yet on the other hand she is in great affliction because she fears lest the devil might deceive her so as to make her offend him whom she loves so tenderly she is little troubled about what people say against her except when her own confessor afflicts her as if she could do more she does nothing but entreat every one to pray for her and beseech his majesty to guide her by some other way she is told to do so because this is so extremely dangerous but as she has found such great benefit by the other way she cannot help thinking that she is walking according to what she sees and hears and knows in the commandments of god and this is the path which conducts her to heaven hence she cannot but help desiring this way though she might wish not to do so still she resigns herself into the hands of god then again her inability to desire what she is told troubles her likewise because she thinks it is an act of disobedience to her confessor and it seems to her that in obeying him and endeavoring not to offend our lord the remedy lies for not being deceived hence she would not willingly commit a venial sin even though she were to be cut in pieces and she is exceedingly afflicted to see how she cannot be free from committing many willfully god gives these souls so great a desire of not offending him in the least thing and if possible of not committing even the slightest imperfection that for this reason alone were there no other she would fly from all men she envies those who live and those who formerly lived in deserts on the other hand she would have no objection to be placed in the midst of the world in order to try if she could be instrumental in making only one soul praise god more earnestly if a woman she grieves that her sex puts a restraint upon her which prevents her from doing it and she envies those exceedingly who have the power of crying out with a loud voice and of proclaiming who this great god of hosts is o oh, poor butterfly thou art bound by many chains which will not allow thee to fly as far as thou desirest have pity on her my god dispose everything now in such a manner that so she may in some degree fulfil her desires for thy honour and glory regard not her small merits nor her natural baseness thou art able o lord to cause the mighty sea to retire and great jordan to divide that the children of israel may pass over but do not pity her for aided by thy power she will be able to bear many crosses she is determined to do so she desires to bear them extend o lord thy mighty arm let not her life be spent on things so base let thy greatness appear in so low and feminine a creature that men seeing she can do nothing of herself may praise thee cost what it may this is what she desires and she would give a thousand lives if she had so many that so by her means one soul might praise thee a little more and she would consider them all as very well bestowed knowing perfectly well that she does not deserve to suffer the least cross for thee and how much less death i know not sisters why i have spoken thus i do not understand myself you must know that these are the effects which remain after such suspensions and they admit no doubt whatever for they are not desires which pass away but they are fixed and constant and when any opportunity offers itself of discovering them she sees that they are not feigned but why do i say they are fixed sometimes even in mean and trifling things the soul feels she is cowardly and so timorous that it seems impossible for her to have courage for anything whatever i believe that our lord then leaves her in her natural state for her own greater good for at that time she understands that if ever she had courage for anything his majesty gave it to her and this truth she sees with such great clearness as leaves her annihilated and more experienced in the mercy and greatness of our lord who is pleased to manifest them in so vile a creature but most generally she is in the state i spoke of before 
one thing observe sisters in these ardent desires of seeing god viz that sometimes being so oppressive they must not be increased but if possible directed in some other way i say if possible because in some cases of which i shall speak hereafter this would be quite impossible as you will see in these first it may sometimes be done because the reason is so entire as to conform itself to the will of god and say what saint martin did if the desires press us much the thought may be turned to something else because as they are the desires of persons who are very far advanced the devil may well excite them to make us believe we are of that number hence it is always good to walk in fear for my part i consider that the devil cannot counterfeit the quiet and peace which this pain produces in the soul rather will some passion be excited like that by which we are disturbed in worldly matters but he who has no experience either in one or the other will never understand this matter for thinking it something very great he will increase the desires all he can and thus injure his health very seriously for this pain is continual at least very frequent observe likewise that a weak constitution usually causes some of these troubles especially if the person be of a tender nature and grieve about every trifle which makes them a thousand times inclined to think that they are weeping for god though it be not the case it may also happen that a person from hearing the least word or from thinking upon god may shed abundance of tears and not be able to resist them because there is some humor at the heart which tends more to produce this effect than the love which she has for god and it seems she cannot stop weeping such persons having heard that tears are good do not suppress them they wish for nothing else and therefore they increase them all they can the object of the denial herein is that they may weaken themselves in such a way that afterwards they may be unable either to make use of prayer or observe their rule methinks that you are wondering as if you wish to ask me what then are you to do if i consider there is danger in everything since though tears are good there may be a delusion in them perhaps i am myself deluded in this respect but believe me i speak not without reason for i have seen this delusion happen to some persons though not to me for i am not at all tender rather i have a heart so hard that it sometimes gives me pain yet when the fire within is great however hard the heart may be it drops like an alembic we may easily discover if the tears proceed hence for they are more strengthening and pacific than turbulent and very seldom they do us any harm the good which comes from this delusion when it is such is this that it injures the body not the soul if there be humility if there be not humility it will be no harm to entertain this suspicion let us not suppose that all consists in weeping much but rather in working and practicing virtues for these are what we ought to value most let tears come when god sends them without our endeavoring to cause them the tears which god sends will leave this dry ground watered and are a greater help for procuring fruit though we may esteem them but little because this is the water which descends from heaven but what we draw up by the strength of our arm is not to be compared to this since we may often dig and weary ourselves and not meet with a small pool of water and how much less then with a fine spring i consider it best then sisters that we should place ourselves in the presence of our lord and consider his mercy and greatness together with our own baseness and let him afterwards give us what he pleases either water or aridity he knows much better than we do what is proper for us by this means we shall enjoy rest and quiet and the devil will have no opportunity of playing tricks upon us among these sweet yet painful favors our lord also gives sometimes certain transports and a strange kind of prayer which she does not understand but i mention it here in order that you may praise him exceedingly should he be pleased to grant you this favor and that you may know it is something which really happens it is in my opinion a close union of the powers though our lord here leaves them with our liberty in order that they may possess this joy and the same also happens to the senses without their knowing what they enjoy nor how they enjoy it this may seem something very odd and strange but the thing certainly happens 
it is a joy of the soul so excessive that she does not wish to possess it alone herself but to tell it to all men that so they may help her to praise our lord for this is the object and end of all her movements oh what festivals would she keep and what signs would she show if she could that all might know her joy she seems to have found herself and therefore with the father of the prodigal son she wishes to invite every one to behold her in her present state for then she has no doubt of her being in security i am persuaded she has reasons for this security for it is impossible the devil should cause such great joy in the very interior of the soul together with such a peace hence her whole delight is to excite all others to praise god it is very painful to her that being possessed with such a transported joy she can be silent and can dissemble this it was no doubt which saint francis felt when some robbers met him as he was crying out in the fields and he told them that he was the herald of the great king other saints also went into the desert that like saint francis they might proclaim the praises of their god i knew one who did this viz saint peter of alcantara whom i consider to be a saint on account of his life yet those who heard him sometimes thought he was a fool oh happy foolishness sisters should god give it to us all what a favor he has bestowed upon you to confine you to a place where though he should bestow this upon you and give you proofs of it it would rather help you than be an occasion of your meeting with reproach as it would certainly do if we lived in the world where men are so little accustomed to hear the praises of god published that no wonder they notice such a thing o oh, wretched times and miserable life we now live in happy those souls whose lot has been so fortunate as to be free from these dangers it is sometimes a particular pleasure to me when as these sisters stand before me i see they have such inward joy that they give to the very best of their power the greatest praises to our lord for their living in a monastery and it is very evident that these proceed from the interior of the soul this sisters i wish you often to do for one who begins excites the rest upon what can your tongues be better employed when you are together than the praises of god since we are so much obliged thereto may his majesty vouchsafe often to grant us this kind of prayer since it is so secure and profitable we cannot acquire it by our own strength because it is so exceedingly supernatural and sometimes it continues a whole day at which time the soul is like one who has drunk too much yet not so much as to lose her senses or to be like one who is melancholy that has not quite lost his reason but who does not forget what has been impressed on his imagination nor can any one make him forget these are very rude comparisons wherewith to illustrate so precious a subject but my understanding cannot discover any better the case then is this this joy makes the soul so unmindful of herself and all things else that she pays no regard to anything else nor can she speak of anything else except what proceeds from this her joy viz the praises of god let us help this soul my daughters why do we desire to have more understanding what can give us greater pleasure may all creatures assist us herein for ever and ever amen 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 end of the sixth mansion chapter six the sixth mansion chapter seven of the interior castle this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 8. She speaks of a kind of grief which souls feel for their sins on whom god bestows the favors mentioned in the preceding chapters etc you may think perhaps sisters that those souls to whom our lord so especially communicates himself will on that account be so secure in their enjoying him for ever as never to fear or bewail their former sins and those particularly may think so who have not obtained these favors 
for if they have ever had them, and they came from God, they will understand what I say. But this is a great mistake, since the sorrow for sin increases still more, as more is received from God. For my part I believe that, till we arrive where nothing can disturb us, this sorrow will never leave us. True, it afflicts us more at one time than another, and likewise in a different manner. Such a soul does not remember the punishment she deserves for them, but how very ungrateful she has been to one to whom she owes so much, and who so greatly deserves to be served, since by these sublime favors which he communicates to her, she discovers so much the better the greatness of God. She is astonished at her boldness, she laments her disrespect, and her conduct seems so foolish, that she never ceases to lament it, when she remembers how for such base things she deserted so great a majesty. She reflects much more on this than on the favors she receives, which being so great, as I have already mentioned, and shall have to mention respecting others which are to come, seem to be carried away by a swift stream, and removed at their time. The stream of her sins always appears like mud, and remains in her memory, and a very heavy cross it is. I know a person who, independent of her desire to die that she might see God, wished for death in order that she might not so frequently feel the torment she suffered, for considering her base ingratitude to him, to whom she was, and ever would be, so indebted. Hence she thought no one's faults could equal hers, because she knew there was none whom God had so patiently endured, and upon whom he had conferred so many favors. As to hell, they have no fear of it, but the fear of losing God sometimes troubles them exceedingly. This, however, is very seldom. All their fear is, lest God should forsake them, and take his hand away from them, and thus allow them to offend him. They are also afraid lest they fall into a state as miserable as they were ever in, for they take little care either about their own pain or glory, and if they desire not to remain long in purgatory, it is rather because they wish not to be absent from God during the time they remain there, than for the torments they are to endure. I do not consider it safe for a soul, however much she may be favored by God, to forget how she was sometimes in a miserable state, because though this be a painful thought, yet in many respects it is of great advantage. Because I have been so wicked, this perhaps is the reason why it appears so to me, and why I have the remembrance always in my mind. Those who have been good will have nothing to lament over, though there are always imperfections while we live in this mortal body. The pain is not relieved at all by considering that our Lord has already pardoned our sins, and forgotten them. It is even increased, by beholding such goodness and mercy bestowed upon one who deserves nothing but hell. I think that this must have been the great martyrdom which St. Peter and St. Mary Magdalene endured, for as they possessed so intense a love, and had received so many favors, and knew the greatness and majesty of God, so the remembrance of their sins must indeed have been a very great affliction to them, and they must have felt it very tenderly. You may likewise imagine, that one who enjoys such high favors need not meditate on the mysteries of the most sacred humanity of Christ our Lord, because she is already wholly employed and exercised in love. On this point I have written elsewhere at length, and though I have met with opposition, and have been told that I did not understand the subject, because there are many ways by which our Lord conducts souls, and that after the beginnings have been passed, it is best to exercise oneself in matters relating to the divinity, and to avoid corporeal subjects. Yet they cannot make me acknowledge that this is a safe way. It may be I am mistaken, or that we all mean the same thing. But I saw that the devil thereby wished to deceive me, and I have suffered so much from his deceits, that I think it best here to repeat the same again to you, though I have often said it before. Great caution and care are necessary. See, that for what I venture to tell you, you do not believe those who speak differently. I will endeavor to explain my meaning better than I have elsewhere, because if perhaps any one should have written on the subject, as I have been told, and should have entered at some length into it, he may have spoken well. But to speak on the matter in general terms to us, who do not understand much, may do great harm. 
some souls may think that they cannot meditate on the passion and much less on the blessed virgin or on the lives of the saints from the remembrance of whom we derive such great benefit and comfort i cannot understand what they meditate upon if thus they abstract themselves from everything corporeal for to be always on fire with love belongs to angelic spirits not to us who live in the mortal body and who must of necessity discourse think of and associate with those who having the same bodies etc did such heroic actions for god how much less should we intentionally separate ourselves from our only good and our only remedy viz the most sacred humanity of our lord jesus christ i cannot believe they do so but rather i think they do not understand themselves and so they will injure both themselves and others at least i can assure them they will not enter these last two mansions for if they lose the guide viz our good jesus they will not find the right way there it is sufficient if they have already arrived safely at the other mansions our lord himself says i am the way and the light and that none can come to the father except by him and that whoever seeth him seeth his father it will be said these words have another meaning i do not understand this meaning except that which my soul always feels to be the truth and with this i have hitherto gone on very well there are some souls and many of them have spoken with me on the subject whom our lord having raised to perfect contemplation they desire always to remain there but this cannot be by the goodness of our lord however they are affected in such a manner that they cannot afterwards meditate on the mysteries of the passion and life of christ as they used once to do i know not the reason of this but it happens very commonly that the understanding is then quite indisposed for meditation i believe the reason is this that as in meditation god is entirely sought after so when he is once found and the soul is accustomed to seek him again by the operation of the will she is unwilling to trouble herself by making use of the understanding it also seems to me that the will being already enkindled this noble faculty does not wish to make use of the other if it could and it acts not amiss but this will be impossible especially till she has arrived at the last two mansions it is also a loss of time because in order that the will may be able to inflame the soul it often stands in need of being helped by the understanding observe this point sisters for it is very important and therefore i will explain it a little more the soul still desires to be wholly employed in love and would wish to attend to nothing else but she cannot though she would because though the will be not dead yet the fire which used to inflame her is so extinct that it is necessary for someone to blow it in order that it may diffuse its heat would it be proper that the soul being in this aridity should stand expecting fire from heaven to consume the sacrifice which she makes of herself to god as our holy father elias did certainly not it is not proper for us to expect miracles our lord performs them as i have already said and shall mention further for the sake of this soul when he pleases but his majesty wishes us to consider ourselves so wicked that we do not deserve he should perform them and in the meantime that we should help ourselves as much as possible for my part i believe that however elevated our prayer may be this is necessary till we die it is indeed true that he whom our lord admits into the seventh mansion very seldom or ever stands in need of this diligence for reasons which I shall mention there, if I remember to do so. But it is very common for her not to be absent from Christ our Lord, for she walks with him in a wonderful manner, by which the divinity and humanity are together her constant company. Hence, when the fire I spoke of before is not enkindled in the will, nor the presence of God perceived, it is necessary we should seek for it. For this it is which his majesty desires, as the spouse did in the canticles, and that we ask created things, who made you, as St. Austin did. I find he did so in his meditations or confessions. We must not stand like sheep, spending our time in waiting. That which was once given to us, perhaps at first our Lord may not bestow again in a year, and not even during many years. His majesty knows the reason. We should not desire to know it, nor have we any reason to desire it 
since we understand by what way we can please god viz by the way of his commandments and counsels let us be very careful in observing them and in meditating on his life and death and remember how much we are indebted to him let the rest come when our lord shall please but they reply they cannot dwell upon these subjects on account of what i have mentioned they have perhaps some reason for saying so now you already know that it is one thing to discourse with the understanding and another for the memory to represent a thing to the understanding you will say perhaps you do not understand me this may indeed arise from my inability to express myself properly but i will do what i can i call that meditation when we discourse with the understanding in this way suppose we begin to think on the favor god bestowed upon us in giving us his only son and we stop not here but pass on to the mysteries of his glorious life or let us begin with his prayer in the garden the understanding stays not till it considers him fixed on the cross again we may take some point of passion to meditate on as for instance his apprehension and we proceed in this mystery to consider at length the things which are to be observed such as the treachery of judas the flight of the apostles together with other things which followed this is an admirable and very meritorious kind of prayer this is what as i remarked those souls may have reason to say whom god has raised to supernatural things and to perfect contemplation that they cannot make use of this kind of prayer why as i said i know not nor do i know the cause of it but in general they cannot make use of it yet none have reason to say they cannot dwell upon these mysteries nor often present them to their understanding especially since the catholic church celebrates them but it is impossible that a soul which has received so much from god should lose the remembrance of such precious proofs of love since they are so many live sparks which will inflame the more that love which she has for our lord it is impossible also for her not to understand them the soul understands these mysteries in a more perfect way for the understanding represents them to her and they become so fixed in her memory that merely beholding our lord prostrate on the ground in that dreadful sweat is sufficient to occupy her not for one hour only but for many days considering with a simple view who he is and how ungrateful we have been for such great sufferings the will immediately comes in though not with a sensible tenderness to desire to serve him in something for such wonderful kindness and to suffer something likewise for one who endured so much for us with other such like desires wherein the memory and understanding are occupied this i believe is the reason why she can proceed no further in discoursing on the passion and this likewise makes her think she cannot meditate upon it if she do not this it is proper she should endeavor to do it because i know that even very sublime prayer will not prevent her and i consider it is not good unless we are often exercised in this kind of meditation if on this account our lord should favor her with suspensions well and good because though she be unwilling he will make her leave what she is thinking about i consider it certain that this method of proceeding is no impediment but a great help to all that is good but this it would not be should she weary herself much in discoursing as i said at first i consider likewise that one who has arrived further cannot do it possibly it may be otherwise because god leads by several ways but let not those be blamed who cannot go along this way nor let them be judged unfit to possess such rich treasures as those are which are contained in the mysteries of jesus christ our good nor shall any one however spiritual he may be persuade me that he does right who sometimes does not meditate upon them there are certain principles and likewise means which some souls make use of who beginning to arrive at the prayer of quiet and to relish the sweets and delights which our lord gives them esteem it a great thing to be continually pleasing themselves therein now let them believe me and not be absorbed so much as i have said elsewhere for life is long and in it are many troubles and hence in order to bear them with perfection we must consider how our pattern jesus christ and how his apostles and saints bore them the presence of our good jesus and that of his most holy mother is very good company we must not leave them he is exceedingly pleased when we are affected with his sufferings though we sometimes lose thereby our own pleasure and delight much more is he pleased 
because the delight found in prayer is not so frequent but that we may have time for everything if it be said that the soul continues in the same state i should suspect this assertion i speak of one who cannot do what i mentioned before and do you likewise suspect it and endeavor to be free from this deceit and with all your strength endeavor to keep yourselves from having delights if this be of no use inform the superioress of the matter that she may appoint you an office of such care and responsibility as may free you from this danger for it is very offensive at least to the mind that it should continue long i believe i have now shown how proper it is however spiritual the individuals may be not so much to shun corporeal things as to think that even the most sacred humanity of christ might be injurious to them they allege what our lord said to his disciples that it was expedient he should go this i cannot allow certainly he did not say so to his blessed mother for she was strong in faith because she knew he was both god and man and though she loved him more than the disciples yet it was with such great perfection that his presence rather increased it the apostles then it is said by these people must not have been so firm in the faith as they were afterwards and as we now have reason to be i tell you daughters i consider it to be a dangerous way for hereby the devil may be able to make us lose all our devotion to the most blessed sacrament the delusion in which i once seemed to have been entangled did not proceed so far as this but only i did not feel any pleasure in meditating so much on our lord jesus christ i rather wished to remain in this inebriation and to await the delights thereof i clearly saw however that i was going wrong for since i could not always have this delight my thoughts went roving here and there and my soul was like a bird flying up and down and finding no place in which to rest thus i was losing a great deal of time without advancing in virtue or gaining in prayer and i knew not the cause nor in my opinion should i ever have known it because it seemed to me a very right way till having spoken about my prayer to a great servant of god he gave me some advice concerning it i afterwards clearly perceived how much i was mistaken and i never give over lamenting that there ever was a time wherein i did not understand that it is hard to gain with such great loss and though i could easily yet i would not desire any good unless it were obtained by means of him from whom all good things descend may he be blessed for ever amen end of the sixth mansion chapter seven the sixth mansion chapter eight of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 8. She shows how God communicates himself to the soul by an intellectual vision, etc. In order that you may be convinced, sisters, that what I have said is the truth, and that, in proportion as a soul advances further, she is admitted more into the company of her good Jesus. It will be proper to show that we cannot avoid being always with his majesty. When he is pleased, we should. This we shall clearly see, by the ways and methods whereby his majesty communicates himself to us, and discovers to us the love he has for us. By certain apparitions and visions so very wonderful, that I will mention them here, in order that you may not be afraid whenever our Lord is pleased to bestow any such favors upon you. May our Lord enable me to do this properly, in order that we may praise Him even though they should not be bestowed upon us, for being thus pleased to communicate Himself to a creature, He is so great a majesty. Hence it is, that when the soul is not thinking of receiving such a favor, nor imagines that she ever merited it, she perceives our Lord Jesus Christ to be near her, though she sees him not with the eyes of the body, nor with those of the soul. This is called an intellectual vision, for what reason I know not. I know a person on whom God has conferred this favor, together with others which I shall mention hereafter. This person was at first exceedingly afflicted, because she could not understand what it was, she saw nothing and yet she knew for certain that it was christ our lord who in that manner discovered himself 
neither could she doubt of his presence still she was in fear and doubted whether the vision came from god or no though it brought along with it wonderful effects thus proving that it came from god she never heard of an intellectual vision nor did she think there was any such thing but she clearly understood that it was our lord who often spoke to her in the manner mentioned above for until he bestowed this favor upon her she never knew who spoke to her though she heard words being terrified about this vision for it is not like imaginary ones which pass away immediately but this continues for many days and sometimes even more than a year i know that she went to her confessor in very great sorrow he asked how she knew it was our lord since she saw nothing he also requested her to inform him what kind of countenance he had she answered that she knew not because she did not see any countenance nor could she tell anything but what she said though she knew well it was he who spoke to her and that it was not the effect of fancy though many fears were raised in her yet often she could not doubt his presence especially when he said to her fear not it is i these words had such powerful effects that she could have no doubts then but rather she was greatly encouraged and cheered by such good company which she found to be very useful to her towards enabling her to have god continually in her remembrance and to be very careful not to do anything displeasing to him for she seemed always to be beholding him every time she desired to speak with his majesty in prayer or out of prayer she thought he was so near that he could not help hearing her though to hear him speak was not granted when she pleased but on a sudden when there was need she saw him on her right hand but not with those senses by which we discover a person standing near us for this happens in a more subtle manner which cannot be expressed but it is as certain and even more so than by the senses by these there may be a delusion but in this way there is none because it is attended with immense gain and interior effects which would not be were melancholy the cause much less could the devil effect so much good nor would the soul enjoy such great peace or should continual desires of pleasing god or such contempt for whatever does not conduce to unite us with him she afterwards clearly understood that it did not proceed from the devil for by degrees our lord discovered himself more to her i know however that sometimes she was exceedingly fearful and at other times greatly confounded not knowing whence so great a good could come to her she and i were so much one in the same person that nothing passed in her soul with which i was not acquainted so that i can be a good witness and you may believe me that whatever i shall say on this subject is true this is a favor of our lord which brings with it great confusion of oneself and great humility but were it from the devil the effect would be quite the opposite since then it clearly proves itself to be given by god for no human industry is able to obtain such feelings whoever receives it can in no way whatever imagine that it is a favor of his own but that it comes from the hand of god and although in my opinion some of the above-mentioned favors be greater yet this brings a particular knowledge of god along with it and from holding this continual converse there arises a most tender love for his majesty and certain desires greater than those already mentioned of giving ourselves entirely to his service and also a great purity of conscience because the presence of this lord who is so near her makes her attentive to everything and though we know god sees and is present at everything we do yet such is our nature that we neglect to reflect upon this truth but this cannot happen here for the lord who stands so near excites us and keeps us attentive this presence likewise disposes us for receiving the above-mentioned favors because as the soul is almost continually in actual love towards him whom she sees and understands to be near her those favors become much more frequent in a word the gain which the soul receives lets her see what a very great favor it is and how highly it ought to be valued and how much we should thank our lord who bestows it upon us without our being able to merit it for no earthly treasure or delight can be exchanged hence when our lord is pleased to take it away from her she is in great affliction and all possible diligence on our part in order to gain that intercourse is of little avail for our lord bestows it when he pleases it cannot be acquired 
Sometimes also it is the company of some saint, and this likewise is very profitable. You will ask, If nothing be seen, how do we know whether the vision be Christ, or some saint, or his glorious mother? This the soul is unable to express, or to conceive how she understands it. Still, she knows it with the greatest certainty. When our Lord speaks, it seems more easy. But a saint who does not speak, and who only appears to be placed there by our Lord for the company and assistance of this soul, causes more wonder. There are also other spiritual things which cannot be expressed, but by them is discovered how base our nature is, that so we may understand the greatness of God, since we are not capable of understanding the other things. Whoever then shall receive them, let him with admiration hasten to praise his majesty, and give to him particular thanks for them. For, as these are favors not granted to all, he ought to prize them highly, and endeavor to serve God the more, who helps him in so many ways. Hence it is that such a soul does not think any better of herself, but rather that she serves God the least among all who are on the earth, because she considers herself to be more obliged to serve him, and any imperfection she falls into pierces her very bowels, and this too with reason. Any one of you whom our Lord shall conduct in this way may easily observe these effects which remain in the soul, so that you may understand it is no delusion or fancy. For, as I have said before, I consider it impossible that the vision, were it the effect of fancy, or the delusion of the devil, should continue so long, or benefit the soul in so remarkable a manner, and cause her to enjoy such interior peace. This is not the custom of the devil, for being so bad, he cannot, if he wished, produce such great good, since fumes of self-esteem would immediately follow, and a conceit of being better than other people. But the soul being thus continually in the presence of God, and having her attention so employed upon him, would disgust the fiend so much, that, though he might sometimes tempt her, he would not do so often. And God is so faithful that he will not permit him to have such power over a soul that has no other object but that of pleasing his majesty and of laying down her life for his honor and glory. He will soon so order things that she will be undeceived. My conviction is and will be that if the soul proceed in the manner mentioned before, though these favors of our Lord may cease, his majesty will not let her lose though he may sometimes permit the devil to attack her, yet he will always go away confounded. If then, daughters, any of you should be led this way, be not dismayed. Still it is good to fear, let us use more circumspection, and be less confident, lest by being so highly favored you might grow more negligent. This would be a sign that such favors did not come from God, if you did not find the effects which I have mentioned before. It is good to mention this in the beginning to some very learned person, under the seal of confession, since such are the individuals who can enlighten us, or, if it can be done, to a very spiritual person. If not, a learned person is better, but the best of all, if there be an opportunity, to both the one and the other. Should they tell you it is your fancy, be not troubled at it, for fancy can neither injure nor benefit your soul much. Recommend yourself to the Divine Majesty, who will not allow you to be deceived. If they tell you it comes from the devil, the trouble will be greater, though a good scholar will not tell you so, should there be the effects mentioned above. But, even though he should tell you so, I know that this same Lord who walks with you will console and protect you, and enlighten him to instruct you. I advise you to make choice of one who is very learned, and, if you can, of one who is also spiritual. If he be one who, though addicted to the exercise of prayer, is not conducted by our Lord along this way, he will immediately wonder and condemn it. Let the prioress then be asked to give you leave to consult a learned person, because, though the soul be secure by seeing the good life she leads, yet the prioress is obliged to let her mention the matter to another, in order that both may go on in security. When she has spoken with these persons, let her be quiet, and trouble herself no more about the matter. For sometimes, without any grounds for fear, the devil suggests such immoderate scruples that the soul is not satisfied with having spoken once with these persons, especially if the confessor have little experience, and seems timorous, 
and he too should command her to mention it. Thus that is published which ought to be kept very secret, and then this soul comes to be persecuted and tormented, for what she thinks is secret she sees is public. Hence arise many troubles for her, and these may likewise fall upon the order, considering what times we live in. Thus great caution is required herein, and I strongly recommend it to the prioresses. Let them not suppose that a sister who has such favors is better than the others. Our Lord guides every one as he sees necessary. If she make good use of these, they will prepare and dispose her for becoming a great servant of God. But sometimes God leads the weakest this way, and so there is nothing herein to approve or condemn. We must look to virtues only, and esteem her the most who serves our Lord with the greatest mortification, humility, and purity of conscience, since she is the most holy, although we can know little for certain here below, until the true judge shall reward every one according to his merits. Then we shall wonder at seeing how different his judgment is from what we are able to understand here below. May he be praised for ever. Amen. End of the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 8「The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 9, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter 9. She explains how our Lord communicates himself to a soul by an imaginary vision, etc. We now come to imaginary visions, in which it is said the devil can more easily enter than in the preceding ones, and so it is the case. But when they come from our Lord, they seem to me to be in some manner more profitable than others, because they are more conformable to our nature, with the exception, however, of those which our Lord discovers and makes known in the last mansion, for none of the other visions can equal these. Let us then consider now, as I told you in the preceding chapter, in what manner this Lord is here present. It is as if we had a jewel of great value and virtue in a casket of gold. We know for certain it is there, though we may never have seen it, and its virtues fail not to benefit us. If we carry it about with us, since we find by experience it has cured us of certain infirmities, for which it is suitable. But we dare not look upon it, nor open the casket. Neither could we do so, for he only knows how to open it to whom the jewel belongs. And though he lends it to us, to make use of it for our benefit, yet he keeps the key himself. And when he is pleased to show it to us, he will open it for us, as it belongs to him. And then when he thinks proper, he will close it again, as he does in reality. Let us suppose, then, that sometimes he is pleased unexpectedly to show it to him to whom he has lent it, in order to do him good. It is evident that he will afterwards feel far greater pleasure, when he remembers the wonderful brightness of the stone, which thus becomes more deeply engraven on his memory. And so it is here, when our Lord is pleased to caress this soul more lovingly. He clearly shows her his most sacred humanity in the way he pleases, either as he appeared when he was in the world, or as he was after his resurrection. And though this vision is affected with a quickness which resembles that of a flash of lightning, yet this glorious image remains so fixed in the imagination, that I consider it impossible ever to blot it out, till she behold it there, where she shall possess it for ever. Though I call it an image, yet we must not have an idea that it seems as if it were painted in the eyes of the beholder. Rather, it is most truly endowed with life. Sometimes he discourses with the soul, and reveals great secrets to her. But you must understand that though the soul gazes upon it for some time, it can no more be seen than the sun, and hence this vision always passes away very quickly, not because its splendor, like that of the sun, dazzles the interior sight which beholds all this, when it is with the exterior view, I can say nothing of it, because the person of whom, as I said, I can speak so particularly, never had any experience of it, and what one has not experienced, he cannot give any correct account of. For its luster is, as it were, a transfused light, 
and like that of the sun, covered with something as beautiful and as bright as a diamond, if it could be made so. His garment seems like the finest Holland, and almost every time that God bestows this favor, she remains in an ecstasy, her baseness and unworthiness not being able to bear so terrible a sight. I call it terrible because, though it be the most beautiful and delightful that can be imagined, should one live even a thousand years, and dwell upon it even to weariness, because it far exceeds the capacity of our imagination or understanding. Yet this presence of so great a majesty causes such great fear in the soul, that there is no need of asking her, nor of any one telling her who it is. For he clearly makes himself known to be the Lord of heaven and earth. But this earthly kings cannot do, for of themselves they would be little esteemed, but for the royal pomp which attends them, or because others announce who they are. O oh Lord, how little do we Christians know thee! What shall we do in that day when thou wilt come to judge us, if speaking so familiarly with thy spouse and beholding thee causes such terror? What will it be, daughters, when he shall with a dreadful voice say to the wicked, Depart from me, ye cursed of my father. Let then what I have said not be forgotten, respecting this favor bestowed by God upon any soul, for it will be of great benefit. St. Jerome, though so holy, did not allow it to depart from his memory. And thus, whatever we may suffer here in the rigor of a religious life, will seem nothing whatever to us. What do we wait for, since even should our sufferings last long, it is but a moment when compared with eternity? I tell you sincerely, that though I am very wicked, I do not fear the torments of hell, which were as nothing in comparison, when I considered that the damned must behold those eyes of our Lord, so amiable, so meek, so gracious, incensed against them. This I think my heart could not endure. How much more shall he fear him to whom our Lord thus represents himself, if the terror be such that it leaves one senseless? This is certainly the cause of the soul being in a rapture, and our Lord helps her weakness, that she may be united to his greatness in this sublime communication with God. When the soul is able to continue long in beholding this Lord, I do not consider that a vision, but a certain vehement consideration formed in the imagination. It is a kind of dead image, in comparison with this other. It happens that some persons, and I know this to be true, for not three or four, but many persons have spoken with me on the subject, are of so weak an imagination, that whatever they think upon, they say they see it clearly, as it indeed seems to them. They have also so vigorous an understanding, or whatever else it may be, for I know not, that they become quite certain of everything in their imagination. But had they seen a true vision, they would, without any doubt of it, clearly see the mistake, for they continue to frame within themselves that which they see, without afterwards finding any effects therefrom. But they are much colder than if they had seen a devout picture. It is very evident that no attention is to be paid to such a representation, and thus it is forgotten much sooner than a dream. But in what we are speaking of, this is not the case, for when the soul is far from imagining that she is to see anything, and has not the least thought thereof, all at once the whole object is represented to her together, and this disturbs all the powers and senses with great terror, in order to place them afterwards in that blessed peace. And as when St. Paul was thrown to the earth, there came a tempest and noise from heaven. So it is in this interior world, a wonderful movement is made, and in an instant everything is calm, and the soul is so fully instructed in sublime truths, that she stands in need of no other master. True wisdom, without any labor on her part, has dispelled her ignorance, and the soul continues for some time in a great certainty, that this favor comes from God. However much people may tell her to the contrary, they cannot then make her fear any delusion. Afterwards her confessor may terrify her, and God may seem to forsake her, so that she wavers a little, thinking it might possibly happen on account of her sins, but she does not believe it, except in the way of temptation against points of faith, as I have mentioned in other cases. And the devil may disturb her a little, but he cannot prevent the soul from continuing firm and constant in the faith. Nay, the more he attacks her, the surer she is that the devil could not produce so many benefits as she in reality finds. 
Hence, he has not much power in the interior of the soul, though he can represent the object, but not with the like truth, majesty, or with the same effects. Confessors not being able to see this, and perhaps he who receives the favor from God being unable to express it, are afraid, and very justly so. One should therefore proceed with caution, and wait till he beholds the fruits which these visions produce, and by little and little he should observe the humility and strength of virtue which they leave in the soul, for if it be the devil, he will soon discover himself, and we shall find him uttering a thousand lies. If the confessor be experienced, and have received these favors, he will not require a long time to discover the delusion, for he will quickly perceive by relation whether the vision come from God, the imagination, or the devil, especially if his majesty have given him the gift of discerning spirits. For if he have this united with learning, he will easily understand it, even though he should not have experience. That which is very necessary, sisters, is to confer with your director, with great sincerity and simplicity. I do not mean in confessing your sins, for that is clear enough, but in giving him an account of your prayer. If you do not act thus, I cannot ensure your going the right way, nor can I be certain that it is God who teaches you, since he is exceedingly desirous that you should, with the same truth and clearness, treat with his deputies, as you would with himself, and that you should be anxious to acquaint him with all your thoughts, however trifling. And how much more, then, with your actions? If you act in this way, never trouble nor disquiet yourselves, for though the vision should not come from God, if you have humility and a good conscience, it will do you no harm, because his majesty knows how to draw good out of evil, and is able to effect in the same way that by which the devil would wish to destroy you, and you will thus gain more by it. But while you are considering how lovingly our Lord bestows such great favors upon you, strive with more care to please him, and to have your memory always occupied with his appearance. A great scholar once said that the devil is an excellent painter, adding that if he should show him our Savior drawn to the life, he would not refuse to excite his devotion by it, and make war upon the devil with his own weapons, and though the painter might be very wicked, he would not on that account forbear to reverence the picture he drew, if it represented him who is all our good. This learned man thought that was very bad advice which some persons gave, viz., upon seeing any vision of this kind, to make some outward sign of the scorn. For he said, Wherever we see the picture of our king, we ought to reverence it. I find he had reason for these words, for even among ourselves it would be considered an offense, if one who wished well to another knew that a person made use of the like signs of scorn to his image. How much more, then, is it proper always to show respect to a crucifix, wherever it may be seen, or to any image of our emperor? Though I have spoken on this subject in another place, I am desirous of mentioning it here, because I have seen a person exceedingly afflicted when she was commanded to make use of this remedy. I know not who invented it, thus to torment one who was obliged to obey, if her confessor advised her, for she would consider herself ruined unless she did so. My opinion is, that when you are thus advised, you give this reason with humility, and refuse the advice. Those good reasons gave me great satisfaction which he gave me, who advised me how to act in this case. One great advantage which the soul gains from this favor of our Lord is, that when she thinks upon him or on his life and passion, she remembers his most mild and beautiful countenance. This is a very great comfort, just as, in this world, we receive a greater pleasure from having seen a person who does us great good, than if we have never known him. I tell you that so sweet a remembrance is very profitable to us. Other benefits it brings along with it. But having spoken so much of the effects which these visions produce, of which more hereafter, I will for the present say no more, without first earnestly advising you, that though you know God bestows these favors on some souls, you never pray to Him, nor desire Him to lead you this way. For though it may seem to you to be very good, and greatly to be esteemed, yet it is not fitting to be asked for these reasons. First, because it is a want of humility to desire what you have never deserved. 
hence i believe that he has little humility who desires it for as a common working man is far from desiring to be a king considering such a thing impossible because he does not deserve it so is a humble person far from wishing such favors and i am convinced they will never be bestowed except on those who are humble for before our lord bestows these favors he gives us a true knowledge of ourselves ought we not truly to understand that she has a very great favor shown her in not being cast into hell who entertains such thoughts secondly because such a person is very certain to be deceived or in great danger of it for the devil requires no more but to find one little door open in order to lead us into a thousand deceits thirdly because when the desire is vehement and the imagination strong it makes one think he sees and hears that which he wishes for just as it happens to those who in the daytime having a great desire for something and thinking upon it very earnestly dream of it in the night fourthly it is a very great presumption for you to desire to choose a way for yourselves who know not what is best for you since you should refer the matter to our lord who knows you the best in order that he may conduct you in the way he likes best fifthly because the troubles are not few as you may perhaps imagine but very numerous and of various kinds which they endure on whom our lord bestows these favors and how do you know whether you will be able to endure them sixthly because it may happen that you might lose by the very way in which you thought to gain as it happened to saul when he was made king in a word sisters besides these there are other reasons and believe me the surest is to desire only the will of god let us place ourselves in his hands for he loves us exceedingly and we cannot do wrong if with a determined will we persevere herein you must know also that more glory is not merited by receiving many of these favors rather we are obliged to serve him the more our lord does not deprive us of that wherein more merit consists since it is in our power hence there are many holy persons who never knew what it was to receive one of these favors and others receive them and yet are no saints think not that these favors are bestowed constantly rather for once that our lord gives them many labors have to be endured and thus a humble soul does not think how she may procure them frequently but how to make a good use of them it is true they are a great help towards acquiring virtues in a high degree but he has much greater merit who obtains them by having purchased them with his own labor i know three persons one of whom was a man on whom our lord bestowed these favors they were so desirous of serving his majesty at their own cost without these wonderful consolations and so desirous of suffering also that they complained to our lord for having bestowed such favors upon them and if they could they would have refused them i do not speak of the delights of these visions from which in the end come very great benefits which ought to be highly prized but of those delights which our lord gives in contemplation it is true these desires in my opinion are supernatural and come from souls all on fire who wish our lord to see that they do not serve him for wages and thus they never consider they are to receive glory for anything which they do that thereby they may give themselves the more to his service but they wish to satisfy their love the property of which is always to be working in a thousand different ways the soul in this state would fain invent means of consuming herself in him and if it were necessary that she should remain for ever annihilated for the greater glory of god she would willingly do so may he be praised for ever amen who in humbling himself to converse with such miserable creatures is pleased to manifest his greatness end of the sixth mansion chapter nine the sixth mansion chapter ten of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by anne boulet the interior castle or the mansions by saint teresa of avila translated by the reverend john dalton the sixth mansion chapter ten 
the saint mentions other favors which god bestows upon a soul different from those mentioned before in many ways does our lord communicate himself to the soul in these apparitions sometimes when she is afflicted at other times when some trouble is to happen to her and again when his majesty wishes to delight himself with her and caress her i need not enter into every particular as my meaning is only to explain the different kinds which are found in this way as far as i understand them in order that you may know sisters what is their nature and what effects they leave behind for we may be mistaken in supposing every fancy of ours to be a vision and also that when it is in reality a vision knowing such a thing is possible you may not be troubled or afflicted the devil gains much and is exceedingly delighted to see a soul in trouble because he knows it hinders her from employing herself wholly in loving and praising god in other ways much more sublime though less dangerous because i believe the devil cannot counterfeit them his majesty communicates himself this is a difficult matter to speak about because it is exceedingly deep the imaginary visions are more easily explained it happens when our lord is pleased that the soul being in prayer and in perfect enjoyment of her senses is on a sudden seized with a suspension in which our lord reveals great secrets to her which she thinks she sees in god himself for these are not visions of the most sacred humanity but though i say she sees yet she sees nothing for it is no imaginary but a very intellectual vision in which is discovered how all things are seen in god and how he contains them in himself this is of a great benefit to us for though it passes away in an instant yet it is deeply engraven in the soul producing great self-confusion and discovering more clearly our malice in offending god because we commit grievous offenses by being in him ourselves i will make use of a comparison in order to make you understand this matter the better let us suppose god to be as it were a room or a very large and magnificent palace which contains all the world within it can a sinner possibly remove himself from this palace in order to do his evil deeds no certainly not thus even in god himself are committed the abominations dishonesties and other immoralities which we sinners do oh dreadful evil worthy of the greatest consideration and very profitable for us who understand little and cannot comprehend these truths for if we did it would be impossible for us to give way to so mad a boldness let us consider sisters the great mercy and patience of god in not plunging us into hell immediately let us give him our most grateful thanks and let us be ashamed to be offended at anything that is done or said against us for it is the greatest wickedness in the world to behold our creator enduring so many injuries from his creatures and that we should feel hurt at a word spoken in our absence and that through no bad intention oh the misery of the world when my daughters shall we imitate in something this great god away then let us not think we do anything very wonderful when we suffer injuries without murmuring but let us willingly bear everything and love those who injure us since this lord has not ceased to love us though we displease him exceedingly he has therefore very great reason to require us all to forgive however much we may be injured i tell you daughters though these visions pass away immediately yet it is a great favor which our lord bestows upon the soul if she would only make a good use of it seeing it is almost always present before her it happens likewise that god very suddenly and in a manner which cannot be expressed discovers to us in himself a certain truth which seems to obscure all those which are in creatures clearly manifesting that he alone is truth which cannot deceive herein is fully comprehended what david says in the psalm every man is a liar words which never could be so understood though we should often hear it said that god is the infallible truth i remember how pilate asked our lord in his passion and said what is truth and how little we in this world understand this supreme truth i would willingly enter into more particulars but they cannot be expressed let us conclude from this sisters in order to conform ourselves in something to our god and spouse it will help us much if we endeavor always to walk in this truth 
I say that we must not only take care not to lie, and herein, glory be to God, I see already that, in these houses, you take great care, on no account whatever to tell a lie, but that we walk in truth before God and men, in every possible way, especially in not desiring that men should think us better than we are. In all our looks also, let us give to God what is His, and to ourselves what is ours, endeavoring from everything to draw the truth. Thus we shall pay little regard to this world, which is altogether a lie and a falsehood. I was once considering the reason why our Lord loved humility so much, when, without much consideration, I suddenly remembered that God was essentially the supreme truth, and humility is walking in the truth, for it is a very great truth, that of ourselves we have no good, but misery and nothingness. And he who does not understand this, walks in falsehood. But he who understands it the best, is the most pleasing to the supreme truth, because he walks in it. May God grant us the favor, sisters, never to be without this knowledge of ourselves. Amen. Our Lord bestows these favors on a soul, because, being his true spouse, and being now resolved to accomplish his will in everything, he is pleased to give her some knowledge of the means whereby she is to accomplish it, and of his greatness likewise. It is not necessary for me to say any more. These two I have mentioned, because they seem to me very profitable in teaching us, that in such cases there is no ground for fearing, but rather reason to praise our Lord for giving them. For, in my opinion, the devil and our own imagination have little access here, and hence the soul enjoys great pleasure and satisfaction. End of the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 10「The Sixth Mansion, Chapter Eleven, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Sixth Mansion, Chapter Eleven. She speaks of certain desires which God gives a soul of enjoying him, and which are so vehement and impetuous that they endanger her life. Will all these favors which the spouse has bestowed upon the soul be sufficient to make the little dove or butterfly, for do not think I have forgotten it, to rest contented, and repose in some place where she is to die? No, certainly she is rather much worse, and though she may have received these favors many years since, she mourns and weeps continually, for every one of those years increases her affliction. The reason is that as she understands still more and more the greatness of her God, and sees herself so remote from Him, and so far from enjoying Him, her desire is increased the more, and so is her love too, when she discovers still more how much this great God and Lord deserves to be loved, and during these years this desire by degrees increases in such a way as to cause that dreadful pain which I will now mention. I said years with respect to what that person felt and experienced of whom I spoke. And I know well that God is not to be limited, and that He is able, in a moment, to advance a soul to a much higher degree than is mentioned here. His Majesty is both able to do all that He pleases, and desirous of doing a great deal for us. It happens then, sometimes, that from these anxieties, tears, and groans, and the great impetuosities already mentioned, all this seems to proceed from our love, accompanied with great sensibility. But all is nothing in comparison with this other, of which I am now speaking, because this seems to be a fire which continues smoking, and may be endured, though with pain. It happens then, sometimes, that such a soul, thus burning in herself, upon a very slight thought that she may have, or through a word which she heard respecting the delay of her death, feels, on the other hand, a blow, as if it came from a fiery dart, though she understand not whence nor how. I do not say it is a dart, but whatever it is, it is evident it cannot come from our nature, neither is it a blow, though I mentioned the word, but it wounds more sharply, and in my opinion, not in that part where we feel pain in this world, 
but in the very depth and inmost recess of the soul where this ray which passes away so quietly reduces all it finds of this earth of our nature to dust for during the time it continues it is impossible to remember anything of our being because in an instant it binds up the faculties in such a manner that they have no liberty for anything whatever except for those things which tend to increase this grief i do not wish this to be considered an exaggeration for i indeed see i have said little because it cannot be expressed this is a rapture of the senses and faculties altogether and does not tend to make this affliction felt for the understanding is very quick in comprehending the reason there is to grieve because the soul sees herself absent from god and his majesty helps this at that time by so clear a manifestation of himself as to increase the pain to such a degree that the person who feels the pain breaks forth into loud cries and though she be very patient and accustomed to suffer great pains yet she cannot do otherwise for this torment is not in the body but in the interior of the soul hence the person concludes how much sharper its pains are than those of the body and it is represented to her that the sufferings of purgatory are similar to these where the want of a body is no hindrance to the soul's suffering much more than all those men do who live in the body i saw one in this state and i certainly thought the person was dying and no wonder for one is indeed in great danger of death and thus though it may not last long yet it leaves the body all disjointed and the pulse then beats so faint as if one were about to die and with reason because the natural heat fails and the supernatural so burns it up that with a very little more god would satisfy her desires of dying not that one feels any bodily pains though as i said the body is so disjointed that for two or three days after it has no strength even to write a few lines for the pains are great and in my opinion the body always continues weaker than before feeling no corporeal pain arises from the predominance of the interior sense of the soul on this account she pays no regard to the body even should it be torn in a thousand pieces you will say this is an imperfection for why does she not conform herself to the will of god to which she seems resigned hitherto she has not been able to do so and thus has her life passed away but it is not the case now because her reason is such as not to be able to govern itself nor to think of anything but what torments her as she is absent from her chief good for what should she live she seems to feel herself to be in a strange solitude all those who live on earth are no company for her no nor would i believe those in heaven be if her beloved one were not there present everything torments her and she sees herself like one hanging in the air neither able to rest on anything belonging to earth nor able to ascend into heaven she is burnt up with this thirst and cannot obtain water this thirst is unbearable and so excessive that no water can quench it neither does she desire to have it quenched except that of which our saviour spoke to the samaritan woman but this is not given to her o oh my god and my lord to what estate dost thou bring those who love thee but all is little in comparison with that which thou givest to them afterwards and very proper is it that it should cost them much especially if it should contribute to purify such a soul for entering into the seventh mansion just as those who are to enter heaven are purified in purgatory the suffering is quite as trifling as a drop of water in comparison with the sea how much more proper then is it for notwithstanding this torment and affliction greater than which in my opinion cannot be found on earth for this person has endured many afflictions and yet she considered them all as nothing in comparison with this the soul perceives this pain is of such great value that she clearly understands she could never merit it but this perception does not come in such a way as to give any relief though herewith she bears it very willingly and would bear it all her life if god so pleased though she were not to die once but to be always dying for it is in reality nothing less let us consider too sisters that those who are in hell have not this conformity nor the joy and delight which god bestows upon the soul they see their sufferings are unprofitable and that they always suffer and shall suffer more and more 
I mean more as to accidental pains, because the torments of the soul are greater than those of the body, and those which they endure are beyond comparison greater than that which I have mentioned here. And these see also that their torments shall continue for ever. What will become of these miserable souls, and what ought we not to do and to suffer in this very short life? which is a mere nothing, in order to be delivered from such terrible and eternal torments. I tell you, it is impossible to express how great is the suffering of the soul, and how different from that of the body, unless a person has experienced it, and our Lord himself wishes us to understand this, in order that we may know the better how much we owe him for having conducted us to a state of life, which we hope, in his mercy, will be the means of delivering us from those miseries, and may he pardon our sins also. Let us now return to what we were speaking about, when we left the soul in that extreme torment. In this extremity she does not continue long, at most, in my opinion, not above three or four hours. For were it to continue long, it would be impossible for human infirmity to bear it, except by a miracle. Sometimes it has not continued for more than a quarter of an hour, and yet the person has been, as it were, disjointed. It is true that this time it came upon her so violently that she became quite senseless upon hearing only one word, that her life would not yet end. She was then engaged in conversation, it being the last day of Easter, and during all the time she was in such aridity that she scarcely knew it was Easter. To think of being able to resist it would be the same as if one, being thrown into a great fire, should wish to prevent the flames from burning him. It is not a pain which can be hidden, but those who are present understand the great danger a person is in, though they cannot be witnesses of the interior. It is true that whilst people are with her, they are some company for her, but only as if they were shadows, and such all earthly things seem to her in order that you may see how possible it is, if this should ever happen to you, for the weakness of our nature to interpose here, it may be necessary to tell you, that sometimes it happens, when, as you have seen, the soul is dying through her desire of dying, which desire so oppresses her, that hardly anything seems wanting to prevent her leaving the body. Then she fears indeed, and wishes this pain to lessen, in order that she may not die. It is very clear that this pain arises from natural weakness, for on the other hand, her former desires do not leave her, nor is it possible for this pain to be removed, till our Lord shall take it away. This is usually done by a vision, whereby the true comforter both comforts and strengthens the soul to be willing to live as long as His Majesty shall please. This is a very painful thing, but it leaves in the soul very great effects, and expels the fear of troubles which may follow. For, in comparison with so acute a pain which the soul felt, all others seemed to her as nothing. She is so improved thereby, that she would be glad to endure it often, but this she cannot in any way obtain, nor has she any means of recovering it again till our Lord shall please, nor can she resist it when it comes. She has a greater contempt of the world than she formerly had, for she sees that nothing in it helps her in this affliction. She is also much more disengaged from creatures, because she sees that only her Creator can comfort and satisfy her. She is likewise more careful and fearful not to displease God, because she sees He can console and torment whenever He pleases. There are two things, it seems to me, in this spiritual way, which endanger a person's life. One is what we have already mentioned, and which is indeed very dangerous, the other is a very great joy and delight, so excessive that it seems to make the soul faint away, so that she is very near dying, and truly this would be no small happiness for her. Here, sisters, you will see whether I had reason to say, courage is necessary, and that our Lord, whenever you desire such things, may justly say to you, as he did to the sons of Zebedee, Can you drink of this chalice? I believe, sisters, we should all answer yes, and justly so, because His Majesty gives strength to Him for whom He sees it is necessary, and in everything He protects such souls, and answers for them in persecutions and slanders, as He did for Mary Magdalene, if not by words, at least by deeds. At last, before we die, He repays them all together, as you shall now see. May He be blessed for ever, and may all creatures praise Him. Amen. 
End of the Sixth Mansion, Chapter 11「The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 1, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 1. She speaks of the great favors which God bestows on souls who have entered the seventh mansions, etc. You may suppose, sisters, that as so much has already been said regarding the spiritual way, nothing more can be added. It would be a great mistake to think so, for as God's greatness has no limits, so neither have his works. Who is able to mention all his mercies and wonders? It is impossible. Never wonder, then, at what has been said, or shall be, because it is all a mere cipher in comparison with what may be said concerning God. He has been very merciful to us, in having communicated these things to a person, by whom we might be able to know them. The more we are made aware that he communicates himself to creatures, the more shall we praise his greatness, and endeavor to have a high esteem of that soul in which our Lord takes such pleasure and delight, and such a soul each one of us has. But since we do not prize her, as a creature made after the image of God deserves to be, neither do we understand the great secrets which are concealed within her. May his majesty, if such be his pleasure, guide my pen, and bestow upon me the favor of enabling me to explain something of the many things which are to be mentioned, and which he discovers to those whom he conducts into this mansion. I have earnestly requested this favor from his majesty, since he knows that my only object is not to let his mercies be hidden, so that his holy name may be praised the more. I hope, sisters, he will grant me this favor, not for my sake, but for yours, in order that you may understand how important it is for your spouse to celebrate this spiritual marriage with your souls, for it brings with it many good things, as you will see. It is also necessary you should put no obstacle in the way. O oh, great God, I seem to tremble, being such a miserable creature, and having to speak on a subject which I am so far from deserving to understand. The truth is, I have been in great confusion, for I have been thinking whether it would be better to finish this mansion in a few words, since I thought people would imagine that I knew by experience what I said. I am likewise extremely ashamed, because, knowing what I am, it is a terrible thing. On the other hand, it seemed to be a temptation and a weakness, though you may throw a thousand censures upon me, so that God is praised and known a little more. Let all the world exclaim against me, and this the more, because perhaps I may be dead before this book is seen. May he be blessed who lives, and shall live for ever. Amen. When our Lord is pleased to be moved by what this soul suffers, and has suffered through her desires for him, which he has now spiritually chosen to be his spouse, he allows her to enter this, his seventh mansion, before the consummation of the spiritual nuptials. For as he has a mansion in heaven, so he is to have an abode in the soul, in which his majesty alone resides. Let us call it another heaven, since it is very important for us, sisters, not to imagine the soul to be something obscure, and, as we do not see it, we generally think there is no other interior light except what we see, and that there is in the soul a certain obscurity. I indeed grant this to you, as regards a soul which is not in the state of grace, not through the want of the sun of justice which is in her, and gives her being, but because she is incapable of receiving its light, as I have mentioned in the first mansion. Let us, sisters, take particular care to pray for those who are in mortal sin. It is a very great charity. If we saw a Christian with his hands bound behind him with a strong chain, and tied fast to a pillar, and dying with hunger, not through want of victuals, having every delicacy before him, but because he cannot reach it and put it into his mouth, and that he was about to die, not a temporal, but an eternal death, would it not be a great cruelty to stand looking on, and not give him anything to eat? 
but what if by your prayers his chains also could be loosened for the love of god i beg you always to remember such souls in your prayers we do not however speak here of these souls but of such only who have done penance for their sins and through god's mercy are in a state of grace we may consider the soul not as a limited creature but as an internal world containing so many and such beautiful mansions as you have seen and this with reason since god has an abode within this soul when his majesty is pleased to bestow upon her the above-mentioned favor of this divine espousals he first brings her into his own mansion his majesty does not wish this to be as at other times when he sends her raptures and when i believe he unites her to himself as well as in the prayer of union but there it seems to the soul that she is not called by god to enter into her center as is the case in this mansion but into the superior part though it matters little whether this be in one way or the other still what is the most necessary to notice is that there our lord unites her to himself but it is effected by making her become blind and dumb as happened to st paul at his conversion and by not giving her any knowledge as to how or in what manner this favor is bestowed which she enjoys for the great delight which the soul finds is from seeing herself approach near to god but when he really unites himself with her she neither understands nor knows anything for all the faculties are lost and absorbed but here it is in another way for now our good god is pleased to take away the scales from our eyes that she may see and understand something of the favor which he bestows upon her though it be in a wonderful manner when she is brought into this mansion by an intellectual vision all the three persons of the most holy trinity discover themselves to her by a certain way of representing the truth she is accompanied with a certain inflaming of the soul which comes upon her like a cloud of extraordinary brightness these three persons are distinct and by a wonderful knowledge given to the soul she with great truth understands that all these three persons are one substance one power one knowledge and one god alone hence what we behold with faith the soul here as one may say understands by sight though this sight is not with the eyes of the body because it is not an imaginary vision all the three persons here communicate themselves to her and speak to her and make her understand those words mentioned in the gospel where our lord said that he and the father and the holy ghost would come and dwell with the soul that loves him and keeps his commandments o oh, my lord what a different thing is the hearing and believing of these words from understanding in this way how true they are such a soul is every day more astonished because these words never seem to depart from her but she clearly sees in the manner mentioned above that they are in the deepest recess of the soul how it is she cannot express since she is not learned and she perceives this divine company in herself you may imagine that the soul is so out of herself and so absorbed that she can attend to nothing on the contrary she is more occupied than formerly in whatever relates to the service of god and when she is not engaged she is still with this delightful company and if the soul be not wanting to god he will never fail in my opinion manifestly to discover his presence to her she has a strong confidence that god who has bestowed this favor upon her will not forsake her so that she should lose it and well may she think so though she does not cease to use more care than ever in endeavoring not to displease him in anything having this presence with her must not be understood that it is so as clearly as it was first discovered to her and at some other times when god is pleased to give her this favor because if it were so it would be impossible to mind anything else or even to live among men but though it be not with so much light yet whenever she reflects upon it she always finds herself in this company for example suppose a person together with some others were in a room full of light and after shutting the windows were to be left in the dark one would not know they were there because the light to see them by is taken away you may ask whether one be able to open the windows in order to see them again when one wishes i answer no but only when our lord is pleased to open the understanding he is sufficiently merciful to her 
by his never leaving her, and in being willing that she should understand this with such evidence. His divine majesty here seems to be willing, by this admirable company, to prepare her for some greater favor, for it is clear that thereby she is greatly strengthened for advancing in perfection, and casting away the fear she sometimes had in other favors bestowed upon her, as I have already mentioned. And so it was, for the person found herself improved in everything, and she thought that, notwithstanding the cares and troubles she met with, the soul always remained in that mansion in such a manner, that she thought there was a division between her and her soul, and, meeting with great troubles, which happened to her a little after God had bestowed this favor upon her, she complained of her soul, as Martha did of Mary, that she was always enjoying this quiet at her pleasure, and left her plunged in so many troubles and occupations, that she could not keep her company. This may appear to you foolishness, but what I have said is indeed the truth, for though it be certain that the soul is entirely united, what I say is no fancy or delusion, because it is very common. On this account I said that things internal are seen in such a way, that it is certain there is a clear difference between the soul and the spirit, and though in general they are one and the same thing, yet between them there may be perceived a division so subtle that sometimes it seems the one works in a way different from the other, and so also is the knowledge which our Lord gives them. It also seems to me that the soul is different from the faculties. In a word, there are so many and such subtle differences in our interior, that it would be a presumption in me to attempt to explain them. In heaven we shall see them, if our Lord in His goodness shall grant us the favor of bringing us there, where we can understand these secrets. End of the Seventh Mansion, Chapter 1「The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 2, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle or the Mansions by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 2. She continues the same discourse and explains the difference between the spiritual union and spiritual marriage. This she illustrates by some comparisons. We will now speak of the divine and spiritual marriage, though such a sublime favor cannot be entirely possessed in this life, or perfectly accomplished, since if we once leave God we shall quite lose so great a good. The first time God bestows this favor, His Majesty is pleased to discover Himself to the soul by an imaginary vision of His most sacred humanity, in order that she may fully understand it, and be not ignorant that she receives so immense a gift. To others He may appear in another form. To her of whom we speak, our Lord showed Himself immediately after she had communicated, in a figure of great splendor, beauty, and majesty, just as He was after His resurrection. He said to her, that now was the time she should consider his affairs as hers, and that he would take care of hers. Other words were uttered, more fit to be felt than spoken. You may perhaps think that this was no novelty, because at other times our Lord represented himself to this soul in this same way, but this was so far different that it left her quite out of herself, and quite astonished, both because this vision came with great force, and on account of the words which he spoke, and also because, in the interior of the soul, where he had represented himself, she had never heard any except in the preceding vision. You must understand that there is an immense difference between this and the preceding mansions, and the difference is as great between the spiritual espousals and the spiritual marriage, as there is between those who are only affianced, and those who are really united in matrimony. I have already mentioned that though these comparisons be used, because none fitter can be found, yet it should be understood that here the body is no more remembered than if the soul were out of it, and much less in the spiritual marriage. For this secret union is effected in the interior center of the soul, which must certainly be where God himself resides, and he, in my opinion, requires no door to enter at. 
in all that i have hitherto said the effects seem to be brought about by means of the senses and faculties and the representation of our lord's humanity must certainly be of this nature but that is far different which takes place here in the union of the spiritual marriage our lord appears in the centre of the soul not by an imaginary but an intellectual vision though it is more subtle than those i have mentioned before such did he appear to the apostles without entering at the door when he said to them pax vobis that which god here communicates to the soul in an instant is so great a secret and so sublime a grace and what she feels is such an excessive delight that i know nothing to compare it to except that our lord is pleased at that moment to manifest to her the glory which is in heaven and this he does in a more sublime way than by any vision or spiritual delight more cannot be said as far as can be understood than that this soul becomes one with god for as he himself is a spirit his majesty is pleased to discover the love he has for us by making certain persons understand how it extends in order that we may praise his greatness because he has vouchsafed to unite himself to a creature in such a way that as in the marriage state husband and wife can no more be separated so he will never be separated from her the spiritual espousals is different for this is often dissolved and so also is union for though union is the joining of two things into one they may at last be divided and may subsist apart we generally see that this favor of our lord quickly passes away and the soul afterwards does not enjoy that company that is so as to know it but in that other favor of our lord this is not the case for the soul always remains with her god in that centre let us suppose union to be like two tapers so exactly joined together that the light of both makes but one or that the wick light and wax are all one and the same but that afterwards one taper may be easily divided from the other and then two distinct tapers will remain and the wick will be distinct from the wax but here in the spiritual espousals it is like water descending from heaven into a river or spring where one is so mixed with the other that it cannot be discovered which is the river water and which the rain water it is also like a small rivulet running into the sea whose waters cannot be separated from each other or as if there were two windows in a room at which one great light entered but which though entering in divided yet makes but one light within this is perhaps that which st paul means where he says he who adheres to god is one with him alluding to this sublime marriage which presupposes that god is united to the soul by union he likewise says mihi vivere christus est et mori lucrum to me to live is christ and to die is gain i think the soul may say the same here for here the butterfly dies of which we have spoken and this with very great joy because now her life is christ this in time is best known by the effects for it is clearly seen by certain secret inspirations that it is god who gives life to the soul and these inspirations are often so very lively that they cannot in any way be doubted because the soul perceives them very well though they cannot be expressed but the feeling is so great that sometimes it produces certain amorous words which it appears one cannot help uttering as for example o oh, life of my life my support which upholdest me together with other like expressions from those divine breasts wherewith it seems god continually supports the soul streams of milk issue which comfort all the people of the castle for it seems our lord wishes them to enjoy in some manner that abundance which the soul enjoys and that from this vast river in which the little spring is swallowed up there should sometimes flow a quantity of that water in order to support those who are to serve these two spouses in that which relates to the body and just as if a person who should be suddenly plunged in this water without thinking of any such thing could not help feeling himself wet so in the same manner but with more certainty are these operations i am speaking about discerned because as a great quantity of water could not fall upon us if there were no principle whence it descended so here we clearly see that there is one in our interior who sends forth these darts and gives life to this life 
and that there is a sun, from which proceeds that great light, which is conveyed to the powers from the interior of the soul. She does not, as I have said, stir from this center, nor does she lose her peace, for he himself who gave it to the apostles, when they were assembled together, can give it to her also. I have been thinking that this salutation of our Lord contained more, no doubt, than the mere words outwardly represented. The same may be said regarding our Lord telling the glorious Magdalene to go in peace. For as the words of our Lord are deeds in us, so these words must certainly produce such effects upon those souls who are already disposed, as to take from them all that is corporeal in the soul, and leave it a pure spirit, in order that it might be united with the uncreated spirit in this celestial union. It is very certain that by disengaging ourselves from all creatures, and withdrawing ourselves from them for the love of God, the same Lord will fill us with himself. When our Lord was once praying with his apostles, he requested that they might be one with the Father and with him, as Christ our Lord was in the Father and the Father in him. I know not what love can be greater than this, and here let us all not fail to enter into this union, since his majesty has said, I pray not for them only, but for all those who shall believe in me. He likewise said, I am in them. How true, O oh my God, are these words, and how well does the soul in this prayer understand them? And we should all understand them, were it not through our own fault, since the words of Jesus Christ, our King and Lord, cannot fail. But as we do not prepare ourselves properly, and do not remove everything from us which might obstruct this light, hence we do not behold ourselves in this glass in which we look, and wherein our image is engraven. But let us return to what we were saying. After our Lord has conducted the soul into his mansion, which is the center of the soul, as they say, the empyreal heaven where God resides is not moved like the other part is, and so it seems that when the soul enters there, those motions do not take place in the soul, which used to be in the faculties and imagination, so that they can hurt her or take away her peace. I may seem to mean that the soul by obtaining this favor becomes secure as regards her salvation, and does not afterwards relapse. But I do not say any such thing, and whenever I speak on this subject, and seem to mean that the soul is secure, my words must be understood thus, viz., as long as the divine majesty holds her in his hand, and she does not offend him. I know for certain, that though she see herself in this state, and though it may continue some years, she does not, therefore, think herself secure, but rather she has greater fears than formerly, and is more careful to avoid any small offense against God, as I shall mention hereafter. She also has such ardent desires of serving Him, and such continual pain and confusion, to see how little she can do, and how much she is obliged to do, that it is no small cross but rather a great mortification. For in doing penance, the greater it is, the more delight does the soul feel. Her true penance is, when God takes away her health and strength, so that she is unable to do any penance. And though I have in another place shown the great affliction this causes, yet here it is much greater. And all certainty must come from the root, into which she is grafted just as a tree which grows near running water looks greener and bears fruit better. Why then should we be astonished at the desires which this soul has, since the true spirit of her has become one with that celestial water of which we spoke? But to return to what I was saying, it is not intended that the faculties, senses, and passions should always enjoy this peace. The soul indeed does, but in the other mansions there are seasons of war, of troubles, and of pains, though in such a manner as not to take away her peace, and this happens very commonly. It is so difficult to explain how the spirit is lodged in the center of our soul, and even to believe it, that I fear, my sisters, my inability to explain it may be some temptation to you not to believe what I say. For, to assert that there are crosses and troubles, and yet that the soul is at peace, is difficult to imagine. I wish to give you a few comparisons, and God grant they may prove such as may in some degree illustrate the subject. But should they not be to the purpose, yet I know that what I say is the truth. The king is in his palace, 
yet there may be many wars in his kingdom and many offensive things done still he does not on this account cease to be on his throne and so it is here though there be many tumults and many poisonous creatures in the other mansions and the noise of them is heard yet no such things enter into this mansion or force the soul to remove from hence and though they give her some pain yet it is not in a way to disturb her and deprive her of her peace for the passions are now subdued in such a way that they are afraid to enter here because they go away still more mortified the whole body is in pain but if the head be sound no harm can be done to it i smile at these comparisons for they do not satisfy me but i can find no better whatever you may think of them i have spoken the truth end of the seventh mansion chapter two the seventh mansion chapter three of the interior castle this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Reverend John Dalton. The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 3. She mentions some wonderful effects produced by the prayer already spoken of. Since we have said that this butterfly dies with very great joy, because she has found rest, and that Christ lives in her, let us now consider what kind of life she leads, or what is the difference between her present state and her former when she was alive. For we shall see by the effects, whether that be true which has been mentioned. As far as I understand, these following are some of the effects. The first is a forgetfulness of herself, so that she truly seems, as I have said, no longer to exist, for she is affected in such a way that she neither knows herself nor remembers that there is either heaven or life or honor destined for her, being entirely engaged in seeking the glory of God, and hence it seems that the words spoken by His Majesty have affected the work, viz., that she should mind His affairs, and that He would take care of hers. Thus she is not troubled at whatever happens to her, but she so strangely forgets herself that as i have already said she seems to herself not to exist nor would she desire to live except when she perceives she can in any way advance however little the honor and glory of god for which she would very gladly lay down her life but do not imagine daughters that on this account she neglects to take any care about eating and sleeping which are a great torment to her and doing everything to which she is obliged by her state of life we are speaking of interior things, for as regards exterior works, little can be said. It is rather an affliction to her, to consider how all that she is able to do by her own strength is a mere nothing. Whatever she understands would conduce to the honor of our Lord, she would not omit for anything in the world. The second effect is a great desire for suffering, yet it is not like what she formerly had, for that used to disturb her the desire which such souls have that god's will may be done in them is so excessive that they receive with pleasure whatever his majesty sends them if he wish them to suffer they are content if not they do not torment themselves about it as they used to do at other times these souls feel likewise a great interior joy when they are persecuted for then they enjoy more peace than that i have ever before spoken of and they do not feel the least hatred against their persecutors nay they conceive for them a particular affection so much so that if they see them in any affliction they feel it keenly pity them and most sincerely recommend them to god on condition that he would in exchange bestow these afflictions on themselves in order that they might not offend his majesty what i wonder at the most of all is that as you have seen how great were the sufferings and afflictions which they endured through their longing to die in order to enjoy our lord so also is the desire great which they have to serve him that so he may be praised by their means they also desire to benefit if they can some soul hence they not only do not desire to die but to live many years and to endure very great crosses in order that our lord by their means may be honored however little and though they were sure when the soul left the body immediately to enjoy god 
they make no account of this and think as little on the glory which the saints possess they do not desire it at present since all their glory consists in their being able to assist in something their crucified lord especially when they see him so much offended and so few who disengaged from all other things have his honor truly at heart it is true that sometimes when they forget this the desires of enjoying god and of leaving this land of exile come upon them with tenderness considering how little they serve him but immediately returning to themselves they reflect how they have him continually with them and with this they are satisfied offering to his majesty their willingness to live as being the most precious offering they can make they have no fear of death but look upon it as a sweet trance the fact is he who before gave those desires with that excessive torture now gives this other may he be blessed and praised for ever thus the desires of these souls do not now run after consolations and delights because they have christ our lord with them and his majesty now lives in them it is manifest that as his life was nothing else but a continual torment so he makes ours such at least by desire and he leads us as being feeble though in other things when he sees necessary he gives us strength they feel in themselves a disengagement from everything and a desire of being always alone or employed in things relating to the good of some soul they have no aridities nor internal troubles but always have a memory and a tenderness for our lord so that they would gladly do nothing but praise him and when they become negligent our lord himself excites them so that it is clearly seen that this impulse or i know not what to call it proceeds from the interior of the soul as i mentioned when speaking of impetuosities here it is done with great sweetness but it comes neither from the fancy nor from the memory nor any other thing whereby one can discover that the soul did nothing on her part this is so usual and happens so often that one may very easily observe it for as a fire however large it may be does not send forth its flames downwards but upwards so this internal motion is here discovered to proceed from the centre of the soul and thus it excites the faculties truly were there no other advantage in this method of prayer than discovering the particular care god takes in communicating himself to us and how he entreats us to abide with him i think that all the pains endured for the enjoyment of these sweet and penetrating proofs of his love are well bestowed this sisters you will find true by experience for i think that when a soul has arrived at the prayer of union our lord takes this care of us if we keep his commandments when this shall happen to you remember it belongs to this interior mansion where god resides in our soul and praise him exceedingly for that message certainly comes from him and the note is written with so much affection and in such a way that he intends you alone should understand the handwriting and what he wishes you to do hence then on no account neglect to answer his majesty however engaged in exterior things and in conversation with other persons for it may happen oftentimes that our lord will wish to bestow this secret favor upon you in public and as the answer must be interior it is very easy to make an act of love or to say what st paul said lord what wilt thou have me to do then in many ways he will teach you what you should do to please him and the time is very opportune for then he seems to hear us this delicate touch of his almost always disposes the soul to be able to do with a firm resolution that which has been mentioned before the difference between this mansion and the rest is that there are scarcely ever any aridities or interior disturbances like what used to be at other times in all the rest but the soul is almost always in quiet and she is never afraid that this sublime gift would be counterfeited by the devil and therefore she is confident it comes from god as i have before mentioned the senses or powers have nothing to do here for his majesty has discovered himself to the soul and he has taken her along with him to the place where in my opinion the devil dare not come nor will our lord allow him and all the favors he bestows here on the soul are without her doing anything on her part except what she has already done in resigning herself entirely to god whatever our lord does to the soul and all that he teaches her passes in such quiet 
and without noise, that it seems to me to resemble the building of Solomon's temple, when no noise was heard, and so in this temple of God, for this mansion is his, wherein he and the soul sweetly enjoy each other in the most profound silence, there is no need for the understanding to stir, or to seek after anything, for the Lord who created it wishes it to remain quiet here, and through a little chink to behold what passes within, for though at certain times this sight be lost and cannot be seen, yet it is only for a short time, since, in my opinion, the powers are not lost here, but they do not work, they are, as it were, stupefied. I am astonished to see that when the soul gets so far, all raptures are taken away from her, except at some few times. This taking away of the raptures, which I here speak of, relates to the exterior effects which these cause, such as losing our sense and heat, though some persons tell me that these are merely accidents of the raptures, which, in reality, are not taken away, since the interior effect is rather increased. Hence the raptures cease in the manner I have mentioned, and there are no more ecstasies nor flights of the spirit, if they come at all, it is very seldom, and almost never in public. Nor do the great opportunities of devotion given to her help her herein, as they once used to do. Hence, if she beheld a devout picture, or heard a sermon, which seemed almost as if she did not hear it, or listened to music, she was so troubled, like the poor butterfly, that everything frightened her and made her take wing. But here, either because she has found her repose, or has been so much in this mansion, she wonders at nothing, nor does she now find such solitude, since she enjoys such good company. In a word, sisters, be the cause whatever it may, for I know not, when our Lord begins to show the soul what is in this mansion, and when he has conducted her into it, this great infirmity which was very troublesome to her, and which would not leave her before, now does leave her. This may be because our Lord has now strengthened, enlarged, and disposed her, or perhaps because he wishes to make known in public what he has done secretly in these souls, for certain ends which his majesty has in view, for his judgments are far beyond all that we can imagine. These effects God bestows, together with all the rest which we have mentioned, in the degrees of prayer, if they be good, when the soul approaches to receive that kiss which the spouse in the canticles desired, I think that here this petition is fulfilled. Here, water is given in abundance to the wounded heart. Here, she delights in the tabernacle of God. Here, the dove, which Noah sent out to see whether the flood had ceased, has found the olive branch, a sign that she has discovered firm land amidst the surges and tempests of the world. O oh, Jesus, who can tell how many things there are in the scriptures which illustrate this peace of the soul? Since thou, O Lord, beholdest how important this is for us, make all Christians desirous of seeking after it, and in thy mercy do not take it away from those to whom thou hast given it. In a word, until thou give us true peace, and bring us there, where it will never end, we must always live in fear. I say true peace, not as if I meant that what we have already were not such, but because if we leave God, the first war may return. But what will such souls feel, on seeing that it is possible they may be deprived of so great a good? This consideration makes them proceed with more caution and vigilance, and endeavor to gather strength from their weakness, so as not through their own fault to omit any occasion which presents itself, of pleasing God better. The more they are favored by His Majesty, the more diffident, humble, and fearful they do become of themselves and because they best understand their own miseries in these manifestations of God's greatness, and as their sins also appear the more grievous, they are often brought to such a state that, like the publican in the gospel, they dare not lift up their eyes. At other times they desire to live no longer, that so they may be secure, though through the love which they have for God, they immediately wish again, as I said, to live, that so they may serve Him, whatever relates to them they commit to his mercy. Sometimes the numerous favors which they have received make them more humble and more annihilated, for they fear lest it should be with them as it is with a ship overladen, which sinks the sooner to the bottom. I tell you, sisters, they do not want a cross, only it does not trouble them, nor rob them of their peace, but immediately it passes away, 
like a wave or a tempest, and then succeeds a calm. For the presence of our Lord, which they carry with them, soon makes them forget everything. May he be blessed and praised forever by all his creatures. Amen. End of the Seventh Mansion, Chapter 3「The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 4, of the Interior Castle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. The Interior Castle, or the Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila. Translated by the Rev. John Dalton. The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 4. The saint concludes by mentioning what our Lord has particularly in view, in conferring such great favors upon the soul. You must not suppose, sisters, that the effects I have mentioned are always in the same degree in these souls, for on this account I said that our Lord sometimes leaves them in their natural condition, and then all the venomous things in the ditches and in the other mansions unite together to be revenged on them, for the time in which they could not get them in their power. It is true, this does not last long, a day perhaps, or a little more, and in this great tumult, which commonly arises from some occasion, one discovers how much the soul gains by the good company she has, for our Lord gives her great strength, never to turn aside in anything from his service, or from her pious resolutions. These seem even to increase within her, and she turns not from this firm resolution even by a first motion." This happens seldom, as I said, but our Lord wishes her not to forget her own state, in order that she may always be humble, and may understand how much she is indebted to His Majesty, and that she may also comprehend the greatness of the favor she receives, and may praise Him for it. But do not think that these souls, because they have such ardent desires and firm resolutions, if not committing any imperfection for any earthly thing, do therefore not fall into many, and even sins. Not willingly, indeed, because, against this, our Lord gives such persons a very special assistance. I speak of venial sins, for, as regards mortal, they are free, so far as they can understand, though not secure, since they may be guilty of some, of which they have no knowledge, and this is no small torment to them. When they think upon the souls which perish, and though they have, in some manner, great hopes of their not being of this number, yet when they remember some mentioned in holy scriptures, who seem to be particular favorites of our Lord, as Solomon, who conversed so familiarly with his majesty, they cannot help fearing. Let her amongst you, who feels the greatest security, fear the most. For, says David, Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord. If we beseech his majesty always to preserve us from offending him, this will be the greatest security we can have. May he be forever praised. Amen. It will be well, sisters, to make you acquainted with the end, for which our Lord bestows such great favors in this world. And though you might understand this by the effects, if you consider them well, yet I wish to repeat it here again to you, that so none of you may think it is only to caress such souls, which would be a great mistake, since His Majesty cannot bestow a greater favor upon us than to give us life to be spent in imitation of that which His beloved Son spent here on earth. Hence, I consider it certain that these favors are given to strengthen our weakness, that we may be able to suffer something for His sake. We have always noticed that those who have been nearest to Christ our Lord were the most afflicted, Consider what his glorious mother suffered, and the glorious apostles. How, think you, was St. Paul able to endure such great labors? In him we see what effects true visions and contemplation produce, when they come from our Lord, and not from the imagination, or deceit of the devil. When he had these visions, did he hide himself in order thereby to enjoy these delights, without applying himself to anything else? You see, as far as we can understand, he had not one day's rest, no, nor one night's, for he labored at night for his living. I am greatly delighted with St. Peter, when, as he was flying from prison, our Lord appeared to him and told him he was going to Rome to be crucified again. Whenever the office of this festival is said, in which the above words are mentioned, 
I feel a particular consolation in considering how St. Peter was affected, after having received this favor from our Lord, since it encouraged him immediately to meet death, and it was no small favor of our Lord, that St. Peter found one to put him to death. Oh, my sisters, how forgetful must that soul be of her own comfort! What little account must she make of honor, and how far is she from desiring to be esteemed in anything in whom our Lord resides in so particular a manner? If she be entirely taken up with him, as it is proper she should, she must be wholly forgetful of herself, and all her thoughts and study will be how to please this Lord, and by what means she may be able to express the love she has for him. For this object she does pray. Here too does this spiritual marriage tend, from which good works always come. This is a true sign that the favor comes from God, for it is of little advantage to be solitary, to be making acts of love and of other virtues to our Lord, proposing and promising to do wonders for His honor, if, upon leaving that place, and an occasion offers, I do quite the contrary. I spoke incorrectly when I said, it is of little advantage, for all the time which is spent with God is very profitable, and His Majesty will sometimes find us means of accomplishing these resolutions, though we may be weak in fulfilling them afterwards, and this, perhaps, to our grief, for it often happens that, when he sees a soul very cowardly, he sends her a great affliction, much against her will, but he draws her out of it with profit, and when the soul afterwards perceives this, she is not so afraid to expose herself to the like again. I wish to mention that the affliction is but little, in comparison with the greater gain which is acquired, when the works correspond with the acts and words mentioned, and that she who cannot do all at once should do it gently and by degrees. And if she wished to derive any benefit from prayer, she should also bend her will, for even in these little retired spots she will not want many occasions of exercising patience. Remember that this is much more important than I can express. Fix your eyes on your crucified Lord, and everything will seem easy to you. If His Majesty show His love for us by such wonderful works and torments, how can you desire to please Him by words only? Do you know what it is to be truly spiritual? It is to be slaves of God, those who are signed with His mark, which is that of the cross. He may sell all over the world for slaves, as He Himself was sold. For as you have already given Him your liberty, that of being His slaves will not injure you. Rather, it will be a great favor for you. But unless souls be resolved to do this, they will never improve much. For, as I said, the foundation of all this building is humility, and if this be not very sincere, our Lord will not allow the building to rise high, lest it should fall entirely to the ground. This would not be for our good. Hence, sisters, in order that your humility may be well grounded, let each one of you endeavor to be inferior to all the rest, and to become their slave, seeking how to please and to serve them, because what you do in such cases is more for your benefit than for theirs. By laying down such strong stones, the castle can never fall. I repeat, it is necessary, for this purpose, that the foundation should not consist of prayer and contemplation only, for unless you acquire virtues by the exercise of them, you will always be behind. God grant it may be merely a fault of not increasing, for you know well that, in the spiritual life, he who does not increase must decrease. I consider it impossible for love to stand still. You may imagine, perhaps, that I speak of beginners, and that these may afterwards take their rest. But I have already told you, the rest which these souls possess in their interior is given them, because they possess so very little in the exterior. For what end, think you, are these inspirations, or to speak more correctly, those aspirations and messages which the soul from her interior center sends to the people around the castle and to the other mansions, which are outside that in which she resides? Is it, do you think, that they may send themselves to sleep? No, 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 for then it excites a fiercer war, to keep the faculties, senses, and all that is corporeal, from being idle, than it did when she suffered with them, 
for then she knew not the immense benefit which afflictions bring and these perhaps have been the means employed by god to advance her so far and as the company which she enjoys gives her greater strength than ever before for if david says with the holy thou wilt be holy no doubt but that she by becoming one with the strong through so heavenly a union of spirit with spirit must needs receive strength and hence we shall find that the saints acquire their strength both for suffering and dying it is very certain that with the strength which she thence derives she assists all those within the castle and even the body itself it often seems to have no sense in it being fortified with the strength which the soul has in her and having drunk of the wine of this cellar into which her spouse has conducted her and from which he will not allow her to depart this wine diffuses itself in the weak body as the meat does which when taken diffuses its strength to the head and the whole of the body hence she has great trouble as long as she lives because however much she does her internal strength is far greater and so is the war which she wages everything that she does seems nothing to her hence we may account for the severe penances which many saints practised and particularly the glorious mary magdalene who had always been brought up amidst such delights hence that hunger which our father elias had for the honour of his god and which saint dominic and saint francis had for exciting the soul to praise him i assure you these must have endured great things through thus forgetting themselves this i wish you sisters to endeavour to obtain let us desire it and employ ourselves in prayer not in order to enjoy ourselves but to obtain the strength to serve our lord let us not beg to walk in a new way for we shall lose ourselves at a better time it would be very strange to suppose we could possess these favors from god by any other way than by that along which he himself went and all his saints never think of such a thing believe me martha and mary must go together in entertaining our lord and in order to have him always with us we must treat him well and provide food for him how could mary have entertained him in sitting always at his feet if her sister had not helped her his food is that we should strive in every possible way that souls may be saved and may praise him you may have two objections one that our lord told mary she had chosen the better part true because she had already performed the office of martha and showed great regard for our lord by washing his feet and wiping them with her hair do you think that it was a small mortification to a woman of rank as she was to go along the streets and perhaps alone for her zeal made her take no notice in what way she went and to go into a house she had never entered before then she had to endure the mortification of the pharisee and many other things besides for to behold in the city a woman such as she was makes such a change and as we know among such wicked people to whom it was sufficient only to see that she had an affection for our lord whom they so deeply hated and when they remembered her former life and how she had now desired to become a saint for it was clear she must immediately change her dress and every other vanity what would people do then when now they talk of persons who are not so remarkable as she was i tell you sisters the better part fell to her lot in the numerous afflictions and mortifications she had to endure and had there been no more than that of seeing her master so deeply hated that was an intolerable cross what then must have been those numerous crosses which she endured at the death of our lord i am convinced that the reason why she did not suffer martyrdom was because she had endured it when she saw him die and during the years she lived afterwards when she found herself absent from him this must have been a dreadful torment to her hereby may be seen that she did not always enjoy the delight of contemplation at the feet of our lord the other objection you may make is that you neither have power nor opportunity of gaining souls to god which you would very willingly do but not being authorized to instruct or preach as the apostles did you know not how to accomplish this i have answered this objection somewhere though i cannot tell whether or no i have done so in this book but because it is a matter which occupies your thoughts through the ardent desires which our lord gives you i will not hesitate to repeat what i have said i have already told you elsewhere how the desire excites within us strong desires of doing things impossible 
in order that we may leave what we have to do at present so as to serve our lord in things possible to be done and may rest satisfied with having desired those impossibilities setting aside the consideration that by prayer you can do great good do not desire to benefit every one except those who are in your company a work so much the nobler as you are so much the more indebted to them do you think the gain small that you have such great humility and mortification that you are the servant of all that you also have such great charity for them and such love for our lord that this fire inflames every one and you are continually exciting them by the practice of your other virtues your gain will be exceedingly great and your service highly pleasing to our lord and by doing this which you are able his majesty will observe your readiness to do much more if you could and he will accordingly reward you as if you had gained many souls to him you will reply this is not converting them because they are all good who has suggested this objection the better they are made by their means the more pleasing to god will their praises of him be and their prayers will be more profitable to their neighbors in a word my sisters i will conclude with this advice do not erect towers without a foundation because our lord does not pay so much regard to the greatness of the works as to the love whereby they are performed when we do what we can his majesty will make us more and more powerful every day provided we do not grow tired immediately but that during the short space of this life much shorter perhaps than any of you may imagine we offer both interiorly and exteriorly to god the sacrifice that we are able and his majesty will unite it with that which he offered to his father on the cross for us in order that it may receive such value as our affection deserves however small or trifling the work may be may his majesty grant my sisters and daughters that we may all meet together in that place where we may forever please him and may he give me grace to perform some of those things which i have mentioned to you this i beg through the merits of his son who liveth and reigneth for ever and ever i acknowledge my confusion is great and therefore through the same lord i beseech you not to forget this poor sinner in your prayers though when i began to write this discourse i felt the confusion above mentioned yet after it was finished i was exceedingly satisfied with it and i consider my trouble which i acknowledge to have been very little to be well bestowed hence considering your very strict enclosure and the few recreations my sisters which you have and the want of some conveniences that are requisite in some of our monasteries i think it will be some pleasure to you to recreate yourselves in this interior castle into which you may enter without leave of your superioress and walk there at any hour you please it is true you cannot enter into all the mansions of the castle by your own strength though you may think it very great except the lord thereof allow you to enter i wish then to advise you not to use any violence if you meet with some resistance for you may thus displease him so far as to cost you some trouble he is a great lover of humility and by considering yourselves unworthy even to enter the third mansion you will the sooner obtain his good will and favor to allow you afterwards to enter the fifth and you may serve him there in such a manner by often repairing thither that he may at length admit you into that mansion reserved for himself whence you should never depart unless you are called away by the superioress whose will this great lord wishes you to observe as punctually as his own and though by her command you may be much abroad yet when you return he will always open the door to you being once accustomed to this castle you will find rest in all things though exceedingly painful with the hope of returning there again and no one will be able to take it away from you though i have spoken only of seven mansions yet in each of these seven there are many others above below and on the sides with beautiful gardens fountains and other various delights so that you would desire even to be dissolved into the praises of that great god who created your soul to his image and likeness if you see anything in this method which helps to instruct you in the knowledge of him be assured that his majesty has said it in order to comfort and encourage you whatever you find amiss know it was spoken by myself through the great desire i have of being of some use in assisting you to serve this my lord and god i entreat you 
every time you read this book, to praise His Majesty exceedingly, and beg of Him to advance His Church, to enlighten the Lutherans, and to obtain the pardon of my sins, and deliverance from purgatory, where, perhaps, I shall be when this shall be given you, should it be published after the learned have seen it. If you meet with any error, it is because I know no better, and in everything I submit to the judgment of the Holy Roman Catholic Church, in which I live, and in which I do protest and promise I shall live and die. Praise be the Lord our God, and blessed for ever and ever. Amen. Amen. Laus Deo Semper End of The Seventh Mansion, Chapter 4 End of The Interior Castle, or The Mansions, by St. Teresa of Avila, translated by the Rev. John Dalton. This reading of Uniformity with God's Will is provided through the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, which can be found on the web at www.ccel.org. Uniformity with God's Will St. Alphonsus de Liguri Perfection is founded entirely on the love of God. Charity is the bond of perfection. And perfect love of God means the complete union of our will with God's. St. Alphonsus Translated by Thomas W. Tobin, C.S.S.R. Preface In Volume 1, Opere Ascetici de St. Alfonso M. de Liguri, Roma, 1933, Uniformity with God's Will, is included as one of the three works under the heading Lesser Works on Divine Love. There is no preface in the Italian original. However, it has been thought well to provide one here. Professor Candido M. Romano says this brochure was written probably in 1755, as appears from a letter by the saint under date of November 2, 1755, to Sister Giannastasio at Cava. Romano goes on to say, This, i.e. God's will, was for Alphonsus a theme of predilection, a theme dearest to his heart. Just as St. Ignatius stressed the greater glory of God, St. Alphonsus, in all his works, gave prominence to the greater good pleasure of God. Most likely the occasion that brought forth this treatise was the death in 1753 of Father Paul Caffaro, CSSR, at Alphonsus's confessor and director. This, i.e. God's will, was for Alphonsus a theme of predilection, a theme dearest to his heart. Just as St. Ignatius stressed the greater glory of God, St. Alphonsus, in all his works, gave prominence to the greater good pleasure of God. Most likely the occasion that brought forth this treatise was the death in 1753 of Father Paul Caffaro, C.S.S.R., St. Alphonsus' confessor and director. The death of this worthy priest deeply affected the saint, and he expressed his sentiments in a poem on God's will. The wide acclaim it received may have suggested to him the thought that a tract on the same subject would be helpful to the souls of others. If this be true, his surmise proved correct, for the appearance of his subsequent pamphlet was greeted with instant favor. Cardinal Villacourt, in his Life of St. Alphonsus, quotes long passages from this pamphlet and ends by saying, Our saint frequently read it to himself, and when his sight had failed, he arranged to have it read to him by others. This brochure bears the stamp of Alphonsian simplicity, of style, and solidity of doctrine. Moreover, the instances he cites from the lives of the saints have a gentle graciousness and contain a fragrance that is redolent of the Fioretti of St. Francis of Assisi. 
Through God's grace and Our Lady's prayers, may a diligent reading of the book bring us far along the way of perfection by the cultivation of uniformity with God's holy will. Thomas W. Tobin, CSSR, October 16, 1952. Feast of St. Gerald Mahia, CSSR. Chapter 1. Excellence of this Virtue. Perfection is founded entirely on the love of God. Charity is the bond of perfection. And perfect love of God means the complete union of our will with God's. The principal effect of love is so to unite the wills of those who love each other as to make them will the same things. It follows, then, that the more one unites his will with the divine will, the greater will be his love of God. Mortification, meditation, receiving Holy Communion, acts of fraternal charity are all certainly pleasing to God, but only when they are in accordance with his will. When they do not accord with God's will, he not only finds no pleasure in them, but he even rejects them utterly and punishes them. To illustrate, a man has two servants. One works unremittingly all day long, but according to his own devices. The other conceivably works less, but he does do what he is told. This latter, of course, is going to find favor in the eyes of his master. The other will not. Now, in applying this example, we may ask, why should we perform actions for God's glory if they are not going to be acceptable to him? God does not want sacrifices. The prophet Samuel told King Saul, but he does want obedience to his will. Doth the Lord desire holocausts and victims, and not rather that the voice of the Lord should be obeyed? For obedience is better than sacrifices, and to hearken rather than to offer the fat of rams, because it is like the sin of witchcraft to rebel, and like the crime of idolatry to refuse to obey. The man who follows his own will independently of God's is guilty of a kind of idolatry. Instead of adoring God's will, he in a certain sense, adores his own. The greatest glory we can give to God is to do his will in everything. Our Redeemer came on earth to glorify his heavenly Father and to teach us, by his example, how to do the same. St. Paul represents him saying to his eternal Father, Sacrifice and obligation, thou wouldst not, but a body Thou hast fitted to me. Then said I, Behold, I come to do thy will, O God. Thou hast refused the victims offered thee by man. Thou dost will that I sacrifice my body to thee. Behold me ready to do thy will. Our Lord frequently declared that he had come on earth not to do his own will, but solely that of his Father. I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. He spoke in the same strain in the garden when he went forth to meet his enemies, who had come to seize him and to lead him to death. But that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father hath given me commandment, so do I. Arise, let us go hence. Furthermore, he said he would recognize as his brother him who would do his will. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother. To do God's will, this was the goal upon which the saints constantly fixed their gaze. They were fully persuaded that in this consists the entire perfection of the soul. Blessed Henry Suso used to say, It is not God's will that we should abound in spiritual delights, but that in all things we should submit to his holy will. Those who give themselves to prayer, says St. Teresa, should concentrate solely on this, 
the conformity of their wills to the divine will. They should be convinced that this constitutes their highest perfection. The more fully they practice this, the greater the gifts they will receive from God, and the greater the progress they will make in the interior life. A certain Dominican nun was vouchsafed a vision of heaven one day. She recognized there are some persons she had known during their mortal life on earth. It was told her these souls were raised to the sublime heights of the seraphs on account of the uniformity of their wills with that of God's during their lifetime here on earth. Blessed Henry Suzo, mentioned above, said of himself, I would rather be the vilest worm on earth by God's will than be a seraph by my own. During our sojourn in this world, we should learn from the saints now in heaven how to love God. The pure and perfect love of God they enjoy there consists in uniting themselves perfectly to his will. It would be the greatest delight of the seraphs to pile up sand on the seashore or to pull weeds in the garden for all eternity if they found out such was God's will. Our Lord himself teaches us to ask to do the will of God on earth as the saints do it in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because David fulfilled all his wishes, God called him a man after his own heart. I have found David, a man according to my own heart, who shall do all my wills. David was always ready to embrace the divine will, as he frequently protested, My heart is ready, O God, my heart is ready. He asked God for one thing alone, to teach him to do his will. Teach me to do thy will. A single act of uniformity with the divine will suffices to make a saint. Behold, while Saul was persecuting the church, God enlightened him and converted him. What does Saul do? What does he say? Nothing else but to offer himself to do God's will. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? In return, the Lord calls him a vessel of election and an apostle of the Gentiles. This man is to me a vessel of election to carry my name before the Gentiles. Absolutely true, because he who gives his will to God gives him everything. He who gives his goods in alms, his blood in scourgings, his food in fasting, gives God what he has. But he who gives God his will, gives himself, gives everything he is. Such a one can say, Though I am poor, Lord, I give thee all I possess. But when I say I give thee my will, I have nothing left to give thee. This is just what God does require of us. My son, give me thy heart. St. Augustine's comment is, There is nothing more pleasing we can offer God than to say to him, Possess thyself of us. We cannot offer God anything more pleasing than to say, Take us, Lord. We give thee our entire will. Only let us know thy will and we will carry it out. If we would completely rejoice the heart of God, let us strive in all things to conform ourselves to his divine will. Let us not only strive to conform ourselves, but also to unite ourselves to whatever dispositions God makes of us. Conformity signifies that we join our wills to the will of God. Uniformity means more. It means that we make one will of God's will and ours, so that we will only what God wills, that God's will alone is our will. This is the summit of perfection, and to it we should always aspire. 
This should be the goal of all our works, desires, meditations, and prayers. To this, we should always invoke the aid of our holy patrons, our guardian angels, and above all, of our Mother Mary, most perfect of all the saints, because she most perfectly embraced the divine will. Chapter 2. Uniformity in all things. The essence of perfection is to embrace the will of God in all things, prosperous or adverse. In prosperity, even sinners find it easy to unite themselves to the divine will, but it takes saints to unite themselves to God's will when things go wrong and are painful to self-love. Our conduct in such instances is the measure of our love of God. St. John of Avila used to say, One, blessed be God, in times of adversity is worth more than a thousand acts of gratitude in times of prosperity. Furthermore, we must unite ourselves to God's will not only in things that come to us directly from his hands, such as sickness, desolation, poverty, death of relatives, but likewise in those we suffer from man, for example, contempt, injustice, loss of reputation, loss of temporal goods, and all kinds of persecution. On these occasions, we must remember that whilst God does not will the sin, he does will our humiliation, our poverty, or our mortification, as the case may be. It is certain and of faith that whatever happens, happens by the will of God. I am the Lord, forming the light and creating the darkness, making peace and creating evil. From God come all things, good as well as evil. We call adversities evil. Actually, they are good and meritorious when we receive them as coming from God's hands. Shall there be evil in a city which the Lord hath not done? Good things and evil, life and death, poverty and riches are from God. It is true, when one offends us unjustly, God does not will his sin nor does he concur in the sinner's bad will. But God does, in a general way, concur in the material action by which such a one strikes us, robs us, or does us an injury, so that God certainly wills the offense we suffer, and it comes to us from his hands. Thus the Lord told David he would be the author of those things he would suffer at the hands of Absalom. I will raise up evils against thee out of thy own house, and I will take thy wives before thy face and give them to thy neighbor. Hence, too, God told the Jews that in punishment for their sins, he would send the Assyrians to plunder them and spread destruction among them. The Assyrian is the rod and staff of my anger. I will send him to take away the spoils. Assyrian wickedness served as God's scourge for the Hebrews. Is St. Augustine's comment on this text? And our Lord himself told St. Peter that his sacred passion came not so much from man as from his Father. The chalice by which the Father hath given me, shall I not drink it? When the messenger came to announce to Job that the Sabians had plundered his goods and slain his children, he said, The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. He did not say, The Lord hath given me my children and my possessions, and the Sabians have taken them away. He realized that adversity had come upon him by the will of God. Therefore he added, As it hath pleased the Lord, so is it done. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We must not therefore consider the afflictions that come upon us as happening by chance or solely from the malice of men. We should be convinced that what happens, happens by the will of God. Apropos of this, it is related that two martyrs, Epictetus and Atho, being put to the torture by having their bodies raked with iron hooks, 
and burnt with flaming torches, kept repeating, Work thy will upon us, O Lord. Arrived at the place of execution, they exclaimed, Eternal God, be thou blessed, in that thy will has been entirely accomplished in us. Caesarius points up what we have been saying by offering this incident in the life of a certain monk. Externally, his religious observance was the same as that of the other monks, but he had attained such sanctity that the mere touch of his garments healed the sick. Marveling at these deeds, since his life was no more exemplary than the lives of the other monks, the superior asked him one day what was the cause of these miracles. He replied that he too was mystified and was at a loss how to account for such happenings. What devotions do you practice? asked the abbot. He answered that there was little or nothing special that he did beyond making a great deal of willing only that God willed, and that God had given him the grace of abandoning his will totally to the will of God. Prosperity does not lift me up, nor adversity cast me down, added the monk. I direct all my prayers to the end, that God's will may be done fully in me and by me. That raid that our enemies made against the monastery the other day, in which our stores were plundered, our granaries put to the torch, and our cattle driven off? Did not this misfortune cause you any resentment? queried the abbot. No, father, came the reply. On the contrary, I return thanks to God, as is my custom in such circumstances, fully persuaded that God does all things, or permits all that happens for his glory, and for our greater good. Thus I am always at peace, no matter what happens. Seeing such uniformity with the will of God, the abbot no longer wondered why the monk worked so many miracles. Chapter 3. Happiness Deriving from Perfect Uniformity Acting according to this pattern, one not only becomes holy, but also enjoys perpetual serenity in this life. Alphonsus the Great, King of Aragon, being asked one day whom he considered the happiest person in the world, answered, He who abandons himself to the will of God and accepts all things, prosperous and adverse, as coming from his hands. To those that love God, all things work together unto good. Those who love God are always happy, because their whole happiness is to fulfill, even in adversity, the will of God. Afflictions do not mar their serenity, because by accepting misfortunes, they know they give pleasure to their beloved Lord. Whatever shall befall the just man, it shall not make him sad. Indeed, what can be more satisfactory to a person than to experience the fulfillment of all his desires? This is the happy lot of the man who wills only what God wills, because everything that happens, save sin, happens through the will of God. There is a story to this effect in the lives of the fathers, about a farmer whose crops were more plentiful than those of his neighbors. On being asked how this happened, with such unvarying regularity, he said that he was not surprised, because he always had the kind of weather he wanted. He was asked to explain. He said, it is so because I want whatever kind of weather God wants, and because I do, he gives me the harvest I want. If souls resigned to God's will are humiliated, says Salvian, they want to be humiliated. If they are poor, they want to be poor. In short, whatever happens is acceptable to them, hence they are truly at peace in this life, in cold and heat, in rain and wind. The soul united to God says, I want it to be warm, to be cold, windy, to rain, because God wills it. This is the beautiful freedom of the sons of God, and it is worth vastly more than all the rank and distinction of blood and birth, more than all the kingdoms in the world. This is the abiding peace which, 
in the experience of the saints surpasseth all understanding. It surpasses all pleasures rising from gratification of the senses, from social gatherings, banquets, and other worldly amusements. Vain and deceiving as they are, they captivate the senses for the time being. But being no lasting contentment, rather they afflict man in the depth of his soul where alone true peace can reside. Solomon, who tasted to satiety all the pleasures of the world and found them bitter, voiced his disillusionment thus. But this also is vanity and vexation of spirit. A fool says the Holy Spirit is changed as the moon, but a holy man continueth in wisdom as the sun. The fool, that is the sinner, is as changeable as the moon, which today waxes and tomorrow wanes. Today he laughs, tomorrow he cries. Today he is meek as a lamb, tomorrow cross as a bear. Why? Because his peace of mind depends on the prosperity or the adversity he meets. He changes with the changes in the things that happen to him. The just man is like the sun, constant in his serenity, no matter what betides him. His calmness of soul is founded on his union with the will of God. Hence he enjoys unruffled peace. This is the peace promised by the angel of the nativity, and on earth peace to men of good will. Who are these men of good will, if not those who wills are united to the infinity good and perfect will of God? the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. By uniting themselves to the divine will, the saints have enjoyed paradise by anticipation in this life. Accustoming themselves to receive all things from the hands of God, says St. Dorotheus, the men of old maintained continual serenity of soul. St. Mary Magdalene of Pazzi derives such consolation at hearing the words will of God that she usually fell into an ecstasy of love. The instances of jangling irritation that are bound to arise will not fail to make surface impact on the senses. This, however, will be experienced only in the inferior part of the soul. In the superior part will reign peace and tranquility as long as our will remains united with God's. Our Lord assured his apostles, Your joy no man shall take from you. Your joy shall be full. He who unites his will to God's experiences a full and lasting joy, full because he has what he wants, as was explained above, lasting because no one can take his joy from him, since no one can prevent what God wills from happening. The devout father John Toller relates his personal experience. For years he had prayed God to send him someone who would teach him the real spiritual life. One day at prayer, he heard a voice saying, Go to such and such a church and you will have the answer to your prayers. He went, and at the door of the church he found a beggar, barefooted and in rags. He greeted the mendicant saying, Good day, my friend. Thank you, sir, for your kind wishes, but I do not recall ever having had a bad day. Then God was certainly given you a very happy life. That is very true, sir. I have never been unhappy. In saying this, I am not making any rash statement either. This is the reason. When I have nothing to eat, I give thanks to God. When it rains or snows, I bless God's providence. When someone insults me, drives me away, or otherwise mistreats me, I give glory to God. I said I've never had an unhappy day, and it's the truth, because I am accustomed to the will unreservedly what God wills. Whatever happens to me, sweet or bitter, I gladly receive from his hands as what is best for me. Hence, my unvarying happiness. Where did you find God? 
I found him where I left creatures. Who are you, anyway? I am a king. And where is your kingdom? In my soul, where everything is in good order, where the passions obey reason, and reason obeys God. How have you come to such a state of perfection? By silence. I practice silence towards men, while I cultivate the habit of speaking with God. Conversing with God is the way I found and maintain my peace of soul. Union with God brought this poor beggar to the very heights of perfection. In his poverty he was richer than the mightiest monarch. In his sufferings he was vastly happier than worldlings amid their worldly delights. Chapter 4 God Wills Our Good Oh, the supreme folly of those who resist the divine will! In God's providence, no one can escape hardship. Who resisteth his will? A person who rails at God in adversity suffers without merit. Moreover, by his lack of resignation, he adds to his punishment in the next life and experiences greater disquietude of mind in this life. Who resisteth him and hath had peace? The screaming rage of the sick man in his pain the whining complaints of the poor man in his destitution. What will they avail these people except increase their unhappiness and bring them no relief? Little man, says St. Augustine, grow up. What are you seeking in your search for happiness? Seek the one good that embraces all others. Whom do you seek, friend, if you seek not God? Seek him, find him, cleave to him, Bind your will to his with bands of steel, and you will live always at peace in this life and in the next. God wills only our good. God loves us more than anybody else can or does love us. His will is that no one should lose his soul, that everyone should save and sanctify his soul, not willing that any should perish, but that all should return to penance. This is the will of God, your sanctification. God has made the attainment of our happiness his glory, since he is, by his nature, infinite goodness. And since, as St. Leo says, goodness is diffusive of itself, God has a supreme desire to make us sharers of his goods and of his happiness. If then he sends us sufferings in this life, it is for our own good. All things work together unto good. Even chastisements come to us, not to crush us, but to make us mend our ways and save our souls. Let us believe that these scourges of the Lord have happened for our amendment and not for our destruction. God surrounds us with his loving care, lest we suffer eternal damnation. O Lord, thou hast crowned us as with a shield of thy good will. He is most solicitous for our welfare. The Lord is so solicitous for me. What can God deny us when he has given us his own Son? He that spared not even his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how hath he not also with him given us all things? Therefore we should most confidently abandon ourselves to all the dispositions of divine providence, since they are for our own good. In all that happens to us, let us say, in peace, in the self-same I will sleep, and I will rest, because thou, O Lord, hast singularly settled me in hope. Let us place ourselves unreservedly in his hands, because he will not fail to have care of us, casting all your care upon him, for he hath care of you. Let us keep God in our thoughts and carry out his will, and he will think of us and of our welfare. Our Lord said to St. Catherine of Siena, Daughter, 
Think of me, and I will always think of you. Let us often repeat with the spouse in the canticle, My beloved to me, and I to him. St. Niles, Abbot, used to say that our petitions should be, not that our wishes be done, but that God's holy will should be fulfilled in us and by us. When, therefore, something adverse happens to us, let us accept it from his hands, not only patiently, but even with gladness, as did the apostles, who went from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were accounted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. What greater consolation can come to a soul than to know that by patiently bearing some tribulation, it gives God the greatest pleasure in its power? Spiritual writers tell us that though the desire of certain souls to please God by their sufferings is acceptable to Him, still more pleasing to Him is the union of certain others with His will, so that their will is neither to rejoice nor to suffer, but to hold themselves completely amenable to His will and they desire only that his holy will be fulfilled. If, devout soul, it is your will to please God and live a life of serenity in this world, unite yourself always and in all things to the divine will. Reflect that all the sins of your past wicked life happened because you wandered from the path of God's will. For the future, embrace God's good pleasure and say to him in every happening, Yea, Father, for so it hath seemed good in thy sight. When anything disagreeable happens, remember it comes from God, and say at once, This comes from God, and be at peace. I was dumb and opened not my mouth, because thou hast done it. Lord, Since thou hast done this, I will be silent and accept it. Direct all your thoughts and prayers to this end, to beg God constantly in meditation, communion, and visits to the Blessed Sacrament, that he help you accomplish his holy will. From the habit of offering yourself frequently to God by saying, My God, behold me in thy presence. Do with me and all that I have as thou pleasest. This was the constant practice of St. Teresa. At least fifty times a day she offered herself to God, placing herself at his entire disposition and good pleasure. How fortunate you, kind reader, if you too act thus. You will surely become a saint. Your life will be calm and peaceful. Your death will be happy. At death, all our hope of salvation will come from the testimony of our conscience as to whether or not we are dying resigned to God's will. If, during life, we have embraced everything as coming from God's hands, and if at death we embrace death in fulfillment of God's holy will, we shall certainly save our souls and die the death of saints. Let us then abandon everything to God's good pleasure, because being infinitely wise, he knows what is best for us. And being all good and all loving, having given his life for us, he wills what is best for us. Let us, as St. Basil counsels us, rest secure in the conviction that beyond the possibility of a doubt, God works to affect our welfare infinitely better than we could ever hope to accomplish or to desire it ourselves. Chapter 5. Special Practices of Uniformity Let us now take up in a practical way the consideration of those matters in which we should unite ourselves to God's will. 1. In external matters. In times of great heat, cold, or rain, in times of famine, epidemics, and similar occasions, we should refrain from expressions like these. What unbearable heat! What piercing cold! What a tragedy! In these instances, we should avoid expressions indicating opposition to God's will. 
We should want things to be just as they are, because it is God who thus disposes them. An incident in point would be this one. Late one night, St. Francis Borgia arrived unexpectedly at a Jesuit house in a snowstorm. He knocked and knocked on the door, but all to no purpose, because the community, being asleep, no one heard him. When morning came, all were embarrassed for the discomfort he had experienced by having had to spend the night in the open. The saint, however, said he had enjoyed the greatest consolation during those long hours of the night by imagining that he saw our Lord up in the sky dropping the snowflakes down upon him. 2. In Personal Matters In matters that affect us personally, let us acquiesce in God's will. For example, in hunger, thirst, poverty, Desolation, loss of reputation, let us always say, Do thou build up or tear down, O Lord, as seems good in thy sight. I am content. I wish only what thou dost wish. Thus too, says Rodriguez, should we act when the devil proposes certain hypothetical cases to us in order to wrest a sinful consent from us or at least to cause us to be interiorly disturbed. For example, what would you say or what would you do if someone were to say or do such and such a thing to you? Let us dismiss the temptation by saying, by God's grace, I would say or do what God would want me to say or do. Thus we shall free ourselves from imperfection and harassment. 3. Let us not lament if we suffer from some natural defect of body or mind, from poor memory, slowness of understanding, little ability, lameness, or general bad health. What claim have we, or what obligation is God under, to give us a more brilliant mind or a more robust body? Who has ever offered a gift and then lays down the conditions upon which he will accept it? Let us thank God for what, in his pure goodness, he has given us, and let us be content, too, with the manner in which he has given it to us. Who knows? Perhaps if God had given us greater talent, better health, a more personable appearance, we might have lost our souls. Great talent and knowledge have caused many to be puffed up with the idea of their own importance, and, in their pride, they have despised others. How easily those who have these gifts fall into grave danger to their salvation. How many on account of physical beauty or robust health have plunged headlong into a life of debauchery. How many, on the contrary, who, by reason of poverty, infirmity, or physical deformity, have become saints and have saved their souls, who, given health, wealth, or physical attractiveness, had else lost their souls. Let us then be content with what God has given us. But one thing is necessary, and it is not beauty, not health, not talent. It is the salvation of our immortal souls. 4. It is especially necessary that we be resigned in corporal infirmities. We should willingly embrace them in the manner and for the length of time that God wills. We ought to make use of the ordinary remedies in time of sickness, such as God's will. But if they are not effective, let us unite ourselves to God's will, and this will be better for us than would be our restoration to health. Let us say, Lord, I wish neither to be well nor to remain sick. I want only what thou wilt. Certainly, it is more virtuous not to repine in times of painful illness. Still and all, when our sufferings are excessive, it is not wrong to let our friends know what we are enduring, and also to ask God to free us from our sufferings. Let it be understood, however, that the sufferings here referred to are actually excessive. It often happens that some, on the occasion of a slight illness or even a slight indisposition, want the whole world to stand still and sympathize with them in their illnesses. 
But where it is a case of real suffering, we have the example of our Lord, who, at the approach of his bitter passion, made known his state of soul to his disciples, saying, My soul is sorrowful, even unto death. And besought his eternal Father to deliver him from it. Father, if it be possible, let this chalice pass from me. But our Lord likewise taught us what we should do when we have made such a petition, when he added, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. How childish the pretense of those who protest they wish for health not to escape suffering, but to serve our Lord better by being able to observe their rule, to serve their community, go to church, receive communion, do penance, study, work for souls in the confessional and the pulpit. Devout soul, tell me, why do you desire to do these things, to please God? Why then search any further to please God when you are sure God does not wish these prayers, communions, penances, or studies, but he does wish that you suffer patiently this sickness he sends you? Unite then your sufferings to those of our Lord. But, you say, I do not want to be sick, for then I am useless, a burden to my order, to my monastery? But if you are united to and resigned to God's will, you will realize that your superiors are likewise resigned to the dispositions of design, divine providence and that they recognize the fact that you are a burden, not through indolence, but by the will of God. Ah, how often these desires and these laments are born, not of the love of God, but of the love of self. How many of them are so many pretexts for fleeing the will of God? Do we want to please God? When we find ourselves confined to our sickbed, let us utter this one prayer, Thy will be done. Let us repeat it time and time again, and it will please God more than all our mortifications and devotions. There is no better way to serve God than cheerfully to embrace His holy will. St. John of Avila once wrote to a sick priest, My dear friend, do not weary yourself planning what you would do if you were well, but be content to be sick for as long as God wishes. If you are seeking to carry out God's will, what difference should it make to you whether you are sick or well? The saint was perfectly right, for God is glorified not by our works, but by our resignation to and by our union with his holy will. In this respect, St. Francis de Sales used to say, we serve God better by our sufferings than by our actions. Many times it will happen that proper medical attention or effective remedies will be lacking, or even that the doctor will not rightly diagnose our case. In such instances, we must unite ourselves to the divine will which thus disposes of our physical health. The story is told of a client of St. Thomas of Canterbury, who, being sick, went to the saint's tomb to obtain a cure. He returned home cured. But when he thought to himself, suppose it would be better for my soul's salvation if I remain sick, what point then is there in being well? In this frame of mind, he went back and asked the saint to intercede with God that he grant what would be best for his eternal salvation. His illness returned, and he was perfectly content with the turn of things had taken, being fully persuaded that God had thus disposed of him for his own good. There is a similar account by Surio to the effect that a certain blind man obtained the restoration of his sight by praying to St. Bedasto, bishop. Thinking the matter over, he prayed again to his heavenly patron, but this time with the purpose that if the possession of his sight were not expedient for his soul, that his blindness should return. And that is exactly what happened. He was blind again. Therefore, in sickness... 
It is better that we seek neither sickness nor health, but that we abandon ourselves to the will of God so that he may dispose of us as he wishes. However, if we decide to ask for health, let us do so at least always resigned and with the proviso that our bodily health may be conductive to the health of our soul. Otherwise, our prayer will be defective and will remain unheard because our Lord does not answer prayers made without resignation to his holy will. Sickness is the acid test of spirituality because it discloses whether our virtue is real or sham. If the soul is not agitated, does not break out in lamentations, is not fervishly relentless in seeking a cure, but instead is submissive to the doctors and to superiors, is serene and tranquil, completely resigned to God's will, it is a sign that soul is well grounded in virtue. What of the whiner who complains of lack of attention? That his sufferings are beyond endurance? That the doctor does not know his business? What of the faint-hearted soul who laments that the hand of God is too heavy upon him? This story by St. Bonaventure in his Life of St. Francis is in point. On a certain occasion when the saint was suffering extraordinary physical pain, one of his religious, meaning to sympathize with him, said in his simplicity, My father, pray God that he treat you a little more gently, for this hand seems heavy upon you just now. Hearing this, St. Francis strongly resented the unhappy remark of his well-meaning brother, saying, My good brother, did I not know that what you have just said was spoken in all simplicity? Without realizing the implication of your words, I should never see you again because of your rashness in passing judgment on the dispositions of divine providence. Whereupon, weak and wasted, as he was by his illness, he got out of bed, knelt down, kissed the floor, and prayed thus, Lord, I thank thee for the sufferings thou art sending me. Send me more. If it be thy good pleasure, my pleasure is that you afflict me and spare me not, for the fulfillment of thy holy will is the greatest consolation of my life. Chapter 6. Spiritual Desolation We ought to view in the light of God's holy will the loss of persons who are helpful to us in a spiritual or material way. Pious souls often frail in this respect by not being resigned to the disposition of God's holy will. Our sanctification comes fundamentally and essentially from God, not from spiritual directors. When God sends us a spiritual director, he wishes us to use him for our spiritual profit. But if he takes him away, he wants us to remain calm and unperturbed and to increase our confidence in his goodness by saying to him, Lord, thou hast given me this help, and now thou dost take it away. Blessed be thy holy will. I beg thee, teach me what I must do to serve thee. In this manner, too, we should receive whatever other crosses God sends us. But, you reply, these sufferings are really punishments? The answer to that remark is, are not the punishments God sends us in this life also graces and benefits? Our offenses against God must be atoned for somehow, either in this life or in the next. Hence, we should all make St. Augustine's prayer our own. Lord, hear, cut, hear, burn, hear, spare me not, but spare me in eternity. Let us say with Job, let this be my comfort, that afflicting me with sorrow, he spare not. Having merited hell for our sins, we should be consoled that God chastises us in this life, and animate ourselves to look upon such treatment as a pledge that God wishes to spare us in the next. When God send us, sends us punishments, let us say with the high priest Healy, it is the Lord. 
Let him do what is good in his sight. The time of spiritual desolation is also a time for being resigned. When a soul begins to cultivate the spiritual life, God usually showers his consolations upon her to wean her away from the world. But when he sees her making solid progress, he withdraws his hand to test her and to see if she will love and serve him without the reward of sensible consolations. In this life, as St. Teresa used to say, our lot is not to enjoy God, but to do his holy will. And again, love of God does not consist in experiencing his tendernesses, but in serving him with resolution and humility. And in yet another place, God's true lovers are discovered in times of aridity and temptation. Let the soul thank God when she experiences his loving endearments, but let her not repine when she finds herself left in desolation. It is important to lay great stress on this point, because some souls, beginners in the spiritual life, finding themselves in spiritual aridity, think God has abandoned them, or that the spiritual life is not for them. Thus, they give up the practice of prayer and lose what they have previously gained. The time of aridity is the best time to practice resignation to God's holy will. I do not say you will feel no pain in seeing yourself deprived of the sensible presence of God. It is impossible for the soul not to feel it and lament over it. When even our Lord cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In her sufferings, however, the soul should always be resigned to God's will. The saints have all experienced desolations and abandonment of soul. How impervious to things spiritual my heart, cries St. Bernard. No savor in pious reading, no pleasure in meditation, nor in prayer. For the most part, it has been the common lot of the saints to encounter aridities. Sensible consolations were the exceptions. Such things are rare occurrences granted to untried souls so that they may not halt on the road to sanctity. The real delights and happiness that will constitute their reward are reserved for heaven. This earth is a place of merit, which is acquired by suffering. Heaven is a place of reward and happiness. Hence, in this life, the saints neither desired nor sought the joys of sensible fervor, but rather the fervor of the spirit toughened in the crucible of suffering. Oh, how much better it is, says St. John of Avila, to endure aridity and temptation by God's will than to be raised to the heights of contemplation without God's will. But you say you would gladly endure desolation if you were certain that it comes from God. But you are tortured by the anxiety that your desolation comes by your own fault and is a punishment for your tepidity. Very well. Let us suppose you are right. Then get rid of your tepidity and exercise more diligence in the affairs of your soul. But because you are possibly experiencing spiritual darkness... Are you going to get all wrought up, give up prayer, and thus make things twice as bad as they are? Let us assume that this aridity is a punishment for your tepidity. Was it not God who sent it? Accept your desolation as your just deserts, and unite yourself to God's holy will. Did you not say that you merited hell, and now you are complaining? Perhaps you think God should send you consolations. Away with such ideas and be patient under God's hand. Take up your prayers again and continue to walk in the way you have entered upon. For the future, fear lest such laments come from too little humility and too little resignation to the will of God. Therefore, be resigned and say, Lord, I accept this punishment from thy hands, and I accept it for as long as it pleases thee. If it be thy will that I should be thus afflicted for all eternity, I am satisfied. 
Such a prayer, though hard to make, will be far more advantageous to you than the sweetest sensible consolations. It is well to remember, however, that aridity is not always a chastisement. At times it is a disposition of divine providence for our greater spiritual profit and to keep us humble. Lest St. Paul become vain on account of the spiritual gifts he had received, the Lord permitted him to be tempted to impurity. And lest the greatness of the revelations should exalt me, there was given me a sting of my flesh, an angel of Satan, to buffet me. Prayer made amid sensible devotion is not much of an achievement. There is a friend, a companion at the table, and he will not abide in the day of distress. You would not consider the casual guest at your table a friend, but only him who assists you in your need without thought of benefit to himself. When God sends spiritual darkness and desolation, his true friends are known. Palladius, the author of the lives of the fathers of the desert, experiencing great disgust in prayer, went seeking advice from the abbot Macarius. The saintly abbot gave him this counsel. When you are tempted in times of dryness to give up praying because you seem to be wasting your time, say, since I cannot pray, I will be satisfied just to remain on watch here in my cell for the love of Jesus Christ. Devout soul, you do the same when you are tempted to give up prayer just because you seem to be getting nowhere. Say, I am going to stay here just to please God. St. Francis de Sales used to say that if we do nothing else but banish distractions and temptations in our prayers, the prayer is well made. Taller states that persevering in prayer in time of dryness will receive greater grace than prayer made amid great sensible devotion. Rodriguez cites the case of a person who persevered 40 years in prayer despite aridity and experienced great spiritual strength as a result of it. On occasion, when through aridity he would omit meditation, he felt spiritually weak and incapable of good deeds. St. Bonaventure and Gerson both say that persons who do not experience the recollection they would like to have in their meditations often serve God better than they would do if they did have it. The reason is that the lack of recollection keeps them more diligent and humble. Otherwise, they would become puffed up with spiritual pride and grow tepid, vainly believing they had reached the summit of sanctity. What has been said of dryness holds true of temptations also. Certainly we should strive to avoid temptations, but if God wishes that we be tempted against faith, purity, or any other virtue, we should not give in to discouraging lamentations, but submit ourselves with resignation to God's holy will. St. Paul asked to be freed from temptations to impurity, and our Lord answered him, saying, My grace is sufficient for thee. So should we act when we find ourselves victims of unrelenting temptations and God seemingly deaf to our prayers? Let us then say, Lord, do with me. Let happen to me what thou wilt. Thy grace is sufficient for me. Only never let me lose this grace. Consent to temptation, not temptation of itself, can make us lose the grace of God. Temptation resisted keeps us humble, brings us greater merit, makes us have frequent recourse to God, thus preserving us from offending Him and unites us more closely to Him in the bonds of His holy love. Finally, we should be united to God's will in regard to the time and manner of our death. One day, St. Gertrude, while climbing up a small hill, lost her footing and fell into a ravine below. After her companions had come to her assistance, they asked her if, while falling, she had any fear of dying without the sacraments. 
I earnestly hope and desire to have the benefit of the sacraments when death is at hand. Still, to my way of thinking, the will of God is more important. I believe that the best disposition I could have to die a happy death would be to submit myself to whatever God would wish in my regard. For this reason I desire whatever kind of death God will be pleased to send me. In his dialogues, St. Gregory tells of a certain priest, Santolo by name, who was captured by the Vandals and condemned to death. The barbarians told him to choose the manner of his death. He refused, saying, I am in God's hands, and I gladly accept whatever kind of death he wishes me to suffer at your hands. I wish no other. This reply was so pleasing to God that he miraculously stayed the hand of the executioner, ready to behead him. The barbarians were so impressed by the miracle that they freed their prisoner. As regards the manner of our death, therefore, we should esteem that the best kind of death for us is that which God has designed for us. When, therefore, we think of our death, let our prayer be, O Lord, only let me save my soul, and I leave the manner of my death to Thee. We should likewise unite ourselves to God's will when the moment of death is near. What else is this earth but a prison where we suffer and where we are in constant danger of losing God? Hence David prayed, Bring my soul out of prison. St. Teresa, too, feared to lose God, and when she would hear the striking of the clock, she would find consolation in the thought that the passing of the hour was an hour less of the danger of losing God. St. John Avila was convinced that every right-minded person should desire death on account of living in peril of losing divine grace. What can be more pleasant or desirable than by dying a good death, to have the assurance of no longer being able to lose the grace of God? Perhaps you will answer that you have as yet done nothing to deserve this reward. If it were God's will that your life should end now, what would you be doing? Living on here against his will? Who knows? You might fall into sin and be lost. Even if you escaped mortal sin, you could not live free from all sin. Why are we so tenacious of life? exclaimed St. Bernard. When the longer we live, the more we sin. A single venial sin is more displeasing to God than all the good works we can perform. Moreover, the person who has little desire for heaven shows he has little love for God. The true lover desires to be with his beloved. We cannot see God while we remain here on earth. Hence the saints have yearned for death, so that they might go and behold their beloved Lord face to face. Oh, that I might die and behold thy beautiful face, sighed St. Augustine. And St. Paul, having a desire to be dissolved and to be with Christ, when shall I come and appear before the face of God, exclaimed the psalmist. A hunter one day heard the voice of a man singing most sweetly in the forest. Following the sound, he came upon a leper horribly disfigured by the ravages of his disease. Addressing him, he said, How can you sing when you are so terribly afflicted and your death is so near at hand? And the leper, Friend, my poor body is a crumbling wall, and it is the only thing that separates me from my God. When it falls, I shall go forth to God. Time for me is indeed fast running out, so every day I show my happiness by lifting my voice in song. Lastly, we should unite ourselves with the will of God as regards our degree of grace and glory. True, we should esteem the things that make for the glory of God, but we should show the greatest esteem for those that concern the will of God. We should desire to love God more than the seraphs, but not to a degree higher than God has destined for us. St. John Avila says, I believe every saint has had the desire to be higher in grace than he actually was. However, despite this, 
Their serenity of soul always remained unruffled. Their desire for a greater degree of grace sprang not from a consideration of their own good, but of God's. They were content with the degree of grace God meted out for them, though actually God had given them less. They considered it a greater sign of true love of God to be content with what God had given them than to desire to have received more. This means, as Rodriguez explains it, we should be diligent in striving to become perfect so that tepidity and laziness may not serve as excuses for some to say, God must help me. I can do only so much for myself. Nevertheless, when we do fall into some fault, we should not lose our peace of soul and union with the will of God, which permits our fall, nor should we lose our courage. Let us rise at once from this fall, penitently humbling ourselves, and by seeking greater help from God, let us continue to march resolutely on the highway of the spiritual life. Likewise, we may well desire to be among the seraphs in heaven, not for our own glory, but for God's, and to love him more. Still, we should be resigned to his will and be content with that degree of glory which in his mercy he has set for us. It would be a serious defect to desire the gifts of supernatural prayer, specifically ecstasies, visions, and revelations. The masters of the spiritual life say that souls thus favored by God should ask him to take them away so that they may love him out of pure faith, a way of greater security. Many have come to perfection without these supernatural gifts. The only virtues worthwhile are those that draw the soul to holiness of life, namely, the virtue of uniformity with God's holy will. If God does not wish to raise us to the heights of perfection and glory, let us unite ourselves in all things to his holy will, asking him in his mercy to grant us our soul's salvation. If we act in this manner, the reward will not be slight, which we shall receive from the hands of God who loves above all others, souls resigned to his holy will. Chapter 7. Conclusion. Finally, we should consider the events which are happening to us now and which will happen to us in the future as coming from the hands of God. Everything we do should be directed to this one end, to do the will of God and to do it solely for the reason that God wills it. To walk more securely on this road, we must depend on the guidance of our superiors in external matters and our directors in internal matters, to learn from them God's will in our regard, having great faith in the words of our Lord, He that heareth you heareth me. Above all, let us bend all our energies to serve God in the ways he wishes. This remark is made so that we may avoid the mistake of him who wastes his time in idle daydreaming. Such a one says, If I were to become a hermit, I would become a saint. Or, if I were to enter a monastery, I would practice penance. Or, if I were to go away from here, leaving friends and companions, I would devote long hours to prayer. If, 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 all these ifs. In the meantime, such a person goes from bad to worse. These idle fantasies are often temptations of the devil because they are not in accord with God's will. Hence, we should dismiss them summarily and rouse ourselves to serve God only in that way which he has marked out for us. Doing his holy will, we shall certainly become holy in those surroundings in which he has placed us. Let us will always and ever only what God wills, for so doing he will press us to his heart. 
To this end, let us familiarize ourselves with certain texts of sacred scripture that invite us to unite ourselves constantly with the divine will. Lord, what wilt thou have me do? Tell me, my God, what thou wilt have me do, that I may will it also, with all my heart. I am thine, save thou me. I am no longer my own, I am thine, O Lord. Do with me as thou wilt. If some particularly crashing misfortune comes upon us, for example, the death of a relative, loss of goods, let us say, Yea, Father, for so it hath seemed good in thy sight. Yes, my God and my Father, so be it, for such is thy good pleasure. Above all, let us cherish that prayer of our Lord, which he himself taught us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Lord bade St. Catherine of Genoa to make a notable pause at these words whenever she said the Our Father, praying that God's holy will be fulfilled on earth with the same perfection with which the saints do it in heaven. Let this be our practice also, and we shall certainly become saints. May the divine will be loved and praised. May the Immaculate Virgin be also praised. This has been a recording of Uniformity with God's Will by St. Alphonsus de Liguri. This recording is available through the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, which can be found on the web at www.ccel.org.